Good morning. Welcome to the October 29, 2019 public hearing, public meeting of the New York City Land Office Preservation Commission. I'll call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Commissioner Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Brown. Here. Commissioner Jason. Here. Commissioner Chen. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Lucky. Here. Commissioner Goldberg. Here. Okay, good morning, everyone. Before we start, um, I just want to let you know we're going to start with a little bit of research and then we're going to move to preservation. And the research agenda today includes the five properties that we have calendared and go on this. And um, this was, our work here was really um, sort of kicked off by participating in the administration's multi-agency effort to plan for Kiwanis' future. Um, and LBC worked with the Department of City Planning, key stakeholders, and the community as part of a public realm working group to inform the planning process. And then we independently conducted an extensive survey of the area to identify potential landmark and preservation opportunities. Um, and, and I think we've selected five really um, architecturally and historically significant standout properties in the area that reflect the history of the area. So I'm excited for the presentation today. I do want to thank the Department of City Planning um, and to the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition as well as Councilmember Lander for their support of our work and preservation in the area. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. I just wanted to give you a, a bit of a summary of our work here at Kiwanis Building on what Sarah said. Uh, research staff did conduct a very careful study and evaluation of properties that were identified through the public process um, by community and preservation advocates as well as through our own work in the area. Uh, we identified major periods in Kiwanis' development history as a framework conducted intensive level survey, and evaluated all recommended historical resources. As a result of this careful study, we proposed five of the area's most prominent, architecturally distinctive, and historically significant properties as individual landmarks. They were calendared on June 25th and heard on September 24th. And I do want to note um, that these buildings and complexes were all built for utilitarian purposes, for industry and manufacturing with uses that have changed over time. The buildings were adapted over time for these changing uses, which is typical for the building type and the neighborhood. Likewise, the lots for some of these sites have changed over time, largely relating to changes in real estate in Gowanus, and not in ways that are uniformly consistent with the historic lots or sites. Therefore, some of these proposed landmark sites were calendared as lots in part, and uh, the landmark sites are discussed in more detail in the individual presentations. Uh, Sarah Moses will um, present a general introduction to the history and character of the Gowanus area, followed by individual presentations and books. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'd like to provide some context on the five proposed landmarks. Rwanda has a rich history. Skip this. Instead, I'd like to briefly describe the major development periods in the area to help provide context for the presentations you will see today. This is a map from 1766. The Gowanus Canal was preceded by the Gowanus Creek, and prior to European settlement, the area was inhabited by members of the Canarsie tribe. The Native American history is tied very strongly to the original ecology of the area. Estuaries provided abundant access to shellfish and other natural resources. Later, the Gowanus area played a key role in the Battle of Long Island, which was the first major, major battle of the Revolutionary War and the largest battle ever waged in North America up to that time. This is an 1839 base map overlaid with the 1942 outline of the canal as constructed. 
extending northward from Gowanus Bay, the approximately 1.5 mile long man-made waterway was transformed from a small creek and estuary into a canal after its dredging was completed in 1869 as one of the first planned industrial districts in the country. After the canal's construction, several new bridges were built. The only bridge remaining from the canal's early years is the Carroll Street Bridge, a rare retractile type structure dating from the late 1880s that was designated as a landmark in 1987. The canal's construction, coinciding with tremendous growth in Brooklyn, spurred development of a range of industries, including gas and electric utilities requiring coal and coke, and other manufacturers. This area was also a major entry and distribution point for building materials. Several large lumber, brick, and stone yards were located along the Gowanus or nearby. The Gowanus Canal and the adjacent businesses were most active in the early 1900s. In the 1920s, vessels moved more than $100 million worth of goods each year, making it one of the world's most productive and valuable waterways. Most canal-side businesses were housed in wood frame structures that no longer survive. Two exceptions are the immense brick engine room of the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company and the Summers Brothers Tinware Factory, both of which depended on their canal-side locations. Following World War II, there was a decline in industrial activity along and around the canal. Along the canal, many industrial businesses closed or downsized, leaving large vacant lots and sometimes vacant buildings. Over the past 30 years, interest in both working and living in the canal area has returned. While heavy industry has largely left the Gowanus, parts of the area have active light industrial and commercial activity and it has become a hub for creative industries and artists. The cultural landscape includes a wide variety of artists and artisans, cultural and educational institutions, and nonprofit organizations, many of whom have reactivated former industrial and manufacturing buildings. Item number one is LP2640, the Summers Brothers Timware Factory, later American Canada. 238 to 246 Third Street, aka 232 to 236 Third Street, 361 to 363 Third Avenue, 365 to 379 Third Avenue, Brooklyn, Block 988, Block 8 in Park. I have proposed for designation as a commanding former factory that was designed and built in 1884 by Summers Brothers, a major manufacturer of decorated tinware boxes in the American Mount Arch stock. Presented is Sarah Moses. The Summers Brothers Tinware Factory was built in 1884 for Summers Brothers, the first known tinware photographers in the United States, and the largest American decorated tinware firm at the time of construction. At the public hearing on September 24, 2019, the commission received support for the proposed designation from 14 people, including representatives of the property owner, New York City Council Member Brad Lander, the Gowanus Landworking Coalition, Historic Districts Council, Society for the Architecture of the City, New York Landmarks Conservancy, Park Slope Civic Council, Friends and Residents of Greater Gowanus, Municipal Art Society, and four individuals. No one spoke in opposition. In addition, the Commission received 33 written submissions in support of the designation. The building is located at the intersection of 3rd Street and 3rd Avenue in Gowanus. In a time before plastics and aluminum cans, tin plate containers made the consumption of a wide range of products possible out of season and at great distances from centers of production. The three Summers brothers, Daniel, Guy, and Joseph, left Civil War era Virginia to make tin and brush properties in Brooklyn. In 1878, their firm began to use a lithographic process of Daniel Summers' invention to print images on tin plate sheets and custom equipment to cut and shape the sheets into containers. These processes set Summers Brothers apart as the first known American producers of decorated tinware. Summers Brothers outgrew the two earlier spaces, at least near the Brooklyn waterfront. 
To better meet the intense demand for its products, the firm built this polychromatic brick plant on the southeast corner of 3rd Avenue and 3rd Street in 1884 on a site with a Gowanus Canal basin at the rear for the transport of raw materials. Daniel Summers, a civil engineer, designed the factory and invented many of the machines and processes that Summers Brothers used. Much of his design was functional, but it was also expressive with a remarkable variety of brick patterns and arrangements that enlivened the facade. Some features of his design, like the L-shaped plan, regular fenestration pattern, and narrow width to allow for daylight penetration are hallmarks of late 19th century industrial architecture. The mix of segmental and semicircular arches and the regular grid of vertical piers and horizontal bands are characteristic of the American round arch style. Other aspects of the design, like the polychromatic brick, prominent site, and corner pavilion with a one-story frieze for signage, announced the structure's presence on the urban landscape and communicated a solid public image for Summers Brothers who included a lithograph of the plant and its busy corner in their price list of correspondence, as shown at right. In 1901, Summers Brothers was absorbed by the American Can Company, which became the largest producer of tin cans in the world. The American Can Company made innovations in can fabrication, seals, and liners that became global standards for manufacturers, and just after Prohibition, debuted the country's first usable beer cans. In 1917 and 18, during World War I, 25,000 gas masks like the one shown at right were assembled in the factory for American soldiers, and the building was requisitioned as a uniform factory. The American Can Company sold the building in 1950. After a period of underuse in which the one-story tower visible on the roof at left was demolished, the factory became a creative node in Gowanus beginning in the 1970s. Today, the complex is used by more than 300 artists, performers, designers, publishers, nonprofit organizations, an iconic music studio, and others. Known as the Old American Can Factory, it led the Gowanus neighborhood's transition from industry to a lively mix of arts and manufacturing and remains a vital contributor to the historic, architectural, and cultural character of the neighborhood. As originally built in 1884 and shown on the 1886 atlas to the right, the Summers Brothers Tidmore factory consisted of the L-shaped assembly at the intersection of 3rd Avenue and 3rd Street. The factory was built to back onto the 5th Street basin of the Gowanus Canal, which has since been infilled, but which allowed for the transport of raw materials like tin plate. New buildings were erected on what was a separate lot on 3rd Street in 1891 to 1892, and on what is now a separate lot on 3rd Avenue for the American Can Company in 1902. Both of these buildings, which are shown in gray, have undergone alterations, including significant changes to their lower stories and the removal of two floors from the rear portion of the 1891 structure after a fire. The proposed landmark site is a lot in part that includes the original 1884 structure. This highly distinctive former factory complex remains remarkably intact to its time as a major manufacturing presence in Gowanus and remains one of Gowanus' most distinctive industrial buildings. The research department recommends that the commission vote to designate the Summers Brothers Tinware Factory as an individual landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Are there any questions for Sarah? Any thoughts or comments? I, mean, I think this uh, building one of the earliest um, in the group, or if not the earliest in the group that we're presenting today, um, is architecturally distinctive. It's prominent in terms of its location and its um, connection to the historic connection to the canal. And I think it's also fascinating that this in this particular building there was the you know the beginning of the new use and new uses that are have been and are developing in the neighborhood. So it was just the leader in the transformation to late manufacturing and the arts and remains a vital building in the neighborhood. So I'm very excited about it. And if everyone agrees, do you need make a motion? I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate Summers Brothers to <coughs> later American Can Company 
three original facades are old, yet restrained, gaining much of their impact from the structure's immense size, simple massing, and multi-story window openings. Faced with red brick and contrasting blue stone trim, the subdued decoration includes brick coining, continuous arch moldings, shallow corbel cornices, blue stone string cornices, and on the west side, facing the Gowanus Canal, a step entry portal. Despite many years of neglect, which included removal of the terracotta roof, the engine house remains largely intact. <coughs> in its current form since the mid-20th century, the building is a significant presence in the Gowanus neighborhood, known colloquially as the Bat Cave. In 2012, the former BRT Central Power Station engine house was acquired by the Powerhouse Environmental Arts Foundation, which plans to reuse and rehabilitate the structure and construct an annex on the north side. As I described earlier, the site conditions have changed throughout the 20th century. The proposed landmark site is a lot in part incorporating the land beneath the engine house. The monumental BRT Central Power Station engine house is a prominent reminder of the era when the Gowanus Canal was a significant inland waterway and the Gowanus neighborhood was a major industrial center. Research staff recommends that the commission vote to designate this building as an individual landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Are there any questions for Matt? Any thoughts on this one? <coughs> this is also another sort of small L landmark in the neighborhood, I think. Yeah. It's well loved and also exciting because it has um, a potential new use that is also consistent with the evolution of industry in the area. So it has this inherent um, historic connection to the canal and industry. And um, you know, we're excited to look forward and we're excited to see the plans for the new use um, also, which will support the new industry and the arts in the neighborhood. So um, if everyone agrees. Uh, everyone, would you like to make this motion? I move that, because I'm not the preservation commission. <coughs> Designate the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, Central Power Station, Engine House, 153, 2nd Avenue, AKA, 342, 3rd Avenue, 3 4th, 143rd Avenue, part of Brooklyn, at the New York City Landmark, because of its special character and special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development, heritage, and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation. As set forth in the designated report for LP-2639, dated October 29th, 2019, I moved that the borough of Brooklyn tax map, Block 967, Block 1, in part, with the boundary set forth in a designation to the designated report and attached map designated by this land site. And just for a second, that's um, 153 Second Street. Second Street? Oh, okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you, Matt. Number three, LP two six four one, Montauk Pink Manufacturing Company Building, one seventy second Avenue, AKA seventy five thirteenth Street, Brooklyn, Block ten twenty five, Block forty nine. Item proposed for designation is an American round arch style industrial building designed by George Hanahan, built in nineteen oh eight for William Kelly, presenting to his desk of all. Good morning, commissioners and guests of all. So the public hearing held September 24, 2019, 13 people spoke in support of the designation of the Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company building, including a representative of council member Brad Lander, the Guanas Landmarking Coalition, the Historic Districts Council, 
New York Landmarks Conservancy, Municipal Art Society, Society for the Architecture of the City, Friends and Residents of Greater Gowanus, and the Park Slope Civic Council. No one spoke in opposition, and in addition, the agency received 32 million in support of designation. The Montauk Peak Manufacturing Building is located on the corner of 13th Street and 2nd Avenue in the Gowanus neighborhood of Brooklyn, and the proposed landmark site is a tax lot shown here in red. The Guanus Canal has long been known as a major center of industrial Brooklyn. As was common in this area, the historic block 1025 was a super block stretching between 2nd Avenue and the canal, largely occupied by the Brooklyn Union Gas Company and the Brooklyn Alcatraz Asphalt Company. 172nd Avenue was built as an investment property by the Brooklyn Alcatraz Asphalt Company's president, William Kelly. Mr. Kelly was a well-known contractor in Brooklyn at the turn of the 20th century, owning multiple properties in the Gowanus industrial area, including two asphalt companies. The first tenant of the new factory building was the Montauk Bank Manufacturing Company building, incorporated in 1908 by Frank E. Cornell and his mother, Margaret T. Cornell. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle noted at the time that the borough of Brooklyn was the foremost paint manufacturing center in the U.S. As illustrated by the clipping on the left and the Swedes building construction catalog on the right, the Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company building occupied 172nd Avenue in 1908, leasing the top floor for office and factory use, manufacturing a decorative metal leaf as well as other paint products. It was joined in 1910 by the Dessau Court Company and the Diamond Decorative Leaf Company. The Montauk Paint company maintained this location for more than 20 years. In the mid 20th century, the Norse Sailmakers moved into 172nd Avenue. Norse Sailmaker Company manufactured yacht and sailboat sales as well as covers of pleasure crafts. These advertisements showcased the product as well as the factory building at 172nd Avenue. The Montreal Paint Manufacturing Company building is designed in a simplified version of the American brown art style by Garibet George Heinemann. The design recalls earlier 19th century factory and warehouse architecture, seen in examples here of 5456 Lane Street in the Tribeca North Historic District and the F.W. DeVoe and Company building, an individual landmark in the West Village. Heinemann and civil engineer utilized sophisticated brickwork and a South Street clear expression of the building structure to create an austere and elegant design rather than incorporating a plot ornament like many of the buildings of the era. The building street facades are articulated by monumental formal brick piers with shoulders and band courses, which express its structural gray bays and frame groups of segmented arch windows. The second avenue facade features a round dome and its gable and is centered on both the sides are wide loading doors. The 13th Street facade contains these openings on all three stories, topped by a historic hoist armature. The distinguished design of the building lends to its prominence within the Guanas neighborhood and is remarkably intact. The Montauk Bank Manufacturing Company building, located at the corner of 13th and 2nd Avenue in Brooklyn, reflects the industrial history of the Guanas neighborhood and stands out for its simple yet refined design and high level of integrity. The research department recommends that the commission designate the Montauk Manufacturing Company building as an individual landmark. Thank you, Jessica. Any questions on, on this property? Or any thoughts? No. Again, another architecturally distinctive building in the area that reflects the industrial history here. And I think, uh, you know, this building is really quite beautiful and while restrained, it's, it's very rich in its detail and a, a real standout in the neighborhood. So, everyone agrees. Um, will you make a motion? I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company Building 172nd Avenue, also known as 75 13th Street, Borough of Brooklyn, as a New York City landmark because of its special character and special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development heritage and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation, as set forth in the designation report for LP 2641, dated October 29, 2019. I also move that Borough of Brooklyn tax map block 1025. Lot 49 be designated as its landmark site. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that's now a New York City landmark as well. Thank you, Jessica. 
Item number four, LP 2638, Boaz Canal, Flushing Tunnel, Pumping Station and Gatehouse, 201 Douglas Street, aka 196 Butler Street, Portland, Block 411, Block 14 in part. Item proposed for designation is a neoclassical style brick pumping station and brick gatehouse designed by Arthur L. L. Martin of the Brooklyn Bureau of Sewers in 1909 and completed in 1911 to house the pumping equipment for the Boaz Canal Flushing Tunnel. Presenting is Marianne Person. Good morning, Commissioners. Completed in 1911, the Boaz Canal Flushing Tunnel Pumping Station and Gatehouse were part of a major infrastructure project intended to clean the increasingly polluted waters of the Boaz Canal. At the public hearing on September the 24th, 2019, the Commission received support for the proposed designation from 14 people, including representatives of the owner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, Council Member Brad Lander, Gowanus Landmarking Coalition, the Historic Districts Council, New York Landmarks Conservancy, Municipal Arts Society, Society for the Architecture of the City, Friends and Residents of Greater Gowanus, and the Park Slope Civic Council. No one spoke in opposition. In addition, the agency received 33 emails in support of the, the designation. At the time of calendar, second June, the address of the building was recorded as on 196 Butler Street. It has since been determined that the correct address is 201 Douglas Street. The Gowanus Canal, Flushing Tunnel, Pumping Station, and Gatehouse are located to the west of the head of the canal between Douglas and Butler Streets, on part of the lot originally purchased by the City of Brooklyn in 1890. South Brooklyn was originally served by a tidal waterway known as Gowanus Creek, a canal to drain the marshy land and provide improved water access to the businesses in South Brooklyn was first proposed in the 1840s. Work on the Gowanus Canal was started in 1853 and continued into the 1860s. The original plan to maintain the water quality relied on the ebb and flow of tides, but it was soon determined that this was insufficient for the task, as the canal received increasing amounts of industrial waste from canal site industries and runoff from the sanitary and stormwater sewers serving the area. The city of Brooklyn originally purchased the lots at the head of the canal, including part of the canal, in 1890. In 1904, the Bureau of Sewers for the Borough of Brooklyn proposed construction of a 6,280-foot-long tunnel linking the canal to Buttermilk Channel. A nine-foot propeller removed the dirty water from the canal and replaced it with cleaner water from the bay. By 1909, work on the Flushing Tunnel itself had been completed, and in that year, Arthur L. L. Martin of the Bureau of Sewers submitted applications for construction of two buildings at the head of the canal to house the pumping equipment. The buildings were completed in 1911, and on June the 21st of that year, the residents of South Brooklyn celebrated the opening of the new works that promised to improve the canal's condition. Executed in red brick and limestone, the Gowanus Canal Flushing Tunnel Pumping Station and Gatehouse reflect the monumental classicism favored for civic structures by the time, of the time, combined with decorative elements inspired by the secessionist movement. The pumping station on the right, with the monumental round arches, high bamboo roof, and portal cornice, housed the tunnel's pumping equipment and the northern sluice gate. The eastern and western facades feature a central arch window offset by two flat-headed windows with stone keystones, all set within a wide brick border with secessionist influence decorative elements. The smaller gatehouse, shown here on the left, was built to protect the tunnel's southern sluice gate. The square, one-story building features narrow bands of windows, a hipped roof topped by a square cupola and portal cornice reflecting the features of the adjacent pumping station. The Gowanus Canal Flushing Tunnel continued to operate into the 1960s when the propeller mechanism broke. The tunnel was offline until 1999 when the Department of Environmental Protection reactivated it after a five-year long renovation which included reversing the water to bring oxygenated water from Buttermilk Channel into the canal. The tunnel was again taken offline in 2009 for rehabilitation 
and reopened in 2014 with three vertical turbines pumping over 250 million gallons of water <coughs> into the canal from the bay daily. The image on the right from the New York Times illustrates the renovation and physical relationship of the tunnel with the pumping station and gatehouse. The image on the left shows the complete complex in 2013, including the new service building that runs along Bunker Street. By 1963, the large holding originally purchased by the city of Brooklyn in 1890 had been divided, the eastern portion becoming a separate lot. The proposed landmark site outlined in red includes that portion of lot 14 on which the Lawnus Canal, Flushing Tunnel, Pumping Station, and Gatehouse are located and does not include the new service building erected along Butler Street. The Lawnus Canal, Flushing Tunnel, Pumping Station, and Gatehouse are little changed from their historic appearance and are the visible representation of an important early engineering effort to improve water quality in the Gowanus Canal. The staff recommends that the commission vote to designate the Gowanus Canal, Flushing Tunnel, Pumping Station, and Gatehouse as an individual landmark. Thank you, Marianne. Any questions on this one? Any thoughts or comments? Uh, just make the comments on I just want to make a comment on everything. Um, as uh, someone who knows the area pretty well, I really want to commend not only Landmarks Commission staff for all of the work that they've done on these important historical uh, buildings, but both the community, um, who have worked not only uh, in, in concert with us to uh, to uh, to landmark these buildings, but who have been advocating for this part of Brooklyn, a small niche, to to preserve it and revitalize it and rebuild it and to really create a place that. Um, enhances the connectivity between important neighborhoods in Brooklyn, in this particular instance, uh, Carroll Gardens and the whole swath of uh, brownstone neighborhoods in South Brooklyn and uh, Park Slope and Warren Hill. I think it's a really important stitching that's happening here. And the fact that we're preserving these um, you know, significant and understated and uh, buildings as kind of a nucleus of uh, revitalization and literally cleanup, which is unfortunately happening a little too slowly up the canal, um, is a wonderful thing. I also am so happy that so many of uh, a large part of these structures are are intended for the use of uh, the city's important arts uh, community, which continues to look for outlets to create and present their work um, without worrying about the costs of space. So this is truly a, a wonderful collective effort that elected officials have gotten on board for as well, and. I really want to just applaud everybody in the room, and I look forward to the continued, um, the con you know, the continued careful, and thoughtful development uh, and ongoing preservation in this area. I think I just want to add that I'm thinking about the um, the important lead role is that. Uh, community-based groups have been, to, uh, to add to what you're saying, Jean, um, working on in terms of environmental stewardship. And the, the interesting relationship that, it's, that, it, that it starts to kind of um, set in motion in terms of what, which comes first. The, the idea that environmental stewardship almost preceded here historic preservation, it brought it along, is, is really interesting. Um, as we think about, you know, the ways that preservation will happen in the city going forward. And um, I, I absolutely agree with everything else that you've said. Very true. Yes. 
great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Diana. Uh, yes, uh, I would definitely echo uh, Commissioner Lundy's uh, comments and yours as well. Um, I think this has special significance for me because I was first deputy commissioner at the EP uh, when the first uh, renovation of the building was uh, accomplished. And um, it reflects, and I would agree, it very much reflects uh, the efforts of the community and the homesteads that were there and were living in an area and trying to start our projects and also just listening and living there. And as area which had been uh, very badly damaged by over the years and with the um, uh, tunnel being out um, that, that was only one of many things that needed to be addressed obviously but it was kind of a first step in, in getting this area back to the uh, in actually moving it forward from what it was in the past and that's continuing today and uh, it's really great to see uh, what's happened uh, over time, and while it's not done, at least it's a lot of progress from where it was. And uh, this is another piece of uh, that picture, uh, being able to celebrate things, uh, some of these great things. Uh, uh, so I'm going to express my support. Thank you. Thank you. And I think the thing that's so fascinating about this building is that you know, from early on, it was clear that the canal needed to have some mechanism to clean it, that you couldn't just rely on sort of the natural ebb and flow. You have a dead end, and so it's this early engineering effort, and it continues to be used for that today. Um, and it's architecturally distinctive. This very functional building was designed with a very um, architecturally significant and distinctive skin. So I think. Um, it also fits in really beautifully with the collection that we're looking at today, and I appreciate your comments. I think um, Gowanus is a really special place because there has been such community activism, and I think the you know the question of sort of what comes first I think is interesting, and sometimes it's very linear. And I think the thing that's exciting here today is that you know preservation and the environmental and the use plans and, and the connectivity to the rest of the Portland are all being considered together and it's great to be at the table really um, and actually designating before the plan is certified at, at city planning. Okay, so I move this is um, I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate the Luanus Canal Flushing Tunnel Pumping Station Gatehouse. 233 Buffer Street in Brooklyn. This item was calendared on June 25th, 2019 under a different name, the ASPCA Rogers Memorial Building. The name was changed before the public hearing to better reflect what the ASPCA called the building during its early years. At the public hearing on September 24th, 2019, the commission received support for the proposed designation from 14 people including representatives of the property owner, New York City Council Member Grant Lander, 
the Guamas Landmarking Coalition, sort of districts, council, society for the architecture of the city, New York Landmarks Conservancy, Art Slope City Council, Friends and Residents of Greater Columbus, Municipal Art Society, and for individuals. We have no group spoke in opposition. The commission also received 33 written submissions in support of the proposed designation. <coughs> Upon its opening in 1913, this building was hailed as, quote, the largest, most complete animal shelter in the world. It was originally constructed as the Brooklyn Dog and Cat Shelter of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and is the finest surviving ASPCA building in New York City. This map shows the location of the proposed landmark site on Butler Street. Originally, the building was just a single story in height, occupying only the western portion of its lot, as shown in the image on the left. Renovations in 1922 enlarged it to its current size, expanding its shelter capacity and transforming it into the ASPCA's Brooklyn headquarters and ambulance house. These images also show the watering trough on the public street sidewalk in front of the building, which will be discussed later. This image shows the site in 1921, just before the shelter building was expanded eastward to its present size to become the society's Brooklyn headquarters. The building sits across Butler Street from the end of the Columbus Canal. At that time, it was surrounded largely by small wood framed houses and larger masonry industrial buildings. The ASPCA has been headquartered in New York City since its founding by Henry Byrd in 1866. It has been crucial in revolutionizing America's attitudes toward animals and in establishing New York as a national leader in the humane movement. Before its founding, animals enjoyed few legal protections. With support from other prominent citizens, Byrd convinced New York State to charter the ASPCA as the country's first animal welfare organization and to pass pioneering comprehensive anti cruelty legislation. This led other states to charter similar organizations and pass laws modeled on New York's, taking the humane movement nationwide. This image from Harper's Weekly shows Henry Byrd coming to the aid of overworked horses in 1872. Byrd, who remained the movement's public face until his death in 1888, was buried at Brooklyn's Greek the elegant near Romanesque style design of the Butler Street facade by the firm of Renwick, Aspinall, and Tucker is a testament to the organization's civic and social importance. Two large arches, one of which served as an ambulance portal, dominate the facade and by by molded, molded and powdered brickwork, limestone trim, and an arched portable table. Changes on the main facade are essentially limited, eliminated through sash and door replacement. Its restrained classical entrance features a relief of the ASPCA seal, which depicts a sword bearing archangel intervening to protect a horse from its abusive prey. The ASPCA was a leader in hiring female ambulance drivers, including three working years starting in 1924, who were thought to be more tactful than men in dealing with the delicate situations often faced by ASPCA staff. Bronze medals were awarded here to several heroic workers. As shown by this group of Girl Scouts assembled in front of the building, probably in the 1920s, this building played an important role in educating Brooklynites in the care and humane treatment of animals. Uh, thousands of Brooklynites adopted pets here before its closure around 1980. The sidewalk in front of the building retains a granite watering trough dating from its opening. Its inscription states that it was funded by Edith Bowden, who helped lead a campaign, in her words, to erect a large number of simple, inexpensive drinking troughs in the more congested sections of the city where they are most needed, which happened starting in 1907. Dozens of similar troughs were installed throughout the city by anti-cruelty advocates to provide horses with drinking water, and this is one of the few that remain. The trough and the building behind it, the finest, best preserved ASPCA building remaining in New York City, constitute a unique monument to a time when working animals fill the city streets and to New York's central role in the nationwide anti cruelty movement. The existing tax lot does not correspond with the historic lot and currently includes a lot to build as west. The proposed landmark site is a lot in part incorporating the footprint of the ASPCA building and the sidewalk in front of it, including the water control. 
The research staff recommends that the commission vote to designate the ASPCA for the office shelter and garage as an individual vote. Thank you, Mike. Any questions on this one? And this, uh, you know, just following up on our conversation about this, how these can become a nucleus and really kind of inspire the neighborhood. I mean, these are the five that we've selected are um, placed sort of geographically near the canal and from north to south. So this is the northernmost one at the top of the canal, and I think really kind of sets off the landmark conversation as you move south and looking at the other architecturally distinctive landmarks that will be so important in the neighborhood. And um, you know, again, a significant architect, architecturally significant. And I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, highlighting the animals' placement of, and in our history, but the positive side is that there was this movement for reform and caring for the animals, and that's reflected in this building. And, um, so I'm excited about this building. Everyone agree? Yeah. Okay. Diane, will you make a motion? I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, ASPCA, Portland Office, Shelter, and Garage, 233 Butler Street, aka 231 237 Butler Street, Borough of Brooklyn, as a New York City landmark, because with special character and special historical <coughs> and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development heritage and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation, as set forth in the designation report for LP 2637, dated October 29, 2019. I also move that the Borough of Brooklyn tax map block 405, lot 51, in part, with the boundaries as set forth in the designation report and attached map be designated as its landmark site. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that's another New York City landmark. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kate, and Lisa, and Tim, and the entire research staff for our five, all this work on our five new landmarks. Story building with a clock tower including four painted cast iron and glass clock face assemblies. In 2018, the Commission issued a certificate of no effect for a variety of restoration work at the building, including the replacement of the interior cast iron and glass clock face assemblies in the 
Upon closer inspection, the applicants now seek to replace the infuriated cast iron glass assemblies with aluminum plate and across the acrylic panels, matching the historic components in terms of dimensions, configuration, and details. Michael Granville of the Rise Tour of the Architects are here, is here to present the proposal and to answer any questions. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, our firm was retained by the nurse organization to work on the restoration of the entire clock tower building. And one of the aspects of it is restoration of the cast iron clock faces, um, which at the beginning of our work were quite inaccessible for inspection and, and, um, and review from outside due to their height and lack of any exterior uh, access arrangements. Once the uh, building was fully staged, we were able to inspect the dials much more closely and discovered that they were in quite bad shape, uh, resulting from many years of service and deferred maintenance and rust and so on. Uh, as you can see from these photos, portions of the cast iron cracked or actually shattered and fallen off. It's a process mainly caused by the anchorage assemblies of the clock uh, faces rusting and being entrapped within a mortar setting that the dials were originally installed and to finally position them. And that expands the corrosion exerted force on the outer ring of the dial causing portions of it to fracture and fall away. These are all images of the south dial um, there are 48 uh, separate attachment points. Uh, here we are at the east face. I'll go through this somewhat quickly. I know that time is, what's the time is of the essence. 48 attachment points, and of the 48, 12 per dial, 48 throughout the four faces, 14 of them have sustained this type of damage. That's a missing piece of cast iron that's been at some point in the past, just lathered with caulk. Um, in addition to the pieces we know are missing, there are concerns about latent damage at the remaining sections, and conditions like this uh, have raised concerns on our part and ownership's part about developing damage, repeating this sort of hazardous cracking and loss of material over the years, and it has led us to recommend to ownership and to propose before you today that the cast iron dials be replaced with new dials. Um, just scoot through the remaining damaged photos. You all have copies of this, of course, in front of you. You can see within here and here, rusting bolts and clips and all of the various detailed pieces of steel that position the dial and hold it in its proper position in the, in the, in the uh, masonry opening um, are in terrible condition. These are just elevations of the building. Um, our proposal is to replace the clock dials with, rather than cast iron, with a heavy aluminum plate. Uh, I have some pieces of this that I can the cast iron itself is a little more than a quarter inch thick. The plate that we're proposing to replace it with is uh, a three-eighths inch thick. Uh, these pieces would be, let's get into the detail. These pieces would be, um, assembled in parts as, we're, as we've shown here as the current dial faces are uh, composed of six parts and, and the center spokes called spiders. Um, in our assessment, um, the aluminum is a more lightweight um, material to use. Um, we'll be able to exactly match the dimensions of the existing dial components, both the fonts and sizes of the numerals, the spaces between them. Um, 
At the time the building was built, of course, cast iron was about the only material that would be possible to make such an architectural component from. Um, but in 2019, we have CNC milling capabilities and can cut these parts out of a non-corrosive um, and very stable and sturdy material um, that will be very durable and long-lasting, can also receive a uh, uh, shop applied industrial grade uh, coating uh, matching the existing historic white and black paint that was originally installed in the building. Uh, we feel that these, this new, um, oops, these, this new material will serve the building very well for the remainder of its life being non-corrosive. Um, and it's all of its fixings as well, being either aluminum or stainless steel rather than plain steel, as was the case originally. Additionally, the existing glazing on the various clock faces has been damaged, not surprisingly, over the years. Um, the green you're seeing is original. The red is prior replacement glass, not matching the original very well. And there are of plexiglass also. Um, as you can see from these photos, from immediately below at the street level, the clock faces are, are not uh, terribly discernible in their detail. Certainly the surface material character of the uh, metal portion of the, of the clock face is not. Um, and even the glazing, hopefully you can see uh, in places Sorry. In places, you can see the replacement work versus the original, but it is a bit distant from uh, easy view from the street. Here are some slides of existing glazing. You can see at the south facade is a real hodgepodge of new and replacement glass and plastic. At the east, likewise, there are some new, some old, some various pieces, more the same. Uh, a number of the glass panels are fractured. Um, at the west also fractured glass. And one of our impetuses for suggesting using acrylic in lieu of glass at this time is in addition to being less heavy, uh, would not be subject to breakage the way glasses. Uh, the existing glass, which I have a small piece of here, is a frosted glass. It's rather discolored from its years of service and we Located both replacement glass and replacement. I don't know if I'm getting the light. Do you see the translucence of these from where you're sitting? But I can pass them around for comparison's sake. Uh, the acrylic that we're proposing has been recommended to us by our consultant and repair, historic clock repair specialist, Elder Horst Bells a firm that specializes in this work. They restored Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the old Philadelphia Choir building, which has quite a 14 foot diameter clock dials. These are almost 12 feet in diameter. Um, and other buildings uh, around the country, also MetLife building here in New York. Uh, they find that this acrylic is a, a good choice for illuminated dials in terms of diffusing light well for good diffusion from within um, and is a very durable and UV resistant and stable and lightweight blade which we're proposing for you here. So that would be my talk and we'd love to take your questions. Yeah. Are there any questions? I guess I have two questions. So at Independence Hall and in the MetLife Tower, it was the acrylic uh, used as well as uh, uh, not at MetLife Hall, but at, at uh, the Inquirer building, which is a larger clock face. Uh, they use the optics that we're using here. Okay. 
And is there, and did you consider a cast aluminum versus plate aluminum? And is there a, a difference in weight and or appearance? I, no, there wouldn't be a, a difference in, in weight. Uh, and with the capability to mill uh, with CNC machinery out of, out of plate stock, we are assured of getting a, you know, absolutely uniform and uh, tested strength out of the material. Uh, the assemblies that we'll be making are mimicking to a great extent because of the original assembly of these cast iron dials, which is shown here. This is a, the face itself, and the cast iron has a slight T shape. One portion to receive the glazing, and another portion really just a decorative uh, to add that width of the dial. And a horizontal leg that runs back and ties into clips. We're reusing all of these clips in this style of fixing, um, replacing these components inside the position that the face front to back relative to the frame of the building, because those are the things that really become damaged and are harming uh, the assembly. The Originally, the annular space around the dial was stuffed with oakum, and that's how water was kept out. Uh, and, you know, after 90 years of service, you can't complain about that, but it doesn't work so well anymore, and um, as over, this, over time, led to the deterioration that we see. I think Michael had a question, and then Diane. The parts that you're replacing, you're replacing with what? Uh, some parts we're replacing with aluminum, okay. uh, and some with stainless steel. Uh, we are concerned about that, man. The other question I have is the, the cast iron does not have sharp arises. Right. They're, they're slightly relieved. Will you be reproducing that? Uh, you mean at the edges of the clips? Mm -hmm. Arises. We're not intending to, no. Not intending to what? Replicate so them. We're planning to cut them sharply. Why? Why? Well, I mean, that's something that could be discussed, but we certainly don't think that that uh, detail is discernible from the street or from any other vantage point. It's 200 feet away. Have you done a mock-up? No. No, you don't know. Well, I, I think it's fair to to uh, suggest that that's true given the views that we've shown of the building from far away. The um, cast iron is an issue of what you can see from far away mm -hmm. in, in a situation like this. But this is an individual landmark, and what I would prefer to see is this replication as closely in time as you can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure that if that is a requirement, that that machine could be accomplished. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, think I wanted to ask about how it's going to be serviced and clean in the future. <laughs> right. Well, not easily, which is part of our motivation to do something that we hope will need very little service in the future. The only convenient, less, least inconvenient access is to go up into the clock room itself. And of course, the clock motors and everything are being restored, and the clocks will be functioning again once we're done. Um, and to remove from inside glazing panels and reach out through them and access the edge from, from within, from inside. Getting to the clock room is not easy. Uh, it, there's a two-story ladder that goes from main roof level, this is inside the building, up through a very tight space into the building's tank tower room, which is here, the floor below the dial, and then another tight space to get up that second ladder into the clock room itself um, is not an easy place to get to, not an easy, not an easy object to maintain. Uh, one of our, uh, one thing we like about using an acrylic glazing here is the ability to safely make it store up in the clock room 
<coughs> static stock for replacement should we need them um, out of a material that's not readily damaged just from being stored on site. One question. There are two acrylic samples here. One has a sort of matte finish, and the other has a smooth reflective finish that's more like the glass. What is the difference? Well, actually, the, the one you're holding in your left hand is glass. So oh, that's glass. No wonder. In terms of the look and feel, uh, cast iron versus aluminum, uh, obviously, uh, uh, it will be. It will be visible from the street. Uh, one is lighter uh, if, if you're replacing the aluminum. How uh, are you treating the finish? So, I hope this comes across a little bit in this photograph. You can see the arras you mentioned, obviously, rounding with the corners. The surface texture of the uh, existing cast iron is quite smooth. There's obviously a little bit of that sanded texture, but it's it's quite, they're quite smooth. And the dials were originally painted uh, white and black. As you can see in these, these are all photographs. And uh, most of the dial components were painted white. The numerals were painted and the hands were painted black. We would be uh, applying a factory applied uh, urethane with an industrial grade paint uh, that we expect to be a very durable finish. Are you, I know that's your question a little bit. Yeah, no, but, uh, this whole photograph helps a lot because instead of how uh, they did originally, the, uh, the clock looks a lot darker. Uh, this looks like this uh, lighter color. Um, yeah, there, you can see little residues of paint on the, on the dial face in some of the photographs. So, uh, in terms of the coefficient of expansion, aluminum versus cation, uh, have you done any study or you, what was your view on, on that? Well, uh, there will be some more, some greater expansion and contraction of aluminum than, than there was in cast iron. There's sufficient annual space to accommodate that movement. And uh, we're also taking under uh, advisement the expert guidance we've gotten from Elderverse Bells, who routinely use uh, aluminum for projects like this around the country. So we're confident that it will, uh, that, both, that changes from heat and cold will be accommodated by the assembly that we that we've created along with their pulp and input. But you would need a greater parts in this right? Yes. The uh, dials are made of six sections each, as the original ones were, or would be made of six sections, as the original ones were, um, all with bolted connections. There's some ability for these components to, um, to be alive in response to environmental conditions. This, by the way, this panel arrangement is a much more conventional assembly for a section of a monumental clock dial than what we have at the building now, where the section changes occur not at the numerals, but near them. Um, it was marked here, yeah, here, and Here, 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 and so on. Six points around the dial. At the Enquirer building, building for instance, this arrangement of panels with breaks at numerals is what was done, and it's a much more standard way of doing things. It is a bit of a mystery to the Elderhurst people why it would have been done this way. It's so out of the ordinary, but. Um, in any case. Uh, one yes. On the acrylic, uh, how long on the acrylic that you're using? The ultraviolet ray would affect it. How long is the process? Uh, 
Um, the acrylic proposed has UV inhibitor additives in it, and as reported to us by Elderverse, the, the uh, and our review of the product literature for these, the lifespan of these is a decade or more before they begin to discolor. This, this building would be subject to local law 11, right? So you would it, periodically be scaffolding the building for inspection and repairs? We hope to be able in the future to inspect without having to erect pipe scaffolding for the full height of the building, which if anyone has seen it lately is how it's put together as we're doing the restoration work. Um, but yes, it is subject to local law 11. It's currently an unsafe building. Um, due to not damages at, at these clock dials, although why those weren't cited or is a shock to me, they should have been. Um, but uh, due to other areas of the building that are in an advanced state of deterioration or work that have not been fixed. Okay, yes, ma'am. Are you working with the structural engineer to help you with the, the decalibrable yes. and allow for the expansion? Yes, we are. We have an in-house structural engineering staff, licensed PE in the state of New York. We work on calculations for the required thickness for these dials, for the tiebacks, where the tiebacks have to occur, how many of them, all of these are being calculated by us. The expansion. Yes, yes. The weight of the material is the weight of acrylic versus glass. Acrylic is half the weight of glass, for instance. Um, so we're taking full uh, Care with every aspect of this design from the appearance of the engineering of it. Diana, uh, given that uh, you know the discoloration is to be expected, is there going to be a plan for a you know, replacement of these panels? And, you know, and every decade or so? Or, 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 you know, it certainly can be. I think we need to see how the weathering develops over time. And, sure. uh, the facility with which we can replace panels using acrylic rather than glass is an attraction to ownership should that become necessary. And there, you know, although we would be using safety laminated glass for glass to be used, the acrylic is still more resistant to impact than Breakage the glass would be. Thank you. Are there any other questions right at this time? I think we'll take public testimony and then we may have more questions after that. We'll come back to you. Christian Emanuel. Good morning. Uh, Christian Emanuel from Brooklyn. I uh, represent myself. Um, I think it was about four or five years ago, um, we brought a stack of 100 RFBs for this building. It was a little unconventional, but we didn't know what we were doing. In Queens Plaza, we didn't have any landmarks, and we were um, sort of suffering from the seeds that were planted by the 2001 Bloomberg rezoning. Um, glass was shooting out of the ground uncontrollably. And uh, this little section of Queens Plaza North, I think it's important to contextualize, there were four, uh, three and a half beautiful banks. One of them is still there. It's a youth hostel now, owned by the Browse family, who have also been great stewards. Uh, they own the Brewster Building in Queens Plaza North, where there once was another beautiful club. And a colleague of uh, mine and a friend, uh, when he testified here, uh, brought up the number of clocks that were along the Long Island Railroad main line. Um, so as he was commuting from Queens, he could tell how late he was going to be, and this was the last stop um, on his sort of latest parade, so to speak, past Howard, Howard Interlocking. Um, my parents worked in this building for about 10 years. Um, there were a lot of small businesses in this building. Um, it dwindled over time, um, and I knew the people very well that took care of this building towards the end of its life. Uh, <laughs> and towards its rebirth now. So I just want to say to the developers and to Mr. Granville and, and his staff, thank you very much for all the hard work you put in. I've enjoyed seeing this uh, building go under wraps and I've enjoyed um, you know, the, the fruits of, of our labor in, um, you know, in, uh, in the public coming out and testifying and supporting this building and, and then all the people who signed petitions. 
Um, I just want to say that this building still is, despite all of the crowding around it, a marker um, for people in the area. When my parents would send me out on errands when I was young, I knew how to find my way back because I could see the building. Um, and I would say that although we've had a lot of discussion around, well, the, the clock is uh, 200 feet above street level, I will point out that the reason this building was landmarked um, was because its air rights were then transferred to a parcel directly adjacent. And if you go to the building today, not in those photos, there is a lot of windows, a lot of glass, a lot of modern material directly at eye level with this clock. Um, because of that, because it's an individual landmark, and because it is so celebrated for this specific feature, um, you know, I'm not an architect, I'll leave that up to, you know, the professionals um, on the commission and colleagues in preservation who will also comment. You know, I would encourage that, you know, since this is really the only thing we're seeing here, um, that as much care and as much time um, and as much consideration be given to using the most accurate materials, proportions, dimensions, colors, um, that's possible. Um, simply, simply because this is is the feature of the building, um, and you know, I think it needs to be treated like the heirloom it is. It's Grandpa's pocket watch for Long Island City, and it should be restored in the best way possible. So, thank you very much, all, for your time. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kelly Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. Given that this is an individual landmark, HDC finds the sourcing of the material for the clock's restoration insufficient. Considering the iron of the clock has had a lifespan of 92 years, it should be replaced in kind, not with aluminum. The plexiglass areas of the clock face should be replaced with glass that matches the tint of the original glass. The clock's situation far from the street and the street eye level do not preclude the original designers from constructing a clock that was built to last. Thus, its 200-foot height is not an exception for quality restoration. Finally, HTC would like to see details about the clock scans in terms of material color. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? We have a resolution from Queens Community Board 1 recommending approval of the application. Would you like to respond to the comments? Uh, thank you for the kind words about the ongoing restoration. We're working hard to bring this building back. With respect to the uh, clock hands, uh, the hands that are on the building at this time are not original ones. Uh, they are made of something slightly higher grade than Venetian line material, and they're they're curved in the same way that Venetian blinds are to give them a touch more strength. Um, but as you can, as you may have noticed or can see, many of them quicker, um, some of them are missing or cracked uh, because they. Uh, well, I don't want to take too much time here. And in any case, we had submitted previously a proposal to replace all of the hands with new ones, also constructed out of plate aluminum. Um, I may have. Uh, images about that, but not for the, for this presentation that I can share with you guys right now. We previously submitted to our preservationist. Um, they would naturally understand to be the historic profile and shape of the prior hands. Um, and so I just have another question. The decision to go to the plate aluminum, does that drive your decision to choose the acrylic over glass? No. Okay, so you could do aluminum with glass. That's correct. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so let's have a motion to close the hearing. All in favor? The hearing is closed. Um, so discussion? I think we've had a lot of really good questions. Hopefully you all have enough information to be able to express some thoughts here. And would you like to say? Well, I think I would support the use of the aluminum as a substitute material in this case. I think um, it's appropriate for its long-term durability. 
Um, I would like to see a sample, though. I'm concerned about the sharp edges. I, 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 I've done some of the projects, and I know that when you laser cut aluminum, it's very sharp edges, and it probably won't be the same way. So I think that, you know, I think ideally, we do a cast aluminum. Um, and I think that the acrylic is very problematic because you know it has a short life, um, and it does not appear the same as the glass. So I would recommend that they use glass. Michael? I agree with um, both of those points. The, 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 I'm, I'm not extremely happy about uh, changing out the cast iron for a little bit, but, but this, if this clock was made today, they would use aluminum. When this clock was built, aluminum was actually still a precious metal, and that's why they use cast iron. Um, so, as in in that case, therefore, with the modifications that I mentioned, I think I'm, I'm reluctantly okay with changing out the cast iron for a moment. I am absolutely not okay with changing out the glass with, with wax on acrylic, which is not only going to discolor, but it's going to microfissure and appearance will be completely different. The, the other thing that somehow if we can do it, this is an artifact that's part of the building. And I would, I would hope that somehow we can require that whatever is taken out of here, at least portions of it, can be somehow salvaged so that we have at least a, a fingerprint of that artifact that is part of the building. Diana? Yeah, I, I agree with the uh, comments of uh, my fellow commissioners. Um, this is a real icon uh, for Long Island City and for the entire world because you come to the lovely Bridge, Bridge. This is uh, this is the entry to the borough, and um, it's it's a very um, not only is the building important, but uh, the clock itself is very. Very much in the consciousness of people walking around the neighborhood and so forth. So uh, I think it's very important that uh, we establish details that and materials that uh, can be perceived as closely as possible to the original, uh, respecting the concerns about safety and durability of the creative and the commissions that we can use the and, and I'm sure the staff will monitor the details very closely. And I do want to also um, appreciate that the developer is making a real effort to work to make this building and the clock uh, as historically, um, currently appropriate to its historic history as possible. Others? Wellington? I agree with all the comments. Uh, it's ironic that I remember um, the speaker talking about rezoning the Department of City Planning, Queensboro Division, which is the headquarters here. And that's my origin, but it's, it is highly visible for all sides. Okay, great. So I think we will make a motion to approve um, the replacement of the cast iron with aluminum and um, with the modification of the, the glass be replaced with glass. And I think that we want to require a sample of the laser cut just to be sure that it can accurately recall the profiles um, and that casting room would be just to make sure that, that, that we feel uh, kept the laser cut aluminum is as adequate as a cast aluminum would be. Michael? Michael? Yeah, I
that the existing transparent crop face assembly is highly exposed to the elements and very difficult to access on the exterior side, supporting the use of all alternative material that requires less maintenance over time. With the proposed solid aluminum plate replacement components will match the historic components in terms of dimensions, configuration, and details. That the replacement assembly when seen for public thoroughfares will closely replicate the overall appearance of the historic assembly and the change in material will not be perceptible at that, at that height. The work will not detract from the significant architectural features of the historic landmark. However, to recommend that the rounded, the rounded edges of the cast iron components be replicated and the historic pink glass be replaced in time. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you for proof of that modification. Next, uh, item number two, the LPC 20 02271. The application for a signing report is a Queens Block 1555 Block 16 12 Block Avenue. 53rd, now 101st Street, Precinct Police Station, individual and uh, Renaissance Revival, Colonial Revival style radio station designed by the Office of the Brian, built in 1927 to 28. The application is to modify the use of the open structure barrier to access rules. Good morning, Commissioners, which are the preservation staff. Uh, the police station is located on the north side of Mott Avenue uh, at the corner of Scott A. Goodell Place, uh, a side street uh, that slopes uh, gently away from Mott Avenue. Um, the primary entrance is on Mott Street here. Uh, and there is a single story garage uh, adjoining the east facade and separated by a narrow alley, uh, which contains cellar light wells and mechanical equipment. The proposal is to construct a concrete ADA ramp and stairs with simply designed black uh, finished metal railings on the side street on an untinted concrete sidewalk and against the granite base of the west facade of the building. Additionally, a modern a 606 double hung window would be removed from the penultimate bay and a section of the granite masonry uh, below the sill will be removed and a paired uh, single light brown paint aluminum clad paneled wood door will be installed in the enlarged opening beneath the existing multi light art head transom window. Uh, the architects of Grant and Carlos Adrian Rodriguez of the Lima Group are here to discuss the project and to answer any questions. Thank you. As far as the, the concrete, we're 
increasing confidence and facing and coordinate to match the scores of the existing man right the Are there any questions? Diana? Yeah, uh, the, <coughs> the door looks like it could be a bit of show. There's an original door. Well, that's, that's actually the door on the front, and they're just showing it to show that they're trying to oh, closely in the hall to the sound and not changing that door. I'm sorry, it was confused, but yeah. No, so they're just they're removing a modern window on the side here. They're going to replicate it in a more simpler form, which is fine. And on the granite, uh, the, um, that the ramp on the uh, the access is it, it's concrete. And what were you doing? You're scoring it or something to try to make it look something like this? No, we're trying to match the scoring of the, of the granite. Yeah. Other questions? We can take testimony and we'll come back to you. Kelly Carroll? <laughs> Kelly Carroll, the District Council. As one of Fire Rockaway's few designated landmarks, a new intervention to the building should be as attractive as possible to visually elevate this landmark. We understand that the ramp will be scored and tinted to match the base, but wonder if the cladding may match better. Further, the ironwork on the doors is commercially available, and it would be lovely if this pattern could be used in the ramp surroundings. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, we have a, an email from Community Board 14 in Queen saying they have no objection to the proposal. So, what was raised in testimony was the cladding material on the ramp um, and the suggestion was that granite cladding is more linear to. We have concerns about matching granite. The granite is not. In the living room, you may not end up looking as we would like it to be. And you may be. What is the existing ground? What's the source? Staff. Um, it's a simple gray granite with a sort of flamed uh, finish uh, to it, but there's nothing in the uh, designation report for the specific material work. Most of these New York municipal things are here, uh, mm -hmm. and those far are still open. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Then I'll have a motion to close the hearing. Second. Uh, okay. Very close. Discussion? I think in terms of its location and size, this building is elevated quite high above the sidewalk, so I think a ramp on either facade would be very long. And in fact, you may not have enough distance on the front facade to accommodate the slope that's needed. So I think it's otherwise. Um, Neutral, and I think match, matching the granite would make it sort of blend even more. And are there any other rails or hardware uh, that could be matched for the actual rail? I think there's just the ironwork on the door, and for me, I think simple ironwork is sometimes a little more neutral. Yeah, I just wonder if it's a circular profile, broad profile, rather than square. Or the square block has a certain kind of quality yeah. like these real classical buildings we have. Yeah. So we can ask the staff to look at the look at the That would be good. Okay. Alright, so go ahead. Okay. Number 16-12 Mark Avenue, 50th uh, now 101st police uh, precinct police police station. An individual landmark. The application is to modify a major opening and construct a barrier three access ramp. Uh, I recommend approval and modifications, uh, finding that the removal of modern window and intersection of the granite base and the installation of the new ramp there and railing will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features. 
is that the presence of a prominent entrance at a design facade will be in keeping with the composition and hierarchical uh, organization of facades over our buildings of this type, style, and age. That the placement of the ramp is set back in the corner will help maintain the primary the privacy of the formal rectangular box form of the building, a significant characteristic of the building's design, that the length of the ramp, including an intermediate landing, is required due to the tall height of the first floor <coughs> situated on the longer facade of this corner kind of building. It will be compactly scaled to the building face. That the uh, ramp, stair, and railing will be simply designed and finished uh, to, be, to blend with this context thereby helping the installation up to have a harmonious secondary presence. That the large opening will remain compactly scaled to the facade and maintain the prominent unifying feature of the punch opening, <coughs> including their width and alignment of the windows and transom bars. That the ground paint aluminum clad wall panel, uh, clad wood panel door and side panel will be well scaled to the opening and in keeping with the proportions and finish of the historic pair door at the main entrance. However, I find that the concrete adding of the lock ramp will not replicate or closely recall materials historically found at the base of the building and will be seen in conjunction with the building's primary facade, therefore detracting from uh, the building. I therefore recommend that the ramp be clad in granite uh, to match the base of the building and that the upper can work for staff regarding the deep of the universe. Okay. Uh, favor? Okay. Any opposed? Okay. So it's approved with those modifications and you can continue to work with your chair. The next item is number three, LPC 20-02636, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Hill of Manhattan, Lots 593, Lot 45. 14 Christopher Street, aka 20 Bay Street, in the Greenwich Village Historic District. The lot building is owned by Frederick C. Zillow, built in 1996 to 97, and later converted to an apartment house. The application is to legalize and replace windows installed without all these equipment. Good morning, Commissioners. Carolyn Passion Corporation staff. This was a property located at 70s, uh, the openings uh, were combined uh, and doors and windows installed uh, within those enlarged openings. So our enforcement department and staff have reviewed these historic photographs as well as past permits and have determined that these combined window openings and metal window balconies um, at the second, third, and fourth floors um, are grandfathered conditions. Uh, so therefore, uh, what is before you today for review is the applicant's proposal to uh, one, legalize the top floor, uh, top floor windows um, at the Christopher Street facade, and then two, um, to replace all the windows at the East Street facades on the east and south of the same location with the one of the one of the architects and the property manager are here and then we'll discuss this proposal. Hi there, I'm Chad Smith uh, of Smith and Rutgers. Um, as you can see, uh, the, uh, in, in red, uh, we have, uh, we have, this is the uh, south uh, street, the uh, south uh, facing facade of the Bay Street. Uh, this is the Bay Street east facing facade. Uh, and then this is the uh, Christopher Street facade. Uh, it does look like to be there, uh, you should note that there is a, um, there is a separate uh, uh, LPC violation uh, in blue uh, that, uh, that uh, was filed uh, a while ago and is being uh, taken care of by our architect and other representatives. 
Okay, so um, here uh, we see the Christopher Street players that we're, uh, that we're requesting to utilize. Um, these are uh, um, uh, three uh, vinyl uh, sliding windows, as you can see here. Um, they slide side to side. Um, they're in good condition. Uh, they've been uh, made uh, uh, in good condition. They're really good. Um, the, uh, the Gay Street South facade. Uh, you can see uh, 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 lots of different window types here. <coughs> There's lots of changes here since the 1969 designation. Um, same with the east facade. Um, and uh, here we have our, uh, our street elevations. Uh, this was the elevation uh, in the uh, photograph. Um, these are the, uh, the openings that were done uh, sometime, I don't know, like earlier or in the 70s, sometime that the staff was determined for our grandfather. And then these are the existing uh, sliding windows that we were uh, requested to legalize. We think that because they have uh, this, uh, this vertical slope profile, um, that they, they, they just work with the, the, uh, the grandfather condition. And we think they should, they should do that. And they're good working for and uh and uh we should we should be able to use um well uh, this slide is the um so here we have a the partial elevation here uh from the nineteen forties. This is the existing elevation and if you just count up the number of window types here, uh, we get all the way up to N. Um there's uh, there are our uh, casement windows here that are fixed windows. Um, and then there are there are actually casement windows swinging into the fire escape. This is a this is a fire hazard, a egress hazard that needs to be remedied. And up here we have a vertical slider. We've got a different one next to it. We've got two different ones next to it. And then uh, we have another one here. So as you can see, it's it's just a, it's a bit like it's a high pressure of uh, uh, windows. And we're proposing to unify everything with a. Uh, uh, Standard aluminum one over ones um, that also have um, a little uh, uh, like aluminum uh, you know, historic uh, exterior uh, 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 casing uh, on the exterior. Okay, uh, this is the uh, South uh, Gay Street facade. Um, again, same condition. We've got windows swinging out and fire escapes, keeping uh, windows. That's, uh, that's just. Uh, Levels, and we were seeking to use the same window type uh, to harmonize the facade. Um, this is the uh, this is the uh, the window profile. You can see it's a so, small um, open the window. It has this uh, this casing uh, 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 strip uh, that uh, that's going to go on the exterior. Um, and uh, for the privacy windows, there's some you know, there's the back windows. They have these frosted uh, glazing, and we're going to put a new aluminum volume cap to match uh, the window frame color uh, for this window. Uh, and the color for the window is, is this uh, this kind of duck gray. Uh, it's a, a duck gray. Dove gray. <coughs> So here, uh, this is a this is just a, a headache showing uh, the various uh, conditions. Here we have some wood windows that are are uh, are uh, 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 and uh, and you do see that there is like a little uh, 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 historic uh, trim there. Um, but you've got casement windows um, and, uh, and a lot of uh, decaying uh, conditions. All of the windows. This is a. Again, this is kind of the taxonomy of our different window types. These are the windows, uh, like the like ones on Christopher Street, which is legalized. Um, and then these are all the different window types that are currently on. Oh, there's one more. I'm, I'm so sorry. I have one more thing to say that I forgot on this slide. Um, we just like to note that uh, uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that the balconies cornices and the upper floors of this building were painted sometime after 1980. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, you can see the 1980s tax code of the building has 
kind of a, a couple of terms uh, going on in here. And sometimes we have them when the recorded version we have a building that literally just got painted on a single color. Um, and in, when they do the, uh, the window work, they intend to uh, to repaint the building uh, to uh, this uh, uh, this next uh, What's that? It's removed the paint. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And the Mayan cover that you're proposing yeah. is that also going to match the profile? Yes. Of the yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When did the uh, top? What are those going on Christopher Street? Uh, we don't know exactly. Uh, I would say um, sometime in the uh, late 1800s, maybe early 1800s. Uh, we don't know exactly when. Uh, it's not that long ago. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and then the regular punch openings at the fifth floor and throughout the East Street facades. Um, and that was part of like a loft conversion. So I think there are duplexes at that time that were converted into apartments, duplex apartments. I, the, the reason I ask is that it's sure. two different theories here about the applicant were based upon the way the front now looks. Mm -hmm. So it matters a lot. Understood, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Anne. Two questions. One is how did you arrive at the paint color? And the second is are you planning to replicate the modeling profile on the privacy windows that you see on page 11 in the photograph? So the pink color we arrived at because um, the, um, again, the, 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 the condition here, um, these, are, uh, these are aluminum frames, uh, anodized aluminum frame, um, and we wanted something that, again, would harmonize with that, would not be, obviously, raw anodized aluminum, again, but uh, something that would work in, in concert with the basis. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Page 11. Page 11. In the photo number one, you can see the, the profile around the privacy windows. Yeah. So that that panel in the center is, is, has some detail. Your elevation uh, of the new windows just shows a flat panel. So are you able to use your new profile to create this condition? I'm not sure, but I think that we could look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? We'll take public testimony after that. Louisa Winchell. Hello, Louisa Winchell from Village Preservation. The removal of the original windows and decorative metal spandrels of this 1896 loft building significantly hurts the architectural integrity of this otherwise steady, classically inspired structure. Where there was once a rhythm of the facade and a three-part arrangement of the former windows, now there are instead just voids of plate glass. Adding insult to injury, the balconies have no place within the design scheme. The landmarks law was put in place to prevent just this type of stripping of architectural details. Therefore, we urge the commission not to approve this utilization and to require the owner to bring this building back to its former glory. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. The litany of legal work to this facade over the years somehow has not totally diminished the attractiveness of this prominent former building. To that end, HDC asks that the alterations made to the windows not be permitted. Instead, LPC should require that any further work ensures that the appearance of this building moves in the direction of its 1940 configuration, of which the applicant has taken the time to document. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, we do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 2 um, recommending denial of the legalization of the windows on Christopher Street and approval of the configuration and size of the Gay Street windows and a requirement that they be in wood with six over one lights. So I think it's not approval. <laughs> I would say the only responsibility is set before that the, um, the, the, the proposal is in the sense of harmonized that exists in the commission. The commission has been, uh, has been established as a, as a very father commission. And, um, okay. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. There are no questions. We'll come to motion to close the hearing. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So, um, so the good news is, is we have um, an owner who I believe inherited these violations who is here addressing them today. And um, I think there are some positive steps here in terms of getting a profile and finish that is more closely related to the architecture of the building and historic condition. And I think it really comes down to the configuration. Um, the applicant has proposed one over one, uh, finding that comprehensively the building will read with 
sort of larger things relating to each other. Um, on the other hand, the you know, windows as we know are good day two, pre-1969 on the front of the gates, the Christopher Street side, and so they may need to be replaced again in the future themselves. So that's something to think about as you think about the right configuration here. Um, so any questions? Um, comments, thoughts? Diana? Yeah, um, I feel that um, that's not to some suggest in the testimony also, but that uh, there should be, we should be trying to keep this building, move it back a little bit toward its, its original condition. And I think that the un unsympathetic changes, as I do them, that were made to the, the front of the building should not be driving what we're now approving, but we should be looking to have something that's more sympathetic in general to the village. And um, so I, I think I'd like to see the six over one on, on this side. I think that doesn't have to be six over two, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And um, as we approve, I'm not sure if they're the top of the building, if I can hear some other comments on that, but on the front, on the other side, I guess it's the history of the street um, we, we should be trying to move this back because some of may come in the future with the, and we'll see other changes to this building probably. And we should try to establish something now that's moving in the direction of something more appropriate for this building. That's, that's my I, I agree with Commissioner Jacob 100%. I think that's, the, that, that's exactly the issue. If we keep going in the direction that it's going right now, um, uh, it's never going to. It's never going to have any features that will uh, remind us of its past glory. At some point, if we do this right this time around, the three in the front as well as the ones on the side, um, the um, someone may come along and say, you know what, we really have to clean up the front of this building voluntarily um, and, and and restore some of that back. Okay. It's a very prominent, sorry, it's a very prominent location on this street. There's no question about that. And uh, and the, the you know the, the building itself as it was and still is, you know, you can read the integrity of what's our you need to do to retain that. I am favor. Okay, so I think that, yeah, and also if they can maybe work with staff to look at the detail of the windows and make sure they have the technologies for looking at this, is there now? Yeah. In the matter of uh, 14 Christopher Street, also known as 28 Daly Street, Greenwich Village Historic District. Uh, uh, let's see. This is an application to legalize and replace windows installed without any more regulation commission permits. I know that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of Greenwich Village Historic District. I also note that this loft building was converted uh, to an apartment house, and, uh, uh, and by at least the 1970s, the window openings at the second, third, and fourth floors were combined with metal balconies installed. Uh, I recommend approval with some modifications, noting that uh, although some historic six over two double pond windows were extant in the late 1970s to early 1980s. Most of the historic windows have been replaced with single light casement windows, and some windows were subsequently replaced with vinyl windows thereby, resulting in a variety of configurations at the Christopher Street and Bay Street facades. That the proposed replacement of the existing um, light finished vinyl aluminum 
and steel windows at the east and south Bay Street facades will eliminate unsympathetic alterations that detract from the significant architectural features of the building without causing the removal of any historic fabric. That the proposed aluminum double pond windows will unify the fenestration pattern at the Gay Street facade and will be consistent uh, with the historic uh, windows. That the proposed windows will match the historic windows in terms of operational details. That the extruded aluminum panning will match the historic brick mold profile found at uh, several window openings uh, and that the proposed work will enhance the special historic architectural character of the Grinch Village Historic District. Uh, uh, also, uh, that the proposed uh, one over one configuration will not match the historic configuration. Uh, therefore, that a six over one configuration uh, be used and that the molten profile at the uh, wide mullions be replicated, working closely with staff. All in favor? Uh, any opposed? So it's approved for those modifications. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to item number four. <coughs> this is LBC 20 42760. An application for a certificate of appropriate use of the road at Hatton Park 607, Lot 75, 137 West 11th Street in the British Village Historic District. A townhouse designed by FX Fowler in 2013. The application is to install window balances and flower boxes. Good morning, Commissioners. Michelle Craner, and President of Staff. This application is for work at 137 West 11th Street, which is located on the north side of 11th Street between 6th and 7th Avenues. This building was built in 2003 uh, on the former St. Vincent's Hospital complex, seen here, and occupies a portion of the site for the former Harold R. Cronin Research Building. The proposal is to install framed window balances, which will feature an unframed skirt, um, and flower boxes above the first floor of the 11th Street facade. I would like to note that the projecting awnings proposed the first floor of the, this facade, as well as the removable flower boxes hung from the ironwork at the second floor, will be reviewed at the staff level. The applicants are here to discuss the proposal in detail. I'm Stefan Dalmo for the FX Collaborative Architects, used to be FX Hall, and we're architects for the Red State Project. So, as was mentioned, this is the application for the addition of window treatments to the new townhouse located at 127 West 11th Street, and after we in the Greenwich British Historic District. The townhouse is part of the Red State Project at the site of the former Central State Hospital, which was approved by the Commission in 2009 and in 2012. It's one of five townhouses built along West 11th Street. Uh, the application proposes a modern twist to the historic practice of adding ornamentation and details to the windows and doors of West Village townhouses to give each one a distinctive personality and character. And this is done, in our view, in a manner that is consistent with the Commission's consideration of the legislative project and townhouses were originally approved. As the Commission is aware of, the legislative project was a significant project made up of a combination of converted to open hospital buildings and new development on the former St. Vincent Hospital site. So while most of the project involves four family buildings, the five single family townhouses were proposed at the easternmost end of the project site on West Lake Street to introduce a lower scale into the project, which is to remove the character and scale of West Lake Street. The townhouses that were approved as part of the 2009 approval were consciously contemporary in execution. Higher than typical floor heights, all the windows of typical West Finnish townhouses, modern in their detail and quite a more ornate treatment, and they all had a uniform base as well for each townhouse. This treatment was in part to avoid prior false historicism within the modern building, and in part to set up a canvas for the individual homeowners to personalize the area of the building, as has been the case for other multiple townhouse projects in the historic district, where the townhouses were originally built with a very uniform continuous facade. 
So the proposal before the Commission is now for the first of these townhouses proposes to finalize the design of the exterior as well. Thank you. Greg Gell from Jack Max and Simons on the fence. So uh, the proposal consists of five components, uh, three of which are before the Commission today. On the ground floor, we're proposing a change of color of the front door to a dark navy blue that changed the hardware and light at the front door, and then the same as being uh, the room at the staff level. In addition, we're proposing to introduce fabric awnings at the ground floor level in the color matching for the blue of the front door. Uh, the awnings are typical elements uh, seen at Brave throughout the West Village and will provide visual interest at the street level as well as providing some privacy for occupants within the townhouse. On floors two through four of the townhouse, uh, the proposal would introduce a coherent design for enlivening the facade made up of window planters and horizontal window details at each opening. Uh, the planter boxes are also a typical element found in many townhouses throughout the district. Uh, for example, you can see on the top two photos um, at 11th Street and just across our block on 12th Street. The proposal adopts but also updates this traditional detail by adding a simple panel of detail with more manicured greenery than one typically finds. At the second floor, the planters will be hung and pinned on the existing, me, existing steel railing. Here. So they will be hung in and pinned uh, to ensure safety and stability with no new penetrations required. At the third and fourth floors, they will be mounted on metal Z clips, which will bolt only into masonry joints, which will then be later removed and pointed with no permanent effects, which can be seen just here. Uh, the boxes will be made out of uh, painted aluminum, uh, painted dark navy blue to match the door and on fabric colors. And while the planters will be physically anchored into the facade, the connected details will be visible at all. And because they can be attached to the masonry joints and not the bricks or masonry themselves, they'd be easy to remove uh, if that was ever decided. And the second part of the window treatment proposal is the introduction of a horizontal element at the top of each window, seeing this detail on the top left, uh, which would create um, a visual interest and architectural punctuation of these locations. While distinctly different in detail and modern in execution, the screens also reflect the same sort of visual cue typically created uh, in horizontal lintels, some ornamental, some uh, simply structural or cornice work found uh, at the head of many West Village townhouses. The screens can also be seen as one treatment among many found in West Village townhouses used to animate the, the facades. And here we're showing just a variety of the different details found from uh, solar courses to different painted wood elements to, uh, I think over here is a, a stucco detail on top of a solar course. So there's a, a variety of different treatments and we're proposing one additional. Uh, there's not one uniform architectural detail we found for these. Uh, some have ornamental sills, flower boxes, shutters, grill work, uh, bronze work. Others have projecting uh, lintels outside of the plain of the facade, other recess, and uh, have other different distinctive details. The proposal for the windows in this project take cues from this variety of embellishment, but also take cues from the modern, clean lines of the townhouse itself by providing its own simple, clean detail at the top of the window. Uh, these details originally take inspiration from their, for their form from traditional lines uh, in the closed position, as can be seen on the townhouse here in, uh, on Elizabeth Street, where you see it here with an open position and here in a closed position and also here on the historic house by David Adler with an awning in its position. Uh, the proposed details would be of a dark navy fabric attached with aluminum, with aluminum frames to the steel frame of the window itself. You can see it here and down here. Uh, these frames would be bolted to existing steel window frames at floors two through four. And at the first floor, they would bolt into a stone joint as there's not a similar steel window frame. And as such, um, keeping from the uh, traditional uh, inspiration of these windows, um, that's a, a more modern interpretation of a traditional Grand Village townhouse with a modern interpretation of a traditional awning window. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? So I just want to clarify, I think, I'm not sure if you've stated this accurately in the beginning, the awnings at the ground floor are being reviewed at staff level. So we know that historically, 
row houses had awnings, as many building types, to provide shade. And even when they were designed as a row, individual houses installed awnings historically. And the rules allow the staff to approve awnings on the upper floors of row houses. And, and um, so the awnings at the ground floor are being reviewed by the staff pursuant to our rules. So what we're looking at today are the flower boxes and the balances proposed at the second, third, and fourth floors. Um, and the applicant has um, shown some images of closed awnings. So they suppose it's an awning interpretation of awning, but it just doesn't technically meet our awning rules because it doesn't have a slope. So that's why it's before us today. And the penthouse. The penthouse is not visible, so it's okay. also being right. reviewed at staff level. Can I clarify? Yeah. So that's, uh, this is a previously approved awning at these terraces, which, as you said, is recessed from the street. Um, what we're actually proposing is to change the color to match the fabric and the paint down here, but that is also being done at staff level, since it's not visible from the facade, or from the street, of course. And there are some landscapers in the the landscaping. The landscaping at the upper level here? Yeah. Down here. Yeah. Yeah. The These box. are being proposed. These boxes. The street. Boxes. The street. You have at the street, it's existing. Yeah, and I mean, on the proposed, it's gone. On the proposed, it's not going to be removed. It was just there so the, for clarification so you can see through it. Okay. So, this is still have a planted area away. Right, so in the renderings we're showing a bit, but we sort of tuned it back just to make sure we didn't block what anything looks like. And is the art, the, the landscaping in the boxes, is that going to be, uh, are you showing us what it's going to be? Or yes. Okay. So it's a, a basically a trimmed hedge, um, sort of like a pontoon hedge, um, which is actually similar to what's Oh, that's what I was wondering. Yes, okay, so thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll take public testimony and we can come back to you. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, we do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 2 recommending approval of the window boxes and denial of the awnings. Any final questions for the applicant? More questions about what our review is and why we're reviewing this? Okay. All right. So let's have a motion to close the hearing. Second. All in favor? All right. Closed? Thoughts? Anyone? Fred? Say it again. What? Thoughts? Thoughts? Maybe the and. Well, I was thinking. I was thinking about the thoughts. <laughs> I, I think this is unusual, uh, and I'm kind of wondering about the motivation. Um, not that that really matters, but I don't think the motivation is the same as what motivated uh, 19th century, early 20th century houses and apartment houses to have awnings. Uh, it's more of a motivation to uh, humanize, whatever we want to call it, the uh, maybe this too stark idea of these, uh, the design of these uh, quite new houses. Um, on the other hand, um, lots of rows were built uh, over time, historically, and those houses, as we know, almost every Tuesday that we meet, uh, we see how those houses have changed over time. <coughs> That's the nature of the city, uh, the nature of buildings, how buildings go, and so forth. And our job here is to be sure it's done in an appropriate way, not to stop change. Um, so I'm sort of circling back, thinking about my thoughts here, and I think I think I'm going to be all right with it. Although I'm not sure I uh, object at all to the original designs themselves. So, so there I am. Uh, I, I've been thinking about Fred's thoughts. <laughs> if you don't, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I like his choice of the word I humanize. I think that's. That's what the effort is here. And while I agree, it could have left it the way it was, but it's fine. It's not going to uh, do any permanent damage. Um, and it'll humanize this building. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, uh, 
it's an interesting evolution in a way of we haven't really seen this, uh, I think, where you know, we approved a, a new, you know, sort of tried to make them have some sense of the time of you know, separation. And it'd be interesting to see what happens to it, is what I'm thinking. Like, so with this one happens this way, and somebody else is a different kind of one, a different door, and you begin to get more distinction in the individual buildings. Then, I'm interested to see how it goes. And I it's very reversible, it? well, it's, it's very reversible, yeah. And I think, you know, I think about historically row houses that were built by special builders as a row, and historically they all made individual changes right. as well, and yeah. economics and door changes and so many transitional buildings, particularly in the village. Anyone else? Uh, uh, yeah. So, I um, appreciate the applicant's desire to give this building a little bit of, um, you know, individuality and personality. I am especially supportive of the idea of putting greenery um, at the windows. It's just that in and of itself is very humanizing and very characteristic of townhouses, not only in the state, but throughout the city. Um, I do happen to feel that the original, so I could support that. I do, happen, I do want to say that I, I do feel that the original design was quite, is quite handsome. And I guess I don't feel that the awnings add in uh, in a way that is that enhances the existing building. Um, I don't think it's necessary in terms of giving it personality and humanizing it. And if you look at the townhouses and brownstones in the neighborhood, there are in fact very, very few that have canopies uh, or awnings above the ground floor. So I might, you know, it's appropriate that I think that we approve the penthouse, but I personally feel a, a little less comfortable with the awnings on this particular building. So just, and to be clear though, the staff can approve the slope awnings on the upper floors. Yeah, I understand. On the upper, on the upper floors, meaning the penthouse. No, 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 second, no. third, and fourth floors. Second, third, and fourth. So the reason this is before us today is because it's shape. It's different than a traditional line. Uh-huh. OK. Well, I'm still not OK. So, everybody else OK? OK, so. I think the, the only unfortunate thing is that they're not operable no. on these on exactly. the floors okay. because then there's less heat gain and less electrical use is more sustainable. Um, you know, the other downside is the fact that possibly after the rain smells like cat yarn, so you won't want to open the windows. <laughs> um, but I, I think there's this is unsolicited equipment. Uh, I think <laughs> Nobody can handle classical humanization better than Fairfax and Salmon, so I'm definitely okay with this. All right, so, uh, Eduardo, are we going to kind of skip Jeannie because she's not supportive of the awnings? LPC 20.02760.137 West 11th Street. When it is going to this is an application to install the window bayonets and cloud boxes. I know. I know that this building is one of the, of the five townhouses built in a place that our own research building 
about the former St. Vincent Hospital. I recommend approval finding that the install, installation of this recently constructed bow house or even reversible, that the proposed canvas bearings will be installed within the building openings at the entrance will conform, convert the size and shape of the entrance. And, and they will recall awnings and other window treatments that were found historically at bow houses throughout the historic history. That the color of the bearing fabric will match the other awnings at the buildings and will harmonize with the building color palette. That the attachment of the variances and window boxes will be, will be plain, recently, and will utilize the minimum number of penetrations. That the proposed window boxes will be small in size, simply designed and feature a dark finish, and that the work will not be tracked with a special architectural and historical character of the new French village historical history. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? One opposed. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next item is number five. This is LPC 20-00020, an application for a certificate of appropriateness of growth from Abbey Block 611 Lock 4, 239 West 4th Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. A pre provider is not a roadhouse for 1939. The application is to construct a rear yard mission. Good afternoon, Commissioner Magdeburg, Preservation Staff. The subject premises is located at 239 West 4th Street between Charles Street on the north and Western Street on the south within the Greenwich Village Historic District. The, applicant, the application is to construct a rare addition. Please note that the existing rare addition was grandfather, as seen on the left. Um, and the applicants have confirmed that there is no underpinning is required for proposed work. The applicant, Ather Eidemann from Alta Eidemann Architect, is here to present the proposal further and answer any questions. Good afternoon, Chair Carroll, uh, commissioners, uh, friends and neighbors. My name is Paul Ted Timbleman. I'm the architect for this project. With me here this morning is the owner of the restaurant. There's a restaurant on the basement level of this building. You probably all know it. It's a cultural icon in the West Village Fedora restaurant. The um, proposal for an addition is at the rear of the restaurant. It is not at the front. Um, and um, the uh, owner of the restaurant, Gabriel Stallman, is here today, and it is uh, his addition that we're looking at. Uh, 239 West 4th Street was developed as one of three Greek revival houses that were built at the same time in uh, 1839. At the time, the area was a residential district, of course. And as time went on, and right around the time of the First World War, between the years 1917 and 1919, so after the First World War, uh, Seventh Avenue South was extended to the South, bringing with it more commercial activity to the area and to this block in particular. Um, yeah, let's just change the slide. See if I can change the slides at the same time. Uh, you'll notice that the 7th Avenue south side of the block was sliced off at an angle, uh, creating some unusual shaped buildings that have developed over the years that have various functions. A number of the buildings in the area began to have commercial activity at the ground floor, including 239 West 4th Street which had a restaurant, the first, a saloon, established there starting in 1917. By 1919, it was already a restaurant, and that's 100 years ago, and there's been a restaurant in that location at the basement of this building for 100 years. Uh, 70 of, almost 70 of those years had been the restaurant currently there for the restaurant, which 
Well, well, the interior is not part of this application. The interior has part of the original bar that's been restored, original flooring, other original details, old signage, and so forth that make it quite a special place. Um, the reason for the rear addition, uh, as everybody knows, and as was emphasized at the recent community board hearings that I attended, there are a lot of empty commercial spaces in community board two. Uh, we don't want to be another one of those. Um, in order for a small business to survive, people do need to make changes from time to time to make these older restaurants or smaller stores on um, pop businesses more viable um, by adding the rear addition to this structure at the basement level only. We're able to accommodate some additional seating for the restaurant and the ability for the restaurant to have a private dining space, um, which is uh, something that's very convenient for a lot of people that live in the neighborhood. Uh, the rear addition, let's just get that back, is at the basement level only. It is only four inches taller to the top of the cornice than the existing addition. All of the air conditioning equipment that you see there is existing. The dunnage is existing. We are not touching it. We're using existing. We're not putting new equipment up there. So all we're doing is adding the addition, which will be um, made of solid brick. Uh, we have uh, painted wood trim windows and doors and uh, casement windows and, and uh, uh, door for convenience. The lighting fixtures are diminutive and black, uh, dark sky, not black sky. Let's uh, move forward. Uh, this particular block has, is, is, is relatively well peppered with additions and bathhouses in what I call the yardscape and what everyone else calls the donut. Some of these additions are significantly taller than the one that we propose, and some of them extend into the um, donut space significantly further than the one that we propose. The footprint of our addition, which is an as of right addition in a commercial zone, is the smallest footprint that we could pull together and still allow my client to have the use of the space uh, to help with his business. We are, as of right, permitted to build significantly more area than we have done. And I suppose if it were someone else doing this, they might have even put a second story on it. But we did not. We kept it diminutive. It's only about seven foot three above grade. And it is 230 square feet and extends past the current footprint by 11 and a half feet. Uh, this photograph shows a, a view we were on the rooftop of an adjacent building looking down into the yardscape. Um, you'll see our proposed addition, which again is a basement level only, is dotted in the white. Other surrounding additions are significantly taller, including one uh, directly adjacent at 241. West 4th Street, another at 245 West 4th Street, which actually has a lower addition that then connects to a back house. We're pointing to the back house that has a rather tall, tall structure with a, um, an open top. Um, a number of the buildings in the yardscape do have commercial use at the ground level, again, evolving after the extension of 7th Avenue Cell. We have indicated for your convenience where commercial uh, activity, commercial uses at street level with a C on the buildings that have that use. Let's move forward. Uh, this view is a panorama of the yard that exists and the different views from that yard starting, um, well, you can see which of the views. The second one in is the most direct shot looking at the rear of the existing building, and the others are as you move around. On uh, to the, the rear, as you face directly behind us, is this one that has a rather tall building on 7th Avenue South that's directly behind us, and they have an enclosure uh, up to the height of that uh, a very tall fence. 
Uh, we're significantly lower than that. We're also lower than the fence that exists on the <laughs> what's on these fence? <laughs> you won. <laughs> we're lower than that fence. And we're not very much higher than the garden wall with planters on top of it at um, view four. Here's an elevation existing, elevation proposed. You can see the relative heights. We've shown the, sec the fence, garden walls, et cetera, in section to give you a sense of the relationships between what's there currently and what is proposed. Here's a section through the existing site showing the existing addition and yard. This is the building we're not touching. The proposed is shown. And we're um, not putting a cellar on this structure. We have what will be a slab on grade structure supported by perimeter grade beams protection of existing adjacent structures, of course, and support of excavation and any of those types of DOP requirements will be addressed professionally as is per code. Our building is structured per code. Uh, we are as of right and uh, in good standing at the DOP. Current owner of the building is aware and supportive of the project. We are not excavating lower than any adjacent structure. Consequently, underpinning, which is used only for the support underneath structures that would be higher than us, is not required for this project. Support of excavation is ordinary, will be under the purview of the contractor who retains specific engineers for that purpose, as is required by the department of building. These are the plans, existing restaurant, proposed with the addition in the yard. Uh, the yard is not a required yard. It is uh, we're within 100 feet of the corner. And um, it is um, my belief, based on extensive review with LPC staff, with my team trying to pull this in and make it as diminutive as possible while still meeting the requirements of my client's program. I believe that this is an appropriate addition. It's modest. It's appropriate. It does not significantly alter or cause detriment to the existing yardscape. And I believe that it's an appropriate as of right addition in this Greenwich Village Historic District. Um, I'm available to answer questions based on the testimony that came up at the community boards. I understand that there are some concerns that may be raised by uh, folks who are in opposition to this project. M much of that is um, not relevant to landmarks consideration. We have professional and appropriate answers to all of those things. Should you have any questions either about LPC-related issues or non-LPC-related issues, we're available to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions now? Just a quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you may have said this or I'm not this. It's not visible from any street. It is not. Completely invisible. The donut is completely enclosed. And I can show you that slide. I got it. Thank you. Okay. There it is. It's landlocked. Great. Thank you. So we'll take public testimony. We may have questions after this. Gilda Laval. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am Gilda Laval, the owner of 241 West 4th Street. My family has lived and provided housing here for New York residents for 102 years. The five-foot excavation proposed extension of the rear yard of 239 West Sport cannot be exempted from LPC requirements to provide, and I quote, a structural conditions report, a pre-construction site survey, a finished draft of the Department of Building Structural and Support of Excavations, five drawings, a plan for monitoring the facades of any building of six stories or less. 
This is because 239 West Fort Street, uh, Weir Yard's northern border, is the two-story brick foundation wall of the basement and cellar of 241 West Fort Street, and not a fence is shown in applicant's plans. 241's basement level is lower than 239's, and there is also the cellar providing essential services for tenants. Underpinning needs to be a story and a half lower, and not a five-foot excavation for clothes. The waterproofing and drainage tiles on the door side of the 241 foundation wall also need to be protected. I have water damage from them and have not been allowed to inspect uh, what is causing them. The eastern border of 239 is 181 West 10th Street, a brick building with basement and cellar also. The owner of 237 West Fort and the southern border of 239 suspects a stream runs under the paving stones that sink in the continual uh, maintenance. There is no awareness of adjacent properties. A slab on grade is not a foundation plan. There are no viable, viable foundation plans to underpin neighbors' properties to ensure buildings won't collapse. This is required by New York City Building Code 1814 1. 239 West Fourth Street's application is an alteration to Directive 14. This is an attempted circumvention of city requirements of an alteration one, many more than all two, and a circumvention of obtaining a new CFO. DOB questions the legitimacy of the application. On October 11th, there was a notice to revoke both application and amendments. Presently, there is an audit with open issues. This is a misleading, inaccurate, and incomplete application. This proposed plan is not inspected, supervised, monitored by responsible professionals a structural engineer and DOB and LPC oversight, it could trigger collapse to adjacent pre-Civil War properties. In 2009, due to excavation 243 West Fort Street, my foundation cracked, even though the owner took all precautions, the cost to repair the foundation was over $350,000, and that was 10 years ago. Owners and residents of 237, 241, 243, 245, 247, West Fort Street and 58 Charles opposed this application. Eradication of remaining green space, elimination of light to living spaces, and a light star to historic donor destroy quality of life. As of record, the new owner of 239 has not signed consent. The structural integrity of the block and the health and well being of residents as well as businesses deserve consideration from LPC. A site visit by LPC is warranted. It will elucidate the unique nature of this congested block and relationships of adjacent properties to one another and the structural and aesthetic impact of this design. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Lisa Evangelist. We have some problems with the drawings that have been presented to you. One being that the cross section is incorrect in many ways. It is missing the cellar level and it is not representative of the actual changes in grade at the basement level. Another thing that we did, uh, we superimposed 239 and 241's basement and cellar plans and you can see the adjacencies that are not shown on their drawings, but I was hired to do this for this um, application. It's hard to understand the lack of delicacy taken by this applicant as to the unique nature of the changes in grade within all of those rear yards. These buildings were built in the early 19th, 1800s, and they're extremely fragile. The prop, there should have been additional cross sections, adjacent grade analysis to show exactly where their enlargement coincides with 241's existing building, which I have here, and which you have copies of as well. We don't believe that there has been enough analysis or even detailed thought of caring about the intricate nature of all these buildings. And this is something that LPC is just so important in this um, community or in the boroughs to make sure that these buildings, they don't fall down and they're respected and this agency is respected and the DOB is respected as far as how it's been filed and the lack of respect therefore. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Marilyn Bai. Uh, thank you for allowing me a chance to talk. 
talk. I appreciate it very much. It's a very difficult situation for the neighbors on the street. And that we're very concerned. You know, unfortunately, we don't have great confidence in the applicant. In March of uh, 2016, we changed the, um, the, the window design and the cladding of uh, 234 West Lord Street from we just changing it over to Paramount to Fairfax, I believe. And to get an LBC violation, he did it on the weekend. And so we're very concerned that what is said, what happens, might be doing really different things. It might trigger something really, really bad in the interior of this block. And anyway, as a friend and neighbor of Jim Little Bow at 241 West Fort Street, I've been struck by the constant noise of the Donald's restaurant beat track equipment that's located above, you know, um, the Donald's rear extension. Jilda also runs a business, she's a small landlord, and she had to offer concessions to a tenant because the deck is no longer a place where anybody wants to use, use it. I have been present at two CB2 meetings about this extension and don't understand how anyone can think that 35 or 40 year old plantings and trees all along the border of 239 can be recreated in a small space at the point of this extension. A horizontal tree covers above 241 to 239. A fig tree also grows over the foundation wall and drapes over both properties. The tree at 237 West Fort Street, whose roots go under and into 239 will die. Well, the ivy, wisteria, and vines of 237 spence are rooted in the rear yard of 239, according to John Matto, who has guarded the rear yards for over 20 years. There will be no more green space, no plants and trees, to have all the exhaust fumes from the many HVACs. This would be a very malicious attack on the quality of life. As hundreds of birds also no longer inhabit this historic donut. It will become dark, concrete desert since 137th Avenue South has blocked much of the light from the, from the east. Um, I'm also very puzzled by CB2's recommendation that no intervention was required with a deeply excavated wall to the north or the, or the adjacent fully excavated cellar. If this is so, then why did Ms. Laval's architect and engineer repeatedly assert in their statements that underpinning is absolutely necessary? Um, a site visit by LPC would clear up these misconceptions. It's a very difficult in interior donut. And just because it can't be seen by the street, residents whose windows overlook from every direction will be, be, be grieved by this thought, the thoughtless design. More masonry and bars instead of a green space that the applicant has given no thought to. Um, all this for six more seats. Um, Fedora restaurant capacity will go from 68 to 74. Uh, he has a very successful restaurant tour. He already has um, 200 seats on this short narrow street. They're close to each other. He's got bar storage at 233, Fairfax at 234, Fedora at 239. And I knew Fedora Toronto, and she never endangered her, her property of her neighbors. Pre Civil War fragile properties. It's a travesty, and I doubt the applicant really understands how expensive this is. How expensive this is to do legally and responsibly. So anyway, this is a complicated and congested donut that warrants a site visit from LPC to fully understand it to make us firsthand. And I, I deeply appreciate your consideration. It's a very difficult situation that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Kevicus. Well pronounced, thank you. Barely has gotten right. Oh. Um, I'm speaking today in support of the application in front of this board for a garden extension at 239 West 4th Street. My name is Matt Kevicus, and for over a decade, I've been commuting to work in the West Village. Alongside Fedora, our company runs five other small neighborhood restaurants in the blocks that surround it. Of interest to this board, every guest we've cared for in the West Village has been cared for in a landmark building. The jobs that we've created are meaningful. They support families and forge relationships. Scores of our colleagues have been part of our world for five or more years. Each of them is a respectful, talented, and hospitable individual who invests their working hours to bring smiles, great food, and memorable experiences to our neighbors and the visitors to our streets. Making people happy is literally our job. We're proud of our relationship with the neighborhood. Where other operators might have serialized their restaurant concepts and taken them to other boroughs, cities, or states, Gabriel has doubled down where he has roots, re-signing leases again and again, and building small businesses that serve our community. Our entire philosophy is based not on rewards or TV advertising, but on humbler virtues like value, heart, word of mouth, neighborliness, and the power of hospitality. I share this perspective against the background of a neighborhood in distress. 
as I witness every day when I come to work. And as Comptroller Stringer's office affirmed in a recent report, the West Village has been se severely blighted by the higher commercial vacancy rates. Please help pre prevent Fedora from becoming another empty storefront. For 100 years, as Ulta attested, this space has served the public as a restaurant. For almost 70 of those years, it was owned and operated by the Dorado family and presided over by its namesake, Fedora. When she retired at the age of 90, she personally sought out her neighbor, Gabriel, to take over the restaurant. Every day that we come to work, we enter under, under the landmark neon sign that reminds us of her legacy. Fedora's intimate, and frankly, it struggles. It's dark, it's a basement level unit, it has only eight tables and 17 seats at the bar, which on its best day barely adds up to 40. The garden extension you're considering has the potential to be a lifeline for this historic restaurant. The additional 200 or so square feet and the seating that will come with it could be the difference between our success and failure. For nearly 10 years, we've been stewards of this historic establishment. Given the opportunity, we'd like to run it for dozens more. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Carroll? Um, no comment anymore. Okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Uh, we do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 2. Um, recommends approval of the design of the extension and that mature planting solution removal is not necessary, necessitated, necessitated by the relocation will be retained. Um, recommends that unless the proposed position of the rooftop railing is required, that it be moved to the edge of the existing extension, and that the applicant provide masking for the mechanical equipment, and that engineering studies and precautions in construction methods, including monitoring adjacent properties, be undertaken to ensure the integrity of the subject property and adjacent properties. Would you like to respond to some of the comments? Uh, sure. We're, um, as I mentioned before, we're bound by code to go through a series of procedures, special inspections, um, every manner of investigation, vibration monitoring, and so forth to protect adjacent structures and to structure our building properly and um, with integrity. We're at the landmarks here today. We're not addressing the intricacies of those engineering efforts. And until we have approval of landmarks, we can't take our project past the architectural applications that have been filed, which are necessitated. It's necessary to file the architectural first in order to show that we've got our zoning approval and so on so that landmarks can do their next steps. And we've taken those steps in proper order. And we'll take the next step to their appropriate order. We are in good standing at the DOB. We need guidance of people, which is the open uh, Underpinning, I, I don't want to get into a technical discussion of underpinning, but there's been a misrepresentation of what that word means. And we do not require underpinning. We require, as every project requires, support of excavation and protection of existing properties. And support of excavation only where we're going lower, where it's already lower, that's a protection issue. We have all of that in mind, of course, and we'll take those steps as necessary once we are approved to move forward with the project. There are many other technical items that I could respond to, but only if you have specific questions about them, we have responses prepared. So, and the Landmarks Commission does um, have requirements when applicants propose excavation, and we review documents, many of which are the same documents that are submitted at DOB, but we can also, we retain um, an engineer, old structures, and we can have old structures look at the application materials as a group for the effect of everybody comfort. Okay, great. So, in terms of, so let's have a motion to close the hearing if there is a motion. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So, um, so that's one thing we can do to address the excavation concerns is to have um, old structures evaluate the plans. Um, in terms of the size and uh, location of this proposal, and maybe if we go to the block plan, um, it's an unusual block in the applicant's data because of the cut through the set that it is fast, so it's an uh, unusual triangular shape, and the site is landlocked by other people. 
conditions that are one story or more. Um, in this case, we're not going to the real lot line, so there is still um, some yard that where uh, large planting could occur. Um, and I think this is fairly consistent with the approvals we've done in uh, commercial streets at the ends of blocks or on avenues that have blocks where um, there are commercial properties at the ground floor that have extended into the lot. Yes. Just, just to be clear, um, requiring old structures to review all the structural elements of the plans, that's, and that's the furthest we can go to protect yeah. buildings. And then we can continue to work with the Department of Buildings as well and talk to them and coordinate with them. Um, yeah, so I was just confused too because we, we normally include that language where we think there's any structural issue with that. Like a professional engineer, but yeah, so perhaps there's nothing in here is that because I mean, I, in this case, the applicant is representing that they in fact don't need to do the underpinning and it's not that invasive uh, in terms of what it would require as additional material. So, most of we can still have level structures look at it if they determine that it is in fact in, uh, in need of more review or more reports and analysis, etc. We'll have them help us uh, make sure that that's all intact and proper. So as presented, it doesn't require that. So we could use that funding. Okay. You okay, Tony? Everybody okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. In the matter of uh, docket number LTC 200020, 239 West 4th Street in the National Historic District, uh, the application is to construct a rear yard addition. I know that building scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. I recommend approval, noting that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features that the proposed addition will not be visible from any public thoroughfare, that the enlarged one-story rear addition will be in keeping with additions found in neighboring properties in terms of height and projection into the rear yard, and its size will not overwhelm the existing three-story house, that the presence of the addition within this block, which was cut when 7th Avenue South was created and no longer retains the typical continuity of the joining rear yard, will not detract from the central green space, <coughs> that the materials palette and solid void ratio will be consistent with modern additions at this block and elsewhere within the historic district, thereby helping the addition to have a harmonious presence. And that therefore the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the historic district, and that we will require a old structures to review the structural elements of the plans um, uh, uh, and monitor the work with DOB. Old structures will not be not have to monitor if they're there to review the plans and make sure they comply with whatever requirements that uh, we can, and, and we can continue to coordinate with yeah. the What they say. <laughs> <laughs> you have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So it's approved for that modification. And what modification? So we will, we will have our engineer work with you and look, review your plans to ensure that all properties are That's protected. Fine. Yeah. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item number six. This is the PC 20 an application for a certificate of appropriateness of the road in the 923 lot of the first site. 265 West 11th Street, and then the Shoney Street Store. The second in Piper Sound Roadhouse, and then the road in the middle of the 1968. The application is to construct a couple of new additions, solid balcony, and also the road in the middle of Included preservation staff. The proposal for you today is for work at 265 West 11th Street, located between West 4th and Future Streets in the Greenwich Village Historic District. The scope of work has several components. The first component at the areaway includes excavating two feet deep, regrading the basement steps, and installing new blue stone paving and steps, and installing a fence gate and garbage enclosure. The proposal at the proposed areaway. Aligns with the projection of the neighboring street and area to the east and west. The second component is to redesign the brownstone tinted stucco and door surround. The following slides show details of these components. And to also note that this uh, lowering of the sill of the parlor floor window will be done at staff level. And so here you see the existing area conditions as proposed. 
because this came forward having proposed details of this one. The third component is at the roof. The commission previously approved a non visible bulkhead at the roof, which is shown here. The new proposal will extend the rooftop addition to the parapet wall, making it minimally visible from the gap in the street wall at West 11th Street. And this studio window adjacent to the rear facade will be restored. So here's the mock up. And as you can see, there's a small gap in which this beige sort of colored shape is, is a visible to the first wall. So this is a elevation of the existing rear facade. The final components are rear facade, and they include installing a metal balcony at the second floor and constructing a rear yard addition top of the deck at the basement level. The one-story rear yard addition at the basement floor extends four feet into the rear yard and will not be visible from public thoroughfares. The metal projecting balcony, as shown here, will be visible over a wall on West 4th Street. So here is the episode of that. And the block plan showing where the major extension fits in. And this is sort of the line of sight of the rear facade, which we can show. Here and in a mock up that was done to launch construction. The occupant is here to answer any further questions. Thank you, Amy, for the very thorough presentation. So, Brendan, if there's anything in particular you want to focus on or add. I, I'm going to say, oh, Brendan, come on. Um, just on this back balcony, this mock-up was from a previous application and it was a to the left and we have just suggested as a client that it get moved to the middle and it's a little bit smaller um, from side to side. So that's, I think that's the only thing I'd point out. The other thing is um, the, on the bulkhead. The bulkhead, we brought it to the edge, of the inside edge of the parapet. Uh, we've, we've brought it to the So, yeah, so this is what was previously approved. We brought it to the inside edge of this parapet. The reason we did that is because the stair, in fact, doesn't work to get you up on the roof. So we, we just need a little bit of extra space also to get the stair landing the line of the glass doors. So the only thing that is visible is this little bit of an edge through the horse wall that is between these two properties. Um, and can you just uh, speak a little bit about your design for the door surround and sure. how you arrived at that? Okay, so I think this is the best drawing to look at. Um, this is the existing condition, and of course the main move here is to drop this window sill that was the location of the old stoop when this house was had a stoop. Um, so we're dropping this window to make this a more coherent facade. At the same time, our client wanted the door surround to have a little bit more um, prominence than it currently does to get a little bit more depth and, and probably less. Um, so we just made it a little bit larger. We have otherwise sort of preserved this, the design, the existing design of this brownstone plinth um, and, um, and just made this bigger. So the, uh, So this is a detail of that, that stone surround. And in plan, we have the grindstone coming in, stepping in, stepping into this inner location, and then the wood of the, of the door sort of uh, jammed to it on the side, transitions to wood at this point. So all of this was to, to make that brownstone an entry seem more substantial, and of course give a little bit of, uh, a little more room in this space to get out your keys and, and the rain. Right here inside the house. And just for clarification, the window of the parlor floor is actually being reviewed at staff level. The rules allow the staff to modify windows that were a former steep entrance that have been modified over time to match the other part of the window. Yeah, this, these two houses were sisters, and this was the original condition at some point if the student went back. 
think that the new Doris Road is, sorry, it's um, wood or something? Uh, it's, it's mostly stuck. And the wood, the wood portion of it starts. But that's stuck with wood. That's stuck with the primary new framework. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we'll move to testimony in the morning. Caroline Harris. Good morning. I'm Caroline Harris, a partner at Goldman Harris. We represent Melissa Schiff Soros, the owner of 263 West 11th Street, next door to 265 West 11th. We object to this application. The design is flawed, and we have serious concern about the applicant's adherence to TPPN 10 of 88. It seems to be a concern today. Based on her current conduct in connection with uh, work pursuant to the certificate of no effect. For the design issues, uh, the proposed relocation of the front stairs exposes the shared party wall without showing how it would be restored and protected. In addition, no banister is proposed for the new stairs. As a result, the fence on my client's property, visible on drawing LPC 05, will likely be used as if it is a banister. This will not be a safe condition, imposing a risk on those using the stairs and potential liability on my client. It also appears that the extension of the areaway and steps onto the public sidewalk will cause a non-compliant clearance with the existing tree in front of the building. DOT requires at least five feet to the tree. Consequently, if, if LPC approves the proposal, the tree will have to be removed to the detriment of the public and the beautiful streetscape in the historic district. Instead, the proposed area way of stairs should be narrowed. As shown in the applicant's photographs, on this street, an area way is associated with this stoop. This building and its twin at 261 West 11th uh, appear to have been designed with a high stoop and an areaway as described in the designation report. 261 restored the stoop, consists, I'm sorry, retained its stoop. If an areaway is being provided, the applicant should restore the stoop consistent with its original design and in keeping with the prevailing character of its twin and the other buildings on the streetscape, subject, of course, to other concerns we just raised. That would be an appropriate design. As will be described by Mr. Luxinger following me, TTPN of 88 is not being properly followed by the applicant already with regard to the work they are doing on the building. Therefore, no proposal should be approved for this project that would involve or might trigger TPPN of 88. It's been very difficult dealing with the neighbor on protection issues uh, heretofore, and we see no abatement of that conduct. Thank you. Please turn down this application. Thank you. Gustavo Wasser. Thank you. My name is Gustavo Luxinger from London and Architects, representing the owner of 263 West 11th Street, uh, Melissa Chief Soros. As uh, Carrie mentioned, uh, the applicant has not established a monitoring program to safeguard the ASIN structures within the historic district, including my clients. Complying with TPP, TPPN 1088 for excavation work noted and approved under CNE 19-31330 issued on March of this year. The test pits have also been performed without providing required advance notice nor establishing the aforementioned monitoring program required by TPPN for subsurface work. The applicant claims that the TPPN does not apply to the CNE and the test pits. The ongoing use of a chipper is causing extreme vibration, threatening the fry out party wall that they share and the building. Only after Mr. Soros' numerous complaints to the applicant and engaging an attorney did the applicant agree to any measures at all, which still do not seem to be performed or to comply with TPPN 1088. The proposed certificate of appropriateness work will trigger TPPN 10. 88 as well. However, given the applicant's conduct today, 
plus not sharing any plans acknowledging her TPPN 1088 obligations for proposing a licensing agreement, our client is concerned that the applicant will continue to fail to adhere to the law jeopardizing her property. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria Gray. Nothing to add. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay. We have a resolution from the community board two recommending approval of the front big facade windows, areaway, door surround, rear extension, and bulkhead enlargement, and denial of the window and glass railing design in the rear extension, and denial of the non-historic front areaway railings instead of that and instead recommend that the railings be inspired by decorative historic railings on the block. Would you like to respond to the comments if there are some concerns about structural issues and then also design issues having to do with the design and depth of the areaway for the surrounding the railings? Um, <clears throat> well, I think that we're, well, I think on the issue of the area, the uh, handrail on the um, on, on the right side of the property, next to the source property, we could certainly um, accommodate a handrail that, that took that that, um, that concern away. Um, I think the issue of the um, DOT clearance uh, on the street tree, uh, we would be able to go to DOT and get a, a waiver for that for that clearance and allow that to happen. We, we've extended areaways to to realign. Um, Areaways in historic districts before where there a similar condition exists and, and it is always permitted to maintain the tree the sort of awkward but charming street sidewalk clearance um, and certainly as part of the uh, of the structural work we have a structural engineer working on the project the contractor will have their own uh, means and methods uh, engineer working on the project there will be the monitoring put in place for all the SOE and all the uh, uh, excavation work that's going on on our property. Um, so we've done that before. And also, I know that there was a transition. There was a transition from us. We're the new architects. It was a previous architect. I think we've been uh, trying to get the client to be a uh, far greater communicator with the next neighbor. And in LA, her concerns, which are fine and legitimate, and we're not too worried about. In fact, we've the one thing that we looked at when we went into this project and, and took it over was we moved the elevator that's inside this house from the uh, from the right side over to the left side, from the east to the west, so that uh, so that we wouldn't have to get into underpinning the wall that the, the party wall that these two buildings share. So we've simplified simplified the structure of this building quite a bit. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. So let's have a motion to close the hearing. All in favor? Okay, so we have essentially three areas of work. We have the um, removal of the existing door surround and the new door surround, the extension of the areaway to its um, former depth, aligning with the doors and the associated railings. And then there's the visibility of the extension of the bulkhead and the excavation in, at the rear. Right, so it's the, uh, the balcony off the rear is slightly visible, uh, so that protecting balcony in the parlor floor level, and also the small bump out addition under the deck at that level, that together with the rooftop <coughs> addition adds to two additions that you'd be looking at for cumulative effect. The cumulative effect of the, the extension below the deck and the bulkhead. Any thoughts? Any questions? It's the one-story extension is very modest in size, and the excavation seems to align with the terracing of the adjacent yards. It doesn't seem to disrupt um, the relationship between the grade levels. Um, at the bulkhead, I think that little extension is pretty minimally visible, and I think the ground is also minimally visible without getting through the slot. And um, at the front area, the um, areaway is being returned to its historic depth. And um, you know, this is very common in the village. The stoops were removed when the buildings were converted to multiple housing in the early 20th century. And so 
basement entries are very characteristic. So I think the combination of the basement entry and here in area way is not in conflict with the again adapting and following the nature of these buildings. Um, and I think that if the rail line can be accommodated to address the city concerns, that would be great. And I don't know if anyone has any comments about the design of the door surround that seems to match the brownstone, resurface brownstone. Okay, all right, everybody okay? Thank you much for the food. Again, you can, um, you have, um, we have concerns about the engineering. You can also have those structures work with the applicant on their proposal. In the matter of LPC 2001773, it's 265 West 11th Street, Greenwich Village Historic District, a second empire. Style row house designed by William Novel and built in 1868. The applications to construct rooftop and rear yard additions, installed balcony, and alter the areaway and front facade. Another the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Village, the village Historic District. And I also note that the stoop was removed from the early part of the 20th century and that the brownstone cladding at the basement floor is historic. I recommend approval. Finding that the excavation of the areaway and the resetting of existing bluestone pavers will not detract from the building or site and will not alter the perceived proportions of the primary facade. The foundation wall exposed by the excavation will be coated in a brownstone tinted stucco finish to match the existing brownstone in terms of composition, detail, profiles, and finish. That the creation of the recessed areaway, including the installation of bluestone steps and paving, a brownstone curve and black finished metal fence and gates will recall the historic areaway configuration and will be in keeping with areaways found throughout the streetscape in terms of dimensions, materials, and details. And that the integrated garbage enclosures will be partially below the grade and will not eliminate or conceal any significant historic fabric. With the setback one story rooftop addition, which will be minimally visible to a portion of the West 11th Street through a gap between buildings, will be finished blend with adjacent utilitarian rooftop accretions and will not detract from the design profiles and proportions of the primary primary facade. But the proposed one-story rear yard addition will have a modest projection and will not be visible from the public thoroughfares. But other rear yard additions of a similar height and depth exist within the block, that the cumulative effect of the proposed rooftop and the rear yard addition from the notable way the historic massing of the building will maintain the character of the building as an individual row house. With the projected balcony at the north facade, which is visible through a break in the street wall at the oblique, at oblique angle, will be seen in the context of adjacent altered rear facades and rear yard additions. Um, and that um, the railing will accommodate with whatever the safety concerns there are, and that we'll work with um, engineers to ensure the proper work is done on excavation. Second. Paul Paper. So it's approved and just continue to work with everybody on the Thank you. So commissioners, we're gonna take a break now. We're a little behind schedule, so we'll possible come back at 1.15 and we'll pick up with the, the last item that we have scheduled for the morning and then move into the afternoon items. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
Please know that the existing window uh, for the uh, first floor are two over two double hung wood window with white edges, and the uh, second story is steel casement um, and fixed windows. Please also know that this is the destination photo taken in 1965, uh, not 1930 as stated in this presentation, and a 1940s text photo is not available. Please note there were steel casement windows at the lower floor beside the glass block at the time of destination. Please also note that all of the windows were replaced after destination with LPC permits. The applicants are proposing to replace the existing two over two double hung windows featuring um, vertical mountains um, in kind, except for the change in material and details on the ground floor. The applicants have also indicated that they will work with the commission staff to modify the proportion, dimension, and details of the second floor window so that they will comply with staff level rules for window replacement. Therefore, today's um, at the public hearing, the current proposal before you is only for the first floor window. The applicant, Ken Peter from uh, Switzerland Architecture, is here to present the proposal further and answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Maggie, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Chair and Commissioners, uh, for your time and consideration. Uh, my name is Ken Kia, uh, I'm an architect from Schweitzer Group, uh, representing NYU. My client uh, is the faculty housing uh, space that we're renovating. Uh, we're proposing to uh, replace windows in kind with uh, insulated uh, aluminum frame uh, windows. As, as Maggie had mentioned, the second floor windows were working with staff, LBC staff, and the uh, a window subcontractor to match the existing uh, casement windows on a second floor, so that's not part of the consideration now. Um, again, the, the site is located on the on facing McDougal Alley. Uh, the address is 19 Washington Square North, uh, rear of this building, part of the building. Uh, it's in the yellow highlighted square at the plan. Uh, and then the first floor and second floor plans uh, with the blue highlighted areas are the window replacements uh, facing the Google Alley. Uh, this, the left-hand photo is the existing condition as it is today. Uh, painted gray right facade, uh, upper story casement windows, lower story wood, uh, double hung windows, uh, five sets, two over two, uh, and, we're, and with a metal security grill. Uh, we're, we're, we're with the metal security grills remain in place and uh, to replace the uh, double hung uh, wood windows with double hung aluminum frame windows uh, in kind to match the details. And again, the designation photo is on the uh, on the left hand side with, uh, where they are packing a glass block uh, in the middle sections and uh, other types of windows, potentially casement windows, left and right flanking. Um, let's get a larger view of the designation photo. Uh, these are the details for the 1992 application to replace uh, uh, what was existing with double hung wood windows and also the burglar bar detail. Again, the burglar bar is supposed to remain in place and we're proposing to match the in kind. The profiles of the wood windows, however, in the aluminum frame windows, place uh, insulated glass. Uh, we have these are, uh, existing and proposed elevations. Uh, this is no longer under consideration for working with staff on that. Uh, and then some of the details uh, from, that we had existing from the uh, current uh, proposed kind of, uh, fabricator. But again, we will work uh, to, to, uh, with staff and uh, the manufacturer to develop the, the details that match the current existing conditions. <laughs> um, also wanted to note that um, we have some kind of contextual photos. Uh, so these are some details.
details of the existing level one windows with the bourbon mm -hmm. bars. Um, this is context of above. Uh, so this is a, the view on the left, is a view from the west to the end of the Google Alley, our subject site is uh, at the end of the alley on the north side of the Google Alley. Uh, and then the view on the right is the view back from our subject site west down the Google Alley. Um, it is a gated pedestrian, mostly pedestrian uh, public walkway with some limited hours. Uh, and then that's context, current context. Um, this is the adjacent property on the right hand photo uh, with Burger Laws and Double Pump Buildings. Uh, down, this, down the next building over a few doors now, again, Burger Laws and Double Pump Windows. Um, and then the rest of the context on the north side, on the left, probably right. Uh, coming back down, down that east, down the Google Alley towards uh, the buildings that are opposite. Um, also, we have uh, some of the photos from the uh, uh, designation uh, that were uh, will provide uh, free review as well. Okay, thanks. Are there any questions? Um, we'll take testimony before we come back to you. Ms. Kelly Carroll. Actually, Brittany Thomas is going to see if she left so Okay, I wasn't sure. No, don't worry. Okay. Uh, Brittany Thomas is served District's Council. This proposal, if approved, will noticeably increase the thickness of the lichens and perceptibly diminish the glazing. HTC suggests preserving the historic profiles of the windows, which could be achieved with thermally broken steel. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? We do have a resolution from the community board too, recommending approval of the application. Do you want to respond to the comment about proposing a steel window versus an L window? And, and I think you're proposing a two over two or is it double hung window to match what was approved by the commission in 1992. That's right. Um, is, is that double hung operation something that is also desired to maintain, or did you explore other kind of steel assemblies? We looked at a few other assemblies. One of the other considerations was to actually leave the burrow of in place uh, without having to disturb them. Um, and other window configurations might require us to remove those and or replace them after we can them. Please leave place from the inside. Is that how you're going to do this? Yeah, we, we, we would remove the windows and place them on the inside. That's correct. We've done that in other locations. You can't do that with steel windows. Uh, we, we could potentially do that with steel windows. We would, uh, the, thing, the issue with, if we were to go with steel pavement windows, would be we have to change the configuration and it would be in swing. It's going to go first without swing. Mm -hmm. So, and at the time of designation, it was glass block. Correct. There were steel windows at the second floor. And the commission approved the crazy placement of glass block with the double hands of windows. So I guess the other question would be that what would the configuration of a steel window assembly be? So. I understand that the second floor windows were staff level, but what are they proposed to be? I believe they're proposing to match the steel windows. Yeah, we're matching the configuration. They're in aluminum. They're doing the upper floors in aluminum. I also just want to mention the, the designation photo they have does show some steel windows on the front floor on each side of the glass um, block. So, just uh, to explain our rules, the staff can approve replacing metal windows with new metal windows, and it can be steel versus aluminum as long as the profiles and dimensions match closely enough. So that's really what we're working on. Yeah. So if you're proposing to do aluminum casements on the second floor, um, which I presume are outswing, could you match the right. in-swing casements in the ground floor to those? That would be possible. The other issue would be um, what exactly historically would have been the infill where the glass block is, is, is currently shown in the historic photographs. We'd have to guess on that. Uh, 
So are there any other questions for the applicant? Yeah, let's have a motion to close the hearing. Second. All in favor? Okay, so this is an interesting um, proposal. This is a automobile stable, kind of a garage really, and it was um, constructed at, behind 19 Washington Square in order to um, the alley, the Google alley. And many of these buildings, as we know, were converted for artist residents and other types of change, uh, uses over time. And so it's unclear what originally was at the ground floor opening, but the glass block and I guess there are some casements flanking it date to probably the early to mid 20th century. And uh, maybe reflect that 20th century layer of history in the village. And so the commission once many years ago decided that it was appropriate to replace that with double hung windows. And so I guess the question before us today is, is it still appropriate or have we further enough in time that we have a different perspective on these 20th century types of installations? Yeah. I'm just speaking. Yes. Yeah. I'm just kind of <laughs> I guess I feel like for some reason. Now they've been this way for a long while. And also with the metal bars on the outside, they have seen work the you know the windows. I mean I'm perfectly fine with this. I do think that double hung is represented elsewhere within the alley, and you know, there is you know, a variety of window types that are on all of these buildings. And so I think one could find that the same window configuration would fit within that variety. Do others feel the same? Yeah? I think that the double hung configuration is okay, but I don't know whether it's trying to match the large mountain size of the windows. I think that it should be a metal with yeah. double on the window. I mean, not the, whatever, or, or not, I'm not sure, but lighted and similar to what exists, or did exist, sorry, on either side of the glass block. So, I don't see any necessity of the 1930s version of the original purpose of this building is very different. I think it's a fair amount of light. I think it would be like the country going forward. Or just something that looks uh, reasonableness, operational at this point because it's not really, there's not much there to change the design of the building. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit more than the other two. Probably a small door was there with an electric door at one point, and I suppose any other windows which I'm going to do. Uh, and I'm, I feel that the it would be pretty easy to make it more like the original, but I don't feel compelled to insist on it. I do think, though, that the front end board up is, is relevant. <laughs> the profiles as they're drawn are this moment and are commercially cheap ass in the place windows. Um, I would say that they should look at staff to look at aluminum clad windows where the profiles are much more similar to the, to the wood windows of the original approval and would be much more similar to the neighbor's windows. I like that. Okay. 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 They were part of the 1992 approval by the commission to, so, and they're, they're proposing to keep them in place during the window replacement.
um, the application is just for experience. I think it's going to be scammed to the resolution so when the teachers will contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. There have been approval modifications finding that the existing windows that the existing windows are all modern replacements and no extant historic features are fired up or be eliminated by the proposed work. If the proposed windows were not to historic windows in terms of material will be installed within the existing masonry opening.
Saya ikut dia waktu ke depan Jual proposal And as you know, in partnership with Renzo Piano Building Workshop, the Morgan completed an expansion in 2006. This expansion enabled the Morgan to increase its public programming and research activities significantly and provide much needed additional space for storage, uh, collection storage. Piano's design moved our entrance from its original location on 36th Street where visitors entered through the annex building to its current location on Madison Avenue. The new entrance is both much more welcoming and more functional. However, the byproduct of this was the was of the shift was that visitors no longer enter, they no longer encounter the exterior of the original library. When the entrance was on 36th Street, visitors would see the facade of the library to the east as they came in through the annex building, as you can see on the slides. Now, your visitors experience the library's splendid exterior. Moreover, there is some 5,400 square feet of green space that has always been underused and inaccessible to visitors, and that does little to complement the building. Therefore, in conjunction with the restoration of the exterior, we're planning three proposed site enhancements, three proposed site enhancements, to bring this part of the campus back to life and to make its place in the living composition and history of the Morgan clear. The first, a new garden that will provide for the first time in Morgan's history an accessible route from the interior of the campus to the 36th Street site. This will also give a new space for tours and programs focused on McKinn's building. And a new animation to the site that will make an underused space into a notable place on 36th Street. There will be a more cohesive feeling to the campus overall. Secondly, new lighting of the facade that will give the building the presence it deserves at night as a jewel in the Murrayville neighborhood. And third, improvements in exterior signage. John Longstaff Gow will present the garden designs, Linnea Tillett the lighting designs, Jessica Ludwig, the deputy director, the signage improvements. But before we begin, I'd like, if I may, to speak a little about the process that led to Todd's selection. And even before I do that, to step back a bit further and address Renzo Karen. <coughs> it provides the important context. Piano was selected for many reasons, feeling the openness, transparency of his buildings, his sensitivity to the needs of displaying art, books, his masterful attention to art, and his embrace of buildings as centers of civic exchange. He has the ability to approach all of the above with restraint. As an example, with his rows of well articulated and elegantly proportioned panels we see here in the cube, Piano's work also refers to the classical tradition something that Morgan himself would have appreciated. And I think you can see this in the image of the Claire Eddie Thor gallery, which you call the cube, placed in the middle between the annex on the left and the original McKinney building on the right. Piano was the right architect both to bridge the existing buildings on the campus and to create a more remarkable new contemporary space. As the Morgan went through a similarly careful process to seek a landscape designer, we considered what kind of garden would be appropriate on the 36th Street site. We felt that it was essential that the design be sympathetic to, and not distract from, the timeless quality of McKinney's building, while still bringing the space around it to life. The front of McKinney's masterpiece was not the moment to introduce an assertively contrasting style of design. At the same time, our design needed to work well with Renzo Piano's simple and modern <coughs> Balance, combination of animation and formality seem to be the order. There is also precedent in New York City for significant residential properties of the early 20th century that feature formal gardens, including, for example, Carnegie's home, or Carnegie uh, Mansion, which had a well known formal garden designed by Richard Schemer Hall. Today, in the place of Henry K. Frick's mansion, up the right, formal landscaping by Olmsted Jr., part of its original design on Fifth Avenue, and the Barlow Mansion in the Bronx, right. We know from the Morgan and McKim archives and letters that Morgan instructed McKim in July 1902 to create for him, and I'm quoting, a library beautiful in appearance with as much garden around it as the above requirements allow. 
And beyond the garden in front of the King's Library, there was a formal courtyard garden on the site of the Dodge House on 1903, <coughs> so that was raised in 1903. This garden occupied the space that is now incorporated into the field of court, or we see it in the garden room on the left. Designed by Beatrix Farrand, who had also been responsible for plantings in front of the King's structure, this, this interior courtyard garden is no longer excellent, but it is an example of a rather formal garden on the property. And of course, there are important examples of institutional buildings at the time featuring the structure of gardens. The original design of New York Libraries, Stephen A. Schwartzman building, in 1911 by Graham Hastings on the right, the formal parterres and alleys of trees, and careful landscaping was also integral to the design of Waterman Terrace, completed between 1911 and 1926, with the latest building by McKinley White. Given all this, the work of Todd Longstaff Gale is immediately attractive. His work is highly respectful of historic forms, often includes deliberately structured components to which he brings a contemporary freshness and sensibility. We felt he was the perfect designer to address our subject. Todd will present the designs to you shortly, but because I suspect he was too modest to mention it, I did want to know that we shared the designs of the regular Canada building workshop. It finds them pleasing and compelling. That I think Whereas Renzo used contemporary forms to relate to historic structures, Todd deploys a vocabulary rooted in history to enter into dialogue with both the McKean Library and the piano edition, thereby and, and thereby integrating the entire canvas. It's a pleasure now to hand over to Todd Ron Stafford. Hello, my name is Todd Stafford. I'd like to begin um, by showing you first the full extent of the, of the project site, the green space in the back is the Northern Library, and, uh, and the area of the present that we've seen on the 5,400 square feet of green space shown that lies adjacent to the 1906 library, Renzo Gano's full gallery, as well um, as the, the annex of the plant of And this plan shows our scene from the garden, which you will be seeing. And this sketch shows a bird's eye view from East Sussex to the Open Garden. It serves to illustrate two important underlying principles between the form and garden site. The first is the garden is low and unobtrusive, with a view to preserving architectural integrity of the library and its function. And secondly, the proposed removal of the trees at the east end, that's the right hand side of the slide, the garden, will reveal the full extent of the library's east, south, and west facades, restoring the balance and architectural unity. Composition. This view shows the three annex looking to the west. And this shows the view that this is the first enjoy of the happening part of the annex itself. You notice how the garden is very low, so it doesn't have any impact, the minimal impact on the building. And this diagram shows the ADA accessible bluestone path that will allow for the first time in institutions in history. Visitors of all levels of mobility to access and experience the East Services Blue Garden and to see the exterior of the library, cube, and annex at close quarters. Pebble paving should add decent interest and subtle variety of the ground plan of garden. The material and patterns in which it should be laid, like the architect, uh, like the library's architecture itself, are Italian and seamless. And this shows a view of what the pattern paving should look like in front of the library. Designs for this pavement have been informed by patterns of the library's <coughs> profit ceiling. This shows a pattern in recent years. Ancient Roman and Italian Renaissance and antiquities should be among the most unusual and important elements of New York. These were acquired by J.P. Morgan in the early 20th century, and almost certainly with a view to placing it in the garden in that salon. Most of these rather items have never have been installed for over half a century and have never been seen in public view. We propose to display these antiquities in a manner which Beatrix Farrow had prepared for the 1920s portrait designs. That is, they will be placed close to the trees from two paths so that we can best examine the right instance of the garden. I'm going to go back to one thing to explain that the sarcophagus is still being worn, and the Paraphysian Renaissance wellheads will remain in situ. The two lines of portals and the Roman stele shall puncture at the end of the bottom. In 
terms of plasma, I just would love to build a subtle kind of development to complement how you've got the dust slab for samples. Heroin bed for the main entrance to the nitro. The brass panel should provide space for gathering a clean catalog to renovate the facade. The small liberal beds set within the panel pavements should be loose and contemporary in the field. Because I mentioned before, trees planted in 2006 on the east side of the driveway that were damaging the structure have been removed. And a large line tree will be um, removed also to serve as one of the gardens, which will um, be replaced by the public tree and set in the public footpath. No flowering trunks can be seen there, probably on the east side behind the back of the uh, house areas. Um, the ramp which should right access to the museum was actually built in 1991. It lies immediately adjacent to the annex entrance, which was formerly, as I said, the main entrance to the museum at night. It's concealed here from the plain of the dark road to the right of the steps. The ramp can be easily adapted to give direct access from the annex to the garden and from the garden to the street. This drawing shows the present layout of the ramp, and this plan shows the how it's proposed to be extended to create an ADA compliant path to the east of the street garden. A new bronze railing will also be added, which will be based as well on the stainless steel railings and has some avenue. Um, but these will be fabricated in bronze to bend the other network in the same system. And that's now the handle is to make fully um, the explained to that. Metropolitan Museum on the right. 
we believe our approach will restore a sense of poetry and welcome to the Morgan Garden. And I will now turn over my presentation to Jessica Woodley, who will discuss the science proposal.
Space was occupied by plantings is now totally covered with museum construction, including enough of the narrow space between the annex and the library to make any reconstruction of the experiment, experiment there impossible. This is despite the fact that we know exactly what plant experiments specify and where she placed them. Complete and very legible plants are preserved in the archive of the University of California at Berkeley. She continued to serve as advisor until the death of her son in 1943, but later her designs were of no interest to the institution under Mr. Bruce or to this commission in 2002. Only at Dunbar Oaks in Washington and in the literature of art and design does her work survive. The New York Times now prints retrospective obituaries of women who died unnoticed by the newspaper of record. Perhaps one day, Farrah uh, will receive that proof. Her husband did actually. That's Farrah, so thank you. Thank you. Brittany Thomas. Brittany Thomas, Historic Districts Council. HGC thanks the applicant for a presentation and a thorough explanation of this lovely project. The signage program is a vast improvement and will facilitate better public wayfinding to the institution. The article landscape scheme is handsome, regal, and fitting of the Morgan Library and is a welcome player in the design history of this complex. It is a light-handed approach that balances paving and greenery and echoes the classical and processional order of the world. HGC is pleased to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Goldman. Good afternoon, Chair Carol and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy's Public Policy Committee reviewed this proposal and thanks the project team for their presentation. The Morgan Library is, of course, one of New York's finest jewels. This elegant complex draws visitors to both its extraordinary collections and exhibitions and its fine architecture. Any alterations should be considered carefully so that they both enhance and respect the landmark. This proposal accomplishes those goals well. The new landscaping features a series of linear elements that echo the library. New lighting will focus appropriately on the central entrance while increasing safety. The unified signage establishes an identity for the building's programming in a refined manner. Overall, these subtle changes will improve the experience of viewing and visiting the Morgan while deferring to its remarkable architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, so I'll just also note for the record that we received uh, nine letters in support, uh, four of which are from organizations and five are from individuals. And we have a resolution from the Manhattan Community Board 6 um, recommending um, supporting the application and um, also noting that the library and museum start exterior restoration no longer later than 2021 for completion and in any ways from the restoration will be kept at respectful levels. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. <clears throat> um, you know, the Mexican Pickle On page 9, do you mind, would it be all right if we could look at the um, foreign plan if that is in fact hers? Yes. And could you point out what features you are sort of bringing back from, from her plan or what uh, is no longer in the scope of the project? Um, this is in a, this is a book I have. And so we are using the similar, I uh, have similar in the past. Um, and we're keeping it kind of quite straightforward. And I think that we're not trying to replicate the planting because we've decided that also there's it's not a history of great garden acres. It's not, it's not a very large extent. Also, that there are trees that would preclude more than light. To so, for instance, if you, if you don't mind just pointing to where on the plan. These, are, these things here in the center, this linear arrangement, is a linear arrangement of antiquities that were bought by J.B. Morgan to display this garden. So we're using the same um, antiquities you know, that were there. And um, also, just on the top there, there's another marble. This is a model. It doesn't say precisely what it is, but those were all born with that intention. So it's really just in the spirit, I think, just this idea of having a similar idea. We're not trying to try to group that design or copy that design. It's just this idea of using the space. 
She was doing the early sort of that with the guy on the instructions that I think. And um, we are just sitting there doing it. Sadly, there's no scheme that survives for the front or the no. For the front? No. For the front, no. the front, no. front, no. front, no. front no. and the line. No. Right. Yeah. This is not, this is where the guild of is. This, this garden will be down here, but there's no plan for that. There's no plan for that. <coughs> you just know that he says that he wanted to see my friend come to the garden and stop the guild. I think yeah. the reason the reason was we suspect because the machine commission allowed him just to go forward his death in 1912. And he traveled abroad and all the sorts of sanctioned by the tulip bulbs and which is in the area of quantities. He died not having seen his family, his son had come on the way, and his life was more or less under his cover and death was right. So the intention was to go on, and I think that his son. But as far as we know, the street side always had just lawn grass. Just lawn, okay. I just wanted to say we have a late resolution with the stone. But just to mention that she. Uh, just to mention that she. Beatrix Stone writes to, writes to uh, his daughter on my wall very late in October 1912. In the, in the place. And she gives him her rate, which is $50 a day, and she writes, I shall hope to have the garden looking nicely by the time Mr. Morgan gets back early next summer, as it may take a little time to do this. Early next summer is 1913. Morgan dies in London on the 31st of March, 1913. 16th of April, she writes, Beatrice writes to Morgan's son, no work done on the garden since Morgan has asked me to take it on. Alterations decided upon were to add evergreen shrubs to make the garden as green as possible in winter, to change the shape and size of the flower beds a little, in order not to make the new fountain look so crowded. And the fountain was actually salty. So this is really all. This, these are information. This is precise information that we've got about the plans in front of the of the Kim, and, it, and it, we have we have no further information as to that because it's not continued. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Amazing what research will, will, will be able to spread. Thank you. Um, it sounds though that from the information you've been able to uh, obtain, the intention for the front and the reality of the front from its uh, origins to today was green, right? Um, it was a dog, I just said this was green. No, no, but, that, but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're making a very conscious choice to reduce the amount of green and to have the building uh, surrounded or abutted by uh, masonry. Can you explain why you made that choice and why you decided to put the, the green where you did and not where you, in other places? Um, we decided to put the green, uh, I mean, largely this is driven by the necessity of the desire to introduce public access for the first time and to enable access throughout the site and to bring people across the place, we have to have TDF power, ADA compliant powers. And to do that, to get a good big circuit, we need to have the growth of powers. We found we want to bring people up to the building itself because having cleaned it, it's just a remarkable building. So we really are, it's the smallest site, but we try to maximize the area uh, the, uh, of the planting. We also have trees in the, in the road, off dead, but still. We do cast shade on the area, so um, it's not as it's, bright. It's when we have sought with the flowers in the areas over here, it will, it will enhance that. But I, I think that we accept that it's a, it's a new layer on the landscape. But I think that it's, um, as it were, it's a new response. We have the area, I would represent now what really has been taking place across the campus elsewhere. But it is, as it were, um, a, new, a, a new plan, it's true. But I think that to, to cover the grass, we have to, I mean, to, to allow the access, we do lose some of the grass, that's an excessive. But I think that the benefit is taking him up. And what's very important that you may understand anyway, is from the law, is that the garden is raised on plinth, and the building is perceived from the road at the end of that. And what we thought from the very beginning was terribly important was not to impede to minimize the impact of the garden on the land, on the, on the building itself. So we sought to keep everything incredibly there. And this was um, one of the constraints that we thought was very important, as well as this idea of just trying to 
express as clear as possible the whole totality of the science. And as I say, the science is the East side, this is presently completely a slight concealment kind of So this was actually, and with the new lighting scheme, the intention was to the building has much more of a cast of Renaissance concealment. And I think this is the, the precedent really that Morgan's looking at. It's an incredibly well informed plan, it's by its architects. They travelled Europe and they came up with an idea that's a composite. And in fact, the library interiors, the rotunda, is the floor there is basically the pier, the Renaissance gardens great by past fourth in the gardens, where the paving that he used inside the library was actually intended for the garden. So using the same source as that, as the Renaissance for the pier, we extrapolated that in fact it's, it's the same idea that we're using here. And, and in fact, in the villa pier, the whole of the exit was paved. And this is the source of, that was drawn, was used as a source by the Kim and certainly by the that's how we understand it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Is there any other questions? Um, I one. Yes, go ahead. Just, uh, the um, pebbled um, rocks that you're talking about, what is the name for that? I just called pebble work. Pebble work. So that would have really been typically uh, the actual walking surface. But because of the you know, issues, we don't really use that here. And so I'm just wondering if it's somewhat compromised in this kind of border, border wall. I, I think it adds to I think it adds to the decoration of the garden. And I think also this garden is very shady. And I think that I've tried to impress on this, but the trees are, are this is a narrow site and the trees are quite large. And I think that they're they're likely to overshadow. Mm -hmm. so, sorry. That the trees are likely to overshadow the garden. So we did we did try other things. This is this is a result of 18 months of preparation. So and going back to all various times we decided we, we did absolutely much simpler. And we also for those who are not um, or are able to walk in the pebbles, we are invited to get up close to things too. So it does actually offer you the opportunity. As you've seen from the other example, um we've only got Lumsden Junior and the Golden Pebbles the brick um, itself. So they're they're not very dangerous to my time. I have a quick question. Yes, um, are you expecting or inviting people to not only go up upon that pool of green, but to sit on it? So we are beginning to, we will be having uh, guided tours throughout the week and weekends from the, from the building itself to experience the architecture. Uh, there will be different programs. We have not yet fully, we, we will have some educational programs. Initially, our desire is not to have people seated on the lawn, the small lawn. Um, we want to see how these develop. But we are very keen to, because these tools all come through the annex. No one just walks into the garden. They come through the annex. We're very keen for all parts of the, the new green space, the garden, the full cube and in front of the kid, that they can be people can get close to them. We're not looking at seating on the wall. Yes, question. Yeah. It seems like the most controversial move, so to speak, is the, is the, is the desire to put the uh, uh, overhead green lights yeah. um, uh, out there, because they're rather visible. Um, could you accomplish a similar effect with a, a light fixture that was uh, mounted to the top of the cornice washing up instead of something washing down? Um, well, I mean, our, 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 our first take on this is that we really didn't want to spray the, this, this white building to become a kind of a monument right. in the neighborhood. We, you know, it's a quiet, it is a quiet residential lot in many ways, and people are looking directly at it. So our idea is to but in a very shielded way and, and really use the ground plane as a, as a gentle bounce surface. Um, uh -huh. So these lights point down to the ground yeah. and then the reflection comes yeah, up. Exactly. So could you achieve that effect through the light fixtures that were in the ground pointing up? No. I mean, and, too and sharp. It's, it's, it's too sharp. We have, you know, first of all, 
we have a lights pointing up, which is not a direction that we're going in New York, and, and we have residents who are straight down into it, so the idea of an uplight is just kind of throwing off the historic stage as well. Um, secondly, if we had to do that, we have to force the lights out into the garden, so then it becomes a garden without lighting, which we didn't want to happen. Um, and and I, I, I think we will do better to bring out the beautiful detailing of the Rocha and that everything else to be, I, I can't emphasize enough, quiet um, with a uh, pre-programmed sleep setting so that the building goes to sleep at night. It doesn't become totally dark, but it goes to sleep so there's no disruption. Other questions? Let's have a motion to close the hearing. So, okay. All in favor? Discussion. So we have three areas to comment on. Garden design, um, in the annex, the cube, and the library, and the in the street. We have the signage proposal, which is really moving the number of signs and, and um, Reducing the number of signage and changing the design and then the light fixtures, which again, most of the light fixtures I believe are eligible for a staff level permit because they're small and discreet and not this low location. So the eight that we were talking about to get them to be on the staff levels authority. Um, so it's those three aspects we would like to start talking I think in all three areas, we have extremely well done. I think that the, the new wayfinding. Uh, and it's very, very discreet and it's very effective. Uh, I'm glad the applicant pointed out that this is one, actually one of the main arteries leading to a midtown tunnel. And whenever you drive through that, this is another site we want to see, especially for such an important uh, uh, structure. And then the garden, what can I say? This is a gift to be done. I just think this is. <laughs> A wonderful addition. I walk past the building all the time. It almost seems like an abandoned artifact in a uh, backyard or something. You know, this is this revitalization is going to be fantastic. Yes. And my only concern is, given the description from the history about the texts, that the intention of the house was always to be seen sitting in green. Uh, I'm concerned about the extent of the behaving and the fact that it's immediately adjacent to the building on two sides. Um, I, I, I wouldn't vote against it if everyone else is for it, but I, I personally think that that um, the building was intended by, by the designer and the owner to see the underneath. And by abutting it with stone, uh, the pavement, you're changing the way the building is seen, you're changing the feeling of the building as it hits the ground. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that it's on the plan, but because it's on the plan, the junction between the ground and the building becomes more important. It's kind of held up on a platter for everyone to see. And I'm concerned that that change, while I think it's a very attractive one, uh, changes the nature of the building historically. And if we're trying to preserve that in the initial intent, I think that it would be better served if the paved portion slid forward up against perhaps the, the, uh, the wall uh, and, and the green portion be shifted back so that the building sat in green. Uh, I think that the uh, lighting scheme is, is, uh, is really lovely actually. <coughs> I understand the staff's concerned about the dependents that hang out there. Uh, I think that it's probably going to be okay. I think that the signage is great. Anyone else? Hi. Well, firstly, how great for this administration to have found that their own building is, is the treasure uh, to work on. And I think they're, they're absolutely right. So, it, it, the way it sits today, or the way we perceive it today, is, is, is so kind of forgotten. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful project. project. I, I really hadn't thought about what Michael was describing. I, I might agree with him, but I don't know that it, that it would preclude uh, the ability to walk through the, the area. I mean, it might just be kind of a shift in the proportion, slight proportion or dimension 
of the walkway versus the green, that this point was sort of equally distributed with the green. I was suggesting that they just pull the whole thing forward. But again, I don't really, it's, it's up to them how to do it. I was, I was raising that concern. Yeah. But I think you could have it to be, to be completely unchanged, functionally, by just shifting shifting the, the paving portion forward so that it sits up against the, the wall instead of up against the building. You'd still be able to you know, go all the way around it. Uh, <clears throat> it just would give the building a little bit of breathing room. Put the green up against the building. But again, that's their design. I don't I, I I think it necessitates a compromise. Yeah. I, I understand it, so I think we should consider it. Okay. Other thoughts? Uh, I, uh, I agree with Michael and Nadia. I think that um, the feeling of the building having just a green border is, is really um, you know, important historically and also, I think, visually. And I think it's a minor modification. I think it's a wonderful uh, project. Um, very happy to see them opening up this area and, and making it possible for people to walk in. Also, the signage is fine. I think the lighting is important, and I think it will work. And if it doesn't, then it's really Okay, Angela, I know. Oh, um, I think it's an elegant, elegant new design project. I love the um, I love the lighting because of the way the steam is still and the subject is not just hot, it's quite beautiful. I particularly like the patterns, because the patterns kind of reflected the kind of where this building came from, the kind of uh, the, the pattern and the ground quite lovely. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay, thank you.
think that so those are valid comments. <coughs> it's the text, the documentation that we have, though it's limited, does indicate that the building is sitting green. And so I think to the extent that you continue to develop the idea, we encourage you to continue to think about how there can be more green on the building. But we will make a motion to vote it, uh, to approve it as is today. So, Diane? In the matter of certificate of appropriateness for Manhattan LBC 203228, 29-33 East 36th Street, Fair Comic Morgan Library and Apps, Individual and Interior by Mom. An Italian Renaissance Eclectic Style Library, designed by Charles Holden McCown, and built in 1903 to 1906. With an annex designed by Benjamin Mr. Morris and built in 1928. Application is to alter the front yard and install landscaping, lighting, and signage. Um, I note that the landmark site of the Morgan Library includes the original library building, the annex, the connector between them, and that the library's design is a low pavilion surrounded by a black grass lawn. I also know that the site historically featured a garden designed by Beatrix Farron and installed in 1928 between the library and annex and the J.P. Morgan Jr. House, which was subsequently removed. I recommend approval uh, and finding I think that the finding of other mansions and family complexes historically featured gardens and landscaping in an urban context. And there is a precedent for design by gardens at other locations on this site. Therefore, the presence of a garden in front of the library will be in keeping with the historic setting of prominent buildings both at this site and throughout the city. With the proposed landscaping will be seen through the historic decorative perimeter fence and will feature low profile plantings which will not obscure the views of the building or call on due attention to itself. With the landscaping design and paving materials, including blue stone, double pavement, and loose gravel, will be harmonious with the complex of buildings and streets there. That the display of antiquities within the garden for public viewing will be consistent with the mission of the library and museum. That the proposed plant buildings at the existing ramp in front of the annex will match other modern gradients throughout the site. That the installation of a new ramp between the existing ramp and the green space to the east will require the removal of only a limited amount of plain masonry and will facilitate barrier-free access within the site. That the proposed changes to the signage will reduce the overall amount of signage at the site. That the plaques to be removed are not significant architectural features. That the proposed plaques are small in size, simple in design, and will be reversible in nature. That the modifications to the freestanding signs at the Madison Avenue entrance will retain the steel frame, helping them remain related to the modern addition. That the proposed signage is in keeping with the color palette of the historic design interior of the library, which is also a designated interior landmark. And that the proposed light fixtures and armature at the library parapets um, will be limited in number and will not detract from the rest of the balustrade or the silhouette of the building. And its proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of this individual landmark. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that's approved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next item is number nine, LPC 20-02927, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the road and have block 267 on 25 right on the plaza, the individual room. An office tower designed by Robert Carson and Earl Linden with Wallace Harrison in built in 1946 and 47 as part of the Art Deco style office commercial entertainment room. The application is to install entry and fill and then illuminate the RP with some Thank you. 
preservation for the staff. The proposal is for a change on the north facade of the curtain wall, uh, at 75 North Field Plaza. It is to install a new entry and illuminated marquee within the gate curtain wall and the west side of the central entry portal. And we have cast out we are here to describe the project. So as Catherine said, the project addressed the 75 block color plaza, uh, and uh, our, our client RSR, uh, the chairman is here. Um, the, the project is, is focused, as Catherine said, about uh, installing just a, a marquee in the north, on the north uh, elevation of West 52nd Street uh, of 75 block color plaza. This is associated with uh, a new use, sort of an adaptive use of the commercial office building for an extended stay uh, hotel up at the top portion of 75 Rockwater Plaza. The building um, uh, was designed by Carson London. Um, it was the last building at the center to be completed. It was completed in 1947. Um, and obviously, as you can tell from this photograph, looking north of Rockwater Plaza, it was planned and positioned directly on access uh, with Rockwater Plaza. It's a fascinating history about this uh, construction and, and, and the end of this idea of Rockwater Plaza Rock 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 connecting the center with a uh, cultural campus to the north, right around where the Museum of Modern Art is located today. But because of the need for more office space after World War II, they decided to develop these parcels that they own. Um, so you can see 75 Rockefeller Plaza here, sort of the plug at the top uh, of the plaza. Uh, it's highlighted here in this uh, aerial photograph. And then this is a photograph looking west uh, along the West 52nd Street um, portion of the building. Um, the, the area of work is down at this end, and as you can tell from the site plan, um, the building has this irregular, uh, it has an irregular, uh, it has an irregular uh, footprint. It has a, a hundred foot feet of frontage uh, facing into Rockefeller Center, uh, and it has 275 feet of frontage uh, facing uh, 152nd Street and moving into, into Midtown. And the area of work that we're proposing, uh, the changes are really right here, just west of the building entry. Uh, the existing and proposed elevation on West 52nd Street. Currently, the, the main office lobby entry is at the center. There's an existing retail space here and a vacant retail space to the, um, to the west. The loading dock for the building is here. And the proposal is to basically use this bay for an entry for the, uh, for the hotel above and incorporate a restaurant um, adjacent to the existing vacant space. The upper floors as I mentioned, the upper 10 floors from uh, floors 21 to 30 would be used for extended, uh, extended stay. Uh, a part plan to the full, uh, full, uh, full plan uh, of the ground floor with 52nd Street above and 51st Street below. Uh, this is right now the, the, the main office lobby, and this is the retail space um, to the west uh, that is currently vacant. The proposal is to incorporate a sort of a hotel amenity restaurant bar in that vacant space with the entry uh, for the hotel here, uh, directly east of that bay, and then connecting it internally um, so that there's a connection to the entry and, and the amenity. There'd be a, a sort of shared lobby between the, the office space and the, uh, and the, and the hotel as well. Um, this image you just saw um, that uh, Catherine shared with you, this is the base of the West 52nd Street elevation. Um, there's a uh, retail space here, the building entry here. The area of work is actually in this single bay here. And what you have is you look across the bay, face you have the original curved marble entry that historically uh, accessed a bank, a bank and the base of the building. Uh, and then this deeply retail building entry. And so the base of the building and even on uh, 51st Street actually has a number of sort of curved elements, but an interesting sort of set of differing geometries and shapes across, across the base of the building. Uh, this is an existing photograph looking at the existing um, uh, entry into the building lobby, uh, and then uh, the area of work over here with a rendering of what we're proposing. So we're proposing a, a bronze um, projecting canopy, approximately uh, eight feet projection and seven feet wide with an illuminated 
uh, underside, the translucent underside, and, and uh, just dimensional layers across the top, uh, taking out uh, the zero out of random uh, basic one page uh, and installing two, uh, two slam doors uh, in, in this place. So the work is actually quite limited uh, in its, in its area and its scope. Uh, a series of uh, elevations just to show, to show you what the recent changes have been in the building. So, um, in 2015, I believe, we came uh, before the commission for a series of changes across both the base of the 52nd Street and 51st Street side. So, the top elevation is the elevation before that project, where you can see a, a series of projecting canopies and different elements for restaurant tenants that were across the base of the building, and the building entry, and then the entry here to the uh, to the retail space, the banking and store banking space. Um, the approved elevation, a new door here, uh, another door here set uh, at a slightly uh, lower elevation building entry uh, here for the lobby, and then a new uh, a new entry here for, for the retail space and loading to the side. And then our proposal here at the bottom um, with this as being the, uh, the sole change on this very, very long elevation. So obviously part of the goal here is to uh, identify the entry for, uh, for this new hotel user, uh, for people coming along the side street for this very large, uh, expansive uh, uh, ground floor uh, facade. Um, some, of the, some of the canopies that were in place just prior to the uh, previous proposal uh, in 2015, obviously projecting some of the pre-dated designation, some of the post-dated. Um, some other existing photographs along West 52nd Street showing the variety of uh, materials, configurations, and geometry that exist uh, across the base of the building. Um, again, another existing photograph looking now east on West 52nd Street, and then, uh, and then a rendered view of what we're proposing. In kind of glass, there's a, an open uh, bronze grill that adds some character and distinction definition to that entry uh, that set back about 18 inches behind the uh, behind glass. Um, obviously, as you probably know, uh, Rockefeller Center historically had um, different uh, marquee and canopy types. Uh, the north and south sides of 30 Rockefeller Plaza historically had bronze and, and lit signage uh, canopies on either side. Uh, 50 Rockefeller, uh, Rock, the Associated Press building, uh, had an illuminated uh, marquee uh, and, of course, Radio City. And the commission has approved over the last 25 years since designation um, uh, simple sort of contemporary modern uh, canopies along Avenue the Americas and more sort of um, referential ones like this one at the uh, 6th Avenue side of uh, 1250 Avenue. Um, so we think that uh, this design uh, sort of draws on, on the history of Marquis in the center, uh, but does it in a, 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 a contemporary way on a building that really comes on the midtown, not so much onto the Rockefeller Plaza. So then we're going to have um, Trent just take you through some of the detailing uh, of our proposal. Yes, this is Peter Tao. I'm Trent Hesh from the University of Fox. Um, we've been working on this for a couple of years now. Um, as Pat pointed out, uh, we are, uh, we're in, this building is unique because it's part of the Rock Center campus, but it's a newer addition. Um, so we're always straddling that in between, in between Art Deco, uh, the mid-century modern kind of aesthetic. Um, and so just to give you some dimensional um, characteristics that Pat already pointed out, this data that we're trying to kind of create here. It's this uh, marquee ties back, you can see in, in a section, cross section here. So a column to an internal column, um, and this ties back into sort of another data that's, that's inside, inside the building. So um, uh, the, the height is about a 10 foot um, high clear zone in this, in this uh, particular part of the, of the sidewalk. Um, it sticks out about eight feet in this direction, and it's about um, seven feet wide. You can see specifically this is the bay that's being removed. This piece of stone will, will come out. Uh, two sliding doors will go in because that's I, from a hotel standpoint, people with their luggage uh, sliding or sort of requirement. Um, and then we have um, the eight foot high canopy. We have uh, sort of a LED illuminated uh, underside that is, is can be dimmed, um, or, um, but it's meant to be a very soft glow on the sidewalk. 
Um, and then we have this, uh, this sliding door rail. And then we have this addition of a, a bit of a uh, bronze bar stock filigree that kind of creates a little bit of identity along the side. Um, this is the current plan. You can see the column that is holding up the, the canopy above. Um, and that's the structure that the canopy is attached to. You see that back just there. Any more questions? Why do you have the doors to kind of open onto a column? Um, well, we talked about, that's who we talked about that quite a bit. Um, that this is really the only position in the plan that we could actually um, uh, locate a door to it's, it's, it's just how the client wanted us to look at it and um, that we all felt like this is a position to have that to have that door. It's it's not uh, it's not so close that you couldn't get um, movement around it. Um, but it was it was something that we talked about uh, quite a bit. Um, they feel, everybody feels like it, it, it will work. Um, and we can't, we don't feel like we can take it down because it would be a uh, significant cost. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, no, it's a point of all day, point of all day. Yeah, really <laughs> um, and so and then in terms of the elevation, you can see uh, we have, we'll introduce a new piece of glass here. Um, the canopy is in this position here. Uh, the, uh, the kick plate, tennis kick plate that matches the other side, uh, the other doors. Um, and then zooming in uh, a little bit more uh, closer to the details, you can kind of see the, uh, there will be a drain, that drain will slope back to the column, so you won't, you'll never see that. Um, it's about a foot and a half in dimension. Um, the, the dimension of the thickness of the canopy. Um, and let's see, these are some other details. Um, uh, there you see the gutter detail here in the back. Um, and then this is the sort of the device that would be close to the door. There's a pocket so you won't see that stuff. Um, and the existing volumes of the, of the curtain wall exist. There's a sill that's the, the heater that heats the glass. Um, we decided that we needed to get past that sill on this side, so we extended these mullions back to the side of the side of the um, But again, they kind of tie into the existing, this is an existing mullion that reaches back to go to a, a fire suspension. Um, and then these are some of the materials on the inside. Uh, they kind of link, they, they intend gears to really warm up a very cool palette um, that was that was part of the renovation of the it adds a little bit of work back into the into the um, the gas closet. Yeah. What is, what's the theory behind the asymmetry of the second layer of the uh, uh, of the light canopy? Asymmetry. There's a yeah. There's a um, there's a whole design. I don't know if you can see beyond this room, but there's a there's a bit of a design on the inside. That extends back in this canopy and the extension of that of that uh, design work. Yeah, no, it's just it's just uh, uh, other questions? Okay, let's see if we have anyone to speak. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on this application? Okay. We do have a resolution from Community Board 5 recommending approval of the creation of a new entrance with sliding glass doors on uh, the condition that the brass screen on the inside of the glass be modified to fit more appropriately within the historic context of the building, and on the condition that the marquee above the door be modified in size and illumination for a more harmonious appearance. Yeah, just quickly address that. I think that the bronze screen is an element that's dimensioned basically 18 inches uh, back in the glass, it's really an interior feature. And it's something that will uh, likely be sort of exchanged in our time. It's really seen more of it as a, almost like a uh, But just, uh, just addressing this notion about the, the depth of the canopy, I think um, the proportion of it actually, um, I think, feels and 
sure the can speak to this, but the portion feels right for the building. Um, so this is something that obviously uh, we look at closely. Uh, there was some discussion at the community board about shortening it, and you end up with actually sort of a square plan canopy, which sort of doesn't really fit right uh, or feel right for the use. And then just in terms of the illumination, I think one of the things to, to think about is, is particularly the articulation of the base of 75 rock versus some of the earlier buildings, which have um, sort of punched openings or masonry, and there's a sort of a greater contrast in those buildings with the lit um, marquees as compared to here, where at 75, you have this, this straight curve wall. So there's a sort of already a sort of more contemporary feel. And also, obviously, compared to, to the existing, this, the interior spaces will be lit as well. So it'll be even less contrast, perhaps, between the interior space and the underside of the marquee. So I think it will actually blend by quite well and won't, won't actually be sort of something that stands out as, as some kind of fault. Are there any last questions? And that's a motion to close the meeting. Okay. I think it's, you know, there's been a history of your openings moving around on this uh, facade of this particular building, which is a later building, uh, in this change of places outside of the plaza for 52nd Street. And we have approved, have approved here, and it's approving our keys here on the same spot as we should be well integrated with the curtain. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chelsea Historic District. 
Creek of Office on the Roadhouse for the 1839 field. The application is to construct a rear yard in addition, uh, excavate a rear yard and alternate the rear yard. Utilizing double hung board windows 
and French doors with multi light panes within existing or extended masonry openings above the column floor. And so that's this level. And then it, it, uh, there's a two story extension, the proposed design provide, provides an extension at the garden and hollow level, which extends 7 foot 7 beyond the previously approved extension. The design works on the historic concept of a tea porch, two distinct stories, um, frame, wooden framing with end pilasters. It creates a link between the interior and exterior, utilizing folding doors and cells, um, with multi, multi light paints, um, both at the, at the garden level and at the hollow level. At the cellar, um, the low grade extension is proposed. At the rooftop, um, no addition or bulkhead is proposed. The top of the rear facade will be terminated with the articulated brick and coping stones and a light, lightweight mesh railing for road compliance. So just briefly to say, our intent in developing the revisions to the rear facade from, from uh, this proposal to the one on the right um, has been to provide a coherent design appropriate to the historic push and grow. Uh, a key issue here is visibility. There is no rooftop addition being proposed, even though one was approved by the LPC in 2006. The currently proposed addition at the ground and hollow floors has limited visibility from the public way primarily over a parking lot and a playground. And even though there's limited visibility, the design of the extension is conceived within the historic context, drawing on the concept of the two-story revival to porch. Um, the proposed extension of the cellar in terms of visibility will be below the grave and there therefore not visible from the public way. Another key issue here is fenestration, and the proposed fenestration uses multi-lights both within the brick facade of the upper floors and at the chief porch inspired extension. We believe that the proposed design provides coherence, yet variety, which is consistent with the rear facades of the Christian world. And we should come to protect the result when we take you through the detailed presentation. Thank you, Judith. Um, we should look at the results from our evidence. Yeah. Focus on the uh, context. I think so much of the conversation last time was about its relationship with the rest of the road, its visibility. But I think the changes have been presented very clearly. Yes, absolutely. So uh, just to very briefly uh, introduce uh, the site, um, we have a 1903 photograph. Um, as Judith mentioned, the original construction was 1839 to 40, with provide a row um, extending from 406 to 418. And we have the um, photo on the left from uh, 1939 tax photo, and then on the right um, showing the current the row as it was in 1971 at the time of designation. Um, 418 is on the westmost end of the road, so it is a um, terminating condition of the road, as we were previously showing you. Um, there are um, permanent buildings immediately to the west, and um, another uh, row house immediately to the east, but does not belong to this road. Just in terms of location, the building is um, between 9th and 10th Avenues uh, within the Chelsea Historic District and between 19th and 20th Streets. So um, in terms of where um, the building is located, also um, just to be aware of the General Theological Society directly across the street. So just pretty familiar with that. I think just if you yeah. can get to the back. Right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, we were asked to present this information in terms of aggregating um, the documentation of previously um, approved and existing um, rear extensions within the row. So um, just to be mindful of the fact that we um, are showing only the easternmost half of the um, block um, because of larger buildings that really bifurcate on the block. And again, this kind of road condition, which is proposed here, um, as Judith mentioned, a seven foot seven uh, extension beyond the previously approved in 2006. 
This is a, a detail um, of that previous um, block plan illustrating the uh, conditions of existing and um, two, two story and one story basement extensions. Um, at 418, the existing is uh, 37 7 in terms of the uh, rear yard, and uh, the proposed would still be a compliant 30 foot rear yard uh, if approved. Uh, Judith mentioned this comparison, and I'll call on that a little bit later. In terms of the visibility, um, the visibility really falls into two um, corridors. One from 19th Street and one from 9th Avenue. In all cases, the visibility is um, extremely seasonal. It is um, usually very weak. It is partial. And um, so we can see uh, that the visibility from 19th Street is really through a parking lot for Lencia and from the avenue over a playground um, that really goes from 9th to 19th. The other is, of course, the existing fence um, that is um, present at the rear of 418 that precludes visibility of the basement level from any public thoroughfare. The other important point to make is the fact that at no point when looking at the rear facades of um, Christian Grove can one comprehend the totality of the door from any public thoroughfare. So um, that you, know, you, you can only perceive partial, partial views. In terms of the visibility from 19th Street, again here, the building is outlined in red, and you're only seeing um, the parlor floor as well as the upper floors, nothing on the basement level, and then only a partial sliver um, of the building immediately to the right, floor 16, and that is without foliage. Um, with foliage, the visibility is continuous. We have another view, um, again moving uh, to the east, and 418 outlined in red, um, without foliage and width. And then this is from the west side of 9th Avenue, looking across the um, play arm through to Cushman Row. Um, seeing 418 outlined in red. <clears throat> and then this is the uh, view of the foliage. And then further standing on the um, east side of Ninth Avenue in the same direction. The staff asked that we include some images of the conditions of the rear facade of 418 prior to before the 2006 approval. So uh, what we can see in this photo, uh, which was taken through the fence, um, of the previously existing tea porch, and of course an overall view of the rear facade, again, prior to 2006. So what we, can, what we can understand is that after the 2006 approval, um, this tea porch, of course, was removed to allow for the construction of what the commission approved in 2006. So there is no historic T porch remaining um, at the basement in Parlor 4 of 418. So I just wanted to be very clear about that um, in terms of the documentation and we borrowed from Vincent Chica's presentation, um, which the commission had a, a thorough copy of. In terms of looking at the um, design to inspire um, historic treatment that um, inspired the design of the two portions we're presenting today, we look carefully at Charles Lockwood's very thorough study. Um, he presented um, a testimony at the 2006 uh, public hearing, and the commission had a full record of that testimony. So um, from the bricks and brownstone, we see um, you know, certainly a number of photographs, but this one on the left is particularly telling in terms of um, wood um, and framing, um, in terms of the 
Greek Revival style of town and um, the, the likeness um, of the appearance, also looking at our Canadian White's um, monograph and particularly trying to focus in on some of the detail in which they're typical for Greek Revival style. Uh, as Judith mentioned, um, there is uh, restorative work uh, that has been proposed for the French facade. We understand, of course, that that's um, staff level approval and not for the commission's purview, but we do mention it. Um, equally, on the rear facade, uh, a number of restorative elements are proposed. So, in particular, uh, the removal of a non historic chimney, um, and then, of course, putting um, careful uh, protection in place to make sure that the upper stories are carefully protected um, during the construction that is proposed on the color and basement levels. Um, in terms of other restorative work, uh, some pointing and um, a selective work replacement uh, that was proposed. This is a photo trying to take a view of uh, the neighbors from the rear yard of 418, just to try to give you a sense of um, the relationship and context. Um, it's a week and uh, rather difficult to get a full sense of the way in front of the rear yard of 418. In terms of prior commission approvals, we know um, two in particular. Uh, one at 414 from 1997, um, where the, um, the historic tea porch had been removed without um, approval. Um, the commission asked that it be approved. And uh, following in 2014, at the neighbor immediately to the east of 418, uh, 42 story rear petition. So this is a um, comparison of the critical elevations um, that are, we think are most relevant for the discussion today. Uh, on the far left is the 2006 approval and design by the Tsuchika that the commission approved, and uh, really featuring this um, two-story uh, T-porch design extending six feet from uh, the previous uh, two stories. Extension. And then a uh, multi light uh, window door infill, and then a um, metal and glass roof partition to the hall of the artist studio. Unfortunately, um, not all of what was approved was actually built uh, in conformance with the permit. And so um, we know, that, of course, um, in the previous approval, a very previous presentation. May of this year, and then I'd really just like to focus again on um, the current proposal, which again features this two story wood um, re revival style T torch uh, with multi light infill at the base of the party floors uh, with stairs uh, connecting to the rear of it, um, terminating in a um, wood. Um, uh, termination with no railing above, uh, French doors and tripartite tri transoms uh, at the second floor, and uh, multi light windows on uh, the third floor with one French door transom above that, and then here at the top floor, um, again, multi light windows. The design terminates with a um, proposed um, brick ventilated cornice uh, with a cast on the coping. And then set in the board a um, proposed steel mesh round that we seek to be on the bottom of the seat from the um, No proposed roof partition, but a deck um, that would not be visible from the inside of play, and no um, deck heads of any kind of elevator roof lines. Just to um, get a quick graphic that summarizes the visibility from the public way because of the fence at the rear door that presently exists, um, the visibility of the basement level is not possible from the public way. And only um, the parlor floor would be visible. And the lower most portion of the parlor floor would not be visible from the public. 
This is a, a detail uh, comparing the 2006 existing and current proposed conditions at the upper two floors. Uh, and just focusing on what had approved um, the non compliant, non conforming condition that was constructed, and then the current proposed design. These, again, per your request, Sarah, is to uh, try to illustrate the relationship um, of the rear facade for the team to its neighbors within the road. Um, and what we see uh, with this yellow graphic. Um, the fact that the, um, there's not a uh, synchronicity between uh, some of the uh, detail here versus uh, what you're seeing in the larger elevation below, but we ask that this um, only be seen to really focus on the continuity of plane. That's the really the purpose of this graphic, is to show the continuity of plane, um, particularly from the basement level to the roof. Um, at 406 through 408, um, and then uh, moving on further west, that once you have these two story basement extensions, that you actually have the continuity of plane above that. We are noting, of course, some um, other uh, alterations that occur to the roof line and where it's adjacent. Clear elevation of the existing condition and the current proposal. So again, looking at how this um, height that is proposed um, would be very consistent with the neighbors in the gateway to the east. And building section um, showing the outline of the existing building in uh, red. You can see this combination here. The um, shading in blue illustrates what was previously uh, approved in 2006 and constructed, so a six foot extension. And then what is currently proposed in yellow shading is seven foot seven extension at grade, above grade. And then below grade is a proposed a 19 foot seven extension, but in terms of the projection beyond the um, proposed two story addition as well. So in all cases, um, a 30-foot rear yard um, would be proposed. And um, I'm just wanted to show the relationship of um, different uh, prior approval versus the current and trying to show that on the um, Detailing of the uh, roof conditions in the existing, sorry, in 2006, the existing and um, the current proposed. Again, what had been approved, but not built in performance, and then the current proposed. So again, just to try to understand the um, current um, hydraulic elevator that's been proposed without any elevator override or bulkhead whatsoever. Um, the stair to access the proposed roof deck would occur on the interior um, at the fourth floor. So you would enter here and do a straight run up, um, but there would be no um, stairwell type. Okay? And then a roof deck that would be with the railing here. And I'll show it in greater detail in a moment. This is the existing uh, condition section. This gives you uh, comparison detail between the existing um, upper floors, uh, two through four, and the proposed. The critical thing here is that um, you have some staggered window conditions at the second, third, and fourth floors of the existing condition. Um, however, these used to communicate with a um, interior stair. And unfortunately, that stair was modified prior to the purchase by the current owner. So this means that um, staggered window conditions no longer relate um, to, to this uh, interior condition. So what is proposed um, would be these um, French doors at the second floor and with transoms above and then uh, larger windows. But again, I'm drawing from what already exists at the building immediately uh, to the east in the 416. This is a, a detail on 
showing the proposed uh, dental and red cornice for the cast on clipping. The uh, proposed uh, nine foot uh, extension, sorry, the nine, nine inches um, that is proposed for the deck, and then the location of the inboard um, metal rail with um, mesh. This is a detail of this. And then just some interior plans to show um, existing versus proposed. I have a way to see the Okay, I just want to sum up them very fast by saying that I think the front facades really present a very formal front to the street. And the rear facades, in my view, uh, really present much more informal space. And it really illustrate a tremendous narrative history of change. There have been a number of changes we've looked at a number of historic maps. And I think that a number of changes have occurred over time. Um, the, um, the last thing I'd like to say, too, is that from our understanding of visibility, the proposed depth of the additional seven foot, seven inches will not be perceptible from the public, but it will extremely well Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? We're going to take testimony and we'll come back to you after the testimony. Matthew Tai. Good afternoon, my name is Matthew Tai. I'm here on behalf of Assembly Member Richard Godfrey, who represents the neighborhood around 14 West 20th Street. I'm Assembly Member Richard N. Godfrey. I represent the 75th Assembly District in Manhattan, which includes the neighborhoods of Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, Midtown, part of the Upper West Side, and the Flatiron District. I'm writing to express my opposition to this application's proposal to expand the rear addition of 418 West 20th Street, as well as alter the second and third floor window openings and lower and expand the south gate. This building is the westernmost house of Christian Row, a nationally recognized example of Greek revival row houses, and a standout feature of the Chelsea historic district. The proposal to expand the rear addition by seven and a half feet would go well beyond any other addition on Christian Row, whose architectural significance in part relies on design uniformity. This is the same size expansion that the Commission denied in its previous hearings about this building. The applicant's argument that public views of the expansion would be minimal is false. The rear of the property is fully as bolted its next door neighbors on Fishman Road, and the rear neighbors at Fulton Houses, as well as passing pedestrians who can view the rear of the road through the parking lot on 19th Street. Cushman Row features a distinct window pattern along the rear, indicating the presence of interior stairs. This pattern remains mostly intact along the entire row. Architectural unity in the rear of the row is important for preservation values and should not be allowed to be disrupted. It is important that any issues in the rear wall be repaired as part of any rehabilitation and not be used as an excuse for demolition. Concerns have been raised by the community that the proposal to lower the cell floor by two feet and expand it by 30 feet would undermine the historic rear wall of the house and the party wall with 416 West 20th Street. The excavation work would likely create vibrations that would endanger the structural integrity of 418 and its neighboring buildings. I share these concerns. The commission should ensure that we avoid a situation where historic structures can be irreparably damaged by construction conditions. As the Commission has recognized in its rulings, the architectural significance of Cushman Row is an important piece of New York City history worthy of protection. Thank you. Lizette Chaparro. My name is Lizette Chaparro, and on behalf of Manhattan Borough President Gail Lake Brewer, I would like to urge you to deny the application for a certificate of appropriateness for 418 West 20th Street. The building that is before you today is part of a row of seven buildings known as Cushman's Row, uh, a set of uniform three uh, and a half story townhouses. 
The building currently contains uh, 5,500 square feet, is supposed to be converted for single family use, and yet the applicant is report, proposing an entire gut renovation and rear yard extension. The proposed extension would be significantly larger than the additions made to the other buildings on Fishman's Road, despite the fact that those other buildings are similar in size. If this application is approved by the commission, all that will be left of the original building will be the facade and a portion of the roof. To propose such a drastic alteration it is an affront to the Chelsea Historic District. Uh, the Borough President agrees with, the com with Community Board 4 in St. Chelsea that the scope of the work proposed by the applicant threatens to undermine the architectural and historical integrity of this historic building. To the extent that the building has structural issues, those issues should be remediated in a manner that preserves this historic home. It's not impossible. Plenty of applicants that come before the LBC are able to undertake significant structural repairs while preserving their building. Furthermore, the Borough President believes that even though the building is not subject to an interior designation, the complete alteration of the footprint of every floor except the four floors is a far cry from the original structure and should not be approved. <coughs> the Commission's decision will have broader implications. Cushman Road is the core of uh, the residential <coughs> district, the residential portion of the Chelsea Historic District. Uh, this section of the Chelsea Historic District is highly important and we cannot allow others to chip away at it. Allowing such an extensive alteration to this historic home can only lead property owners and buyers across Manhattan to believe that they too can drastically alter the very buildings that are meant to be preserved. The Borough President cares deeply about maintaining the historic and contextual integrity of neighborhoods and therefore urges the Commission to reject the applicant's proposed plans. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Robin Lafole Dom. Hi. Um, we live at 416 West 20th Street, so I love this house. Um, and I believe at the last hearing, it was mentioned that probably in 2006, that extension that exists there now probably should have been approved. And now they want to go seven more feet out and dig down also. Um, I, and also, let me just tell you, there's a tree in that backyard that's going to come down during um, construction. And it should come down now, but it's going to fall down. So, you know, when I went through this landmarks last year, I was told that I could not change anything for the top of that, because it could be seen by 19th Street. Well, it's the same with this building. So I do not approve of this. And I think that once, if you approve it, you're going to find out that people on Christian Rail wanting to do other things too. So. No opinion? Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, my name is Noel Penny and I represent 422 West 20th Street, <coughs> which is adjacent to 418 West 20th Street in Manhattan, uh, for which there is an application for a, cert a certificate of appropriateness before you. Uh, we will review the modified plans in detail with our council and our architectural advisors. We have the following concerns. Our pressing concern remains the extravagant extension of the cellar into the rear yard of the building. This aspect of the proposal remains unaddressed by the modified plan to as presented. As you know, this sort of work can require extensive underpinning, which is not always successful. We also know the process of excavation is likely to be extremely jarring, noisy, and disruptive. The extension of the cellar is not integral or necessary to the success of the project. It's not generally, generally appropriate for this remarkable Greek revival house and imposes unnecessary risk to our building. As stewards of, the, of our building, which is part of the historic district, we urge you to err on the side of caution, always the best course of preservation, and require the applicant to eliminate the aspect of work. We ask that you give full weight to these concerns to require that the applicant make the simple visions in this proposal that could address them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kathleen Adams. Good afternoon. 
Can you see Kathleen Adams and I live at 161 9th Avenue uh, on the avenue uh, between uh, 19th and 20th Street. And my building as well, several neighboring buildings, were gathered over the backyards of Christian Row. And it's a beautiful, leafy green view. Uh, I support Community Board for and Save Chelsea's analysis of 416 uh, West 20th plans in opposition to those plans. Um, my neighbors and I on 9th Avenue get enormous pleasure from the view of the neighboring green spaces, the trees, the plants, the birds. So I'd like to advocate specifically for the backyard space, uh, part of the original Christian Road design, having those large backyards. Uh, most fundamentally, these green spaces are included in our historic district, and they are, the yards are an integral part of the architecture and the design of these houses. Even below ground, uh, not visible, we need every inch of the yard space. A basement that extends into the backyard, even though it's not visible, it not only goes against the original design, but will seriously impede the growth of trees and block the ground's absorption of rainwater deep into the ground. This is especially important in the environment of global warming, where in our own city, one and a half pound pincers of rain causes so much runoff that waste treatment has to dump raw sewage in the Lansing River. Um, most importantly, to reiterate, this was not part of the Cushman Road design, having basements, large basements made extending into the grass to the backyard. I ask that you agree with the Community Board Forest recommendation to protect this building and surroundings. <coughs> Thank you. Brian Kraft. Uh, hi, my name is Brian, Brian Kraft, and um, I read a letter on behalf of Jose Guerrero, who's a neighbor at 406 West 20th Street. 406 West 20th Street has been owned by my family since 1959. When my parents purchased 406, it has been used as a learning house for many years, and extensive interior renovations were necessary to accommodate our family and add two apartments. It goes without saying that many changes have taken place in the neighborhood since 1959. Regardless, Christian Road and most of 20th Street has kept its charm and has been well maintained as an historic district. I believe that all of the Christian Road neighbors have kept this in mind through the years. I've seen the plans that David Lesser has proposed and I believe that he has the same interest and respect in regard to keeping within the historic framework. Nonetheless, upgrading and modernizing an old house, especially one with so much deferred maintenance, is like opening a can of worms. We've only been able to upgrade for necessary and safety issues for the year due to cost. It would have been a lot easier to do one large scale renovation project and get the entire building upgraded at one time. That said, I appreciate a new owner who's willing to put in the time, energy, and money to upgrade preserve the historic property. The extension to Rear Garden area, regardless of whether it will be seen at all or not all, will not spoil any historic view. What is most important is to restore and maintain the south front patio and ironwork. My wife and I are in total support for the 418 project as proposed by David Lesser. We think it's critical to keep things in perspective and look at the big picture of the historic and landmark status of the neighborhood. My parents originally lived in a townhouse on 18th Street and had to move due to a demolition for construction of the Niger House in Niger. Now we are faced with the Niger proposal to demolish those buildings, put in much taller buildings with a larger footprint, which will certainly change the atmosphere of the neighborhood and cast a dark shadow on the south side of Cushman Road houses and gardens, as well as contributing to other future development issues. I wish this could be more of a concern for landmarks rather than focusing on the addition to, to the backyard for 418. We were successful years ago to keep the similar height and style of the seminary buildings that were placed on 20th Street between 9th and 10th Avenues. Maintaining the look and feel of the neighborhood is our concern as we have become surrounded by high glass, high towers of glass and steel. I understand that Mr. Lester's plans to decide will remain the same as required by the NYC LPC and that the rear will extend approximately seven feet on lower floors, which will alter the original footprint minimally. This letter entirely supports David Lesser's proposed renovation plan to 418 West 20th Street. The plans are respectful of the other row houses neighbors of use and life and of the historic, stylistic integrity of Cushman Row. I'd also like to read a letter on behalf of Henry Kendall, an architect with BKSK Architects. 
This letter is in support of the work being proposed at 418 West 20th Street. As an architect with extensive historic district so experience. Sorry, we have a three minute time limit. So if you want to just quickly sum up what the letter says, 30 seconds. James Christopher. James Christopher. Good afternoon. I'm reading a letter on behalf of Lori Monson, who is the owner of 408 West 20th Street. I write in support of the application by the owner of 14 West 20th Street to renovate their property, protect its structural integrity while maintaining the protected appearance of our landmark block on 20th Street. My husband and I have owned Roy West 20th Street since 1995 and I understand the historic importance of the Christian Row homes. We are fortunate to be a part of a community on West 20th Street that values the historic importance of our block and I believe the work proposed by Mr. Lesser will restore and improve the historic 20th Street facade of 14 West 20th Street. As I understand it, the owner of 418 West 20th is seeking approval for work which would both shore up the integrity of the property, includes a minor extension into the backyard on the garden, and parlor floors, which would have no impact on the streetscape along West 20th Street. I've looked at the proposed changes to the rear elevation and view the plan as a significant improvement that is more in keeping with the historical nature of the Cushman Row houses than the existing structure. A small added extension will not affect light or openness in neighboring properties. I often walk down 19th Street and feel that one would have to enter into the NYCH parking lot and carefully peer through the fence in order to even notice the change. In addition, the public will significantly benefit from proposed upgrades to the front facade as well as the restoration of the upper floors in the rear, which are currently in poor condition. Allowing these minimal changes will also help motivate owners of our historic properties to employ modern safety and construction practices to maintain and protect them from decay. In the interest of maintaining, upgrading, and preserving the historic allure and charm of Christian Row, I urge the Landmarks Preservation Commission to approve the application 418 West 20th Street. I would also like to read a letter on behalf of William E. Flowers. Oh, thank you. Chris Melba. Chris Melba, the Society of the City. Thank you for bringing this proposal forward to public. It, is, it raises important issues which deserve public discussion. If we were in London, British law would have classified this house according to its place in the British hierarchy. There would have been a prior decision. Was it grade A or was it grade B? Former LPC counsel Dorothy Minor was opposed to importing this British policy, uh, believing, as she said, we have no second class landmarks in New York. We have long been unsure of the wisdom of this. If all landmarks are equal, that can be taken to mean that there is no, there are no outstanding ones. But that is not the reality that is before our eyes. Yes, it can be argued that 14 West 20 is only another row house in the historic district and should be expanded because other row houses can be expanded. So therefore, all row houses can be expanded. In 1966, when a small Chelsea historic district was designated, the originators of the law did not hope for very much. Herman Goldstone wrote at the 1964 hearing before the city council 
when the landmark bill was still under consideration, James Vanderbilt testified that he thought the commission might ultimately designate about a thousand individual landmarks in perhaps three or four historic districts. Imagine that only a modest number of historic buildings could be allowed to survive. In the year, the first commissioners chose with great care the best of the best. Cushman Row is the best of the best. Because of the visibility and the aesthetic and historic landmarks of this house, the proposed further extension into the rear yard is not just a more thoughtful interior design could meet the real needs of the future of <coughs> without destroying the harmony of the role. You have the discretion to make that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Brittany Thomas. Brittany Thomas, Historic Districts Council. HGC echoes Manhattan Community Board 4 and our neighborhood partners in City Chelsea and they're pleased to restrain the encroachment of the rear extension no farther than currently found in Cushman Row. The proposed further extension is inappropriate and breaks with the established design to form of the row. It should be noted that in the earlier 2006 approval to modify the rear yard, the commission rejected the initial proposal to greatly extend the addition and instructed the applicant to keep the addition within certain bounds. Yet here we are again, as if institutional memory doesn't exist in landmarks regulation. Furthermore, as HDC stated in their previous testimony regarding this property, Citing 404 West 20th Street as justification for desired dimensions or design is folly and somewhat insulting, as it is not part of Cushman Road nor an exercise in design, but rather an example of exploitation of square footage. We are not here to relegate to relitigate 404 West 20th Street. What's done is done, but we must prevent any further destruction of Chelsea's historic homes. Thank you. Thank you. Louisa Winchell. Lisa Winchell from Village Preservation. Village Preservation strongly opposes the proposed changes to the rear of this iconic piece of New York Greek Revival architecture. Cushman Row is a remarkably unified row of Greek Revival houses which form the heart and linchpin of the Chelsea Historic District. There is unity not only in their front facades, but to their rear facades as well, which are visible from the public right of way, allowing a unique glimpse into the rear of mid-19th century row house living. Any changes to this row need to be considered very carefully and be as unobtrusive as possible. While the revised application is scaled back from the very aggressive first one, it still significantly and objectionably alters both number 418 and the rear row scheme. The newly proposed rear addition, if allowed, would project into the rear yard 14 feet 7 inches when added to the addition approved in 2006, making it much deeper than the others in Cushman Row. We also object to the proposed plan for changes to the windows at the rear facade. A regularized pattern of windows, which is proposed, breaks from the rare and distinctive rhythm seen in the neighboring houses. Both the proposed rear addition and the proposed rear window pattern would mar number 418 and collective row. Although Cushman Row is outside of our catchment area, we felt that the significance of this building row, as well as the potential precedent that such an alteration could precipitate, warranted our review. We therefore urge the Commission to deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Taylor. I'm reading a letter on the record by Greg Pastorelli, the founding principal of Shop Architects. As you know, I'm the founding principal of Shop Architects in New York City Greek's design firm in front of more than 200 architects with many significant projects around New York City and around the globe. You and the commissioners also know that Shop Architects is forever dedicated to protecting the historic fabric of New York, not only through thoughtful restorations, adaptive reviews, renovations, and additions to landmark structures but also by creating new buildings that will become landmarks five decades from now. It has been our mission since we were founded, and we are extremely proud of our accomplishments with regards to our collaborative work with the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Having lived in Chelsea myself for the past 16 years, in a NYC LPC approved addition to a historic structure, I write in strong support of the application by the owner of 418 West 20th Street. The owner of 418 West 20th Street is seeking approval for work 
which would include a significant and important restoration of the facade on 20th Street, which I believe is a huge win for the overall street, street, streetscape and integrity of Cushman Road. In addition, the renovation will shore up the structure and stability of the property, which is important for its long-term preservation. Based on a review of the materials provided, it's clear that the minor seven foot six inch extension of the home into the backyard will not detract from the view of the rear of this historic row of houses, many of which have had significant modifications over the years. The extension impacts three levels, one basement. It goes without saying that the basement excavation expansion will not be visible because it is below grade. The project has retained qualified architects and engineers to design construction means and methods that will not jeopardize 418 or any other neighboring properties. Number two, the garden level. This extension will not be visible from the public way because a rear property line fence entirely blocks it from view from the public way. Three, the parlor level. The extension on the parlor level is minimally visible from the public way, with the best view being through a parking lot at a distance of approximately 100 feet. This view is only available for a few months of the year on a seasonal basis and will not be perceptible. The seven foot six inch uh, extension can only be viewed head on and cannot be viewed from any angle. The 2006 LPC COA for 418 that is attached to the current LPC presentation confirms that the proposed extension at that time will be only slightly perceptible from the street. Unquote. Similarly, the 2014 LPC COA for 416 West 20th Street refers to the reader as the minimally visible reader facade. The current LPC presentation clearly demonstrates that the reader is not that big. For some reason, it seems that there is now a current effort to argue that the reader of 418 is highly visible. This is simply not true. For example, a recommendation letter from Community Board 4, dated October 4th, 2019, which somehow claims that the proposed addition would be more than slightly perceptible. This claim is contrary to prior LPC findings and is dispelled by the current LPC presentation materials. 418 is positioned at the western end of the row and its neighboring property is significantly deeper and larger structure. This fact absolutely minimizes any impact of the minimal proposed expansion for 418. It is also important to recognize that no historic fabric will be impacted in constructing this extension. I see you want me to end. I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards. Um, <laughs> last, one last point and then I will do something. Uh, and thank my parents. Uh, lastly, the proposed recommendation is a significant improvement over what was previously approved by LPC in 2006, as well as what was actually approved. I therefore strongly encourage the approval for proposed renovation for 18. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Russell. Good afternoon. Michael Russell, on behalf of, sorry, David Schiller. Uh, I write a strong support of the proposed renovation of 418 West 20th Street. My family was a recent seller of 418 West 20th Street. We owned the house for over 30 years, and I was fortunate to have been born and raised in 410 West 20th Street. My family current owns 410 West 20th Street, which is also part of Cushman Row, and I maintain a keen interest in what happens to 418 as it has significant historical and sentimental value, but it is, des but it is in need of desperate and, and complete renovation. I have been following the process that the current owner of 418 has gone through in order to make what I believe to be a tasteful renovation combined with relatively minor changes and mostly non-visible portions of the building. I am alarmed at the time, cost and heartache that has resulted. The approval process has created a lot more fear in others who own homes nearby. I fear that in an effort to carry out and mandate to preserve historical opportunities, LPC risks causing more harm than good. I lived in a home on Cushman Row. I can absolutely attest to the cost and time it takes to maintain in a house of this age. I recognize the importance of maintaining the historical value of homes like these. However, the reality of the increased cost involved in adhering to the burdensome requirements to maintain these structures in a way that pur purports to maintain its historical integrity can backfire. Because of the astronomical cost and the burdens inherent in historical preservations, in my view, the houses on Cushman Road and others like it are in danger of falling into despair. I believe we should not force these homeowners to hew so closely to historic preservation that maintaining the property becomes unsustainable. For example, when 418 was built, it was uh, built without indoor plumbing and electricity. It, would be, it is obviously unworkable to restore it to its true original condition. Likewise, the buildings like 418 have been changed during the years. 
For example, 418 was built as a single family home and later converted to a five family building and as such is not in its original interior condition. I believe a smart approach is to ensure that the publicly, publicly visible portions of the building are properly maintained and that in many cases it's the best accomplished by allowing owners to upgrade these properties. In other words, it is better to improve these structures for modern construction and safety measures rather than to discourage upgrades that could protect the structures in the name of historic preservation. Uh, we should be supportive of homeowner, homeowners who will be willing to invest in these properties to restore upward facing aspects in any way that honors history. Um, owners who have the funds and time to invest in historic homes should be encouraged and not discouraged from buying them. Turnover and improvement is what uh, will preserve the historic buildings. Making it harder to renovate is a significant threat to the preservation. Almost done. The condition of the buildings on Cushman Grove varies considerably. I strongly support uh, the proposed renovation of 418 West 20th Street upon completion. I believe it will, it will be one, a wonderful example of a fully restored landmark grow house, which can be cherished for generations to come. I have no objection to the minimal expansion on the garden and the floors in the rear. rear. I believe there are decades and don't see how small expansion that is only visible to the projects with room of historical integrity. Is it is a fact. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? We do have um, also been received. So, Rich, since there seems to be a couple of hands up, can you pull people up in order? Uh, my name is Christian Martos, and I'm reading this letter on behalf of Wood and Flowers. I'm writing this letter to support David Lester in his application to the changes to changes for changes to 418 West 12th Street. As an owner of 412 West 20th Street, for the last 40 years. I share concerns of those opposed to the requested expansion of 418 at the rear garden and farm levels. However, I think that, the, that many of those so opposed are wrongly focused solely on stopping the new owner of 418. I feel that their, their position is being advocated without regard to long-term protection and preservation of Cushman Road, balancing a mod moderate expansion at the rear with a restoration of the front facade is a valid trade-off that, on balance, is a benefit to the community. Those concerned about the 418 expansion should also be speaking up in, discuss in discussions regarding the NYSHA planning just south of Cushing, Cushman Road. I have heard no serious discussion about the impact of Cushman Road. Two, sub two consequences come to mind. First, a construction period of several years during which the building behind Cushman Row is torn down and replaced with a taller, longer, and wider building will have significant downward impact on the attractiveness of the leased apartments in Cushman Row and thus on the income of the owners. Second, the construction of such a new building will eliminate the protection of Cushman Row from the future backyard ex ex extensions. This will occur because the backs of Cushman Road buildings no longer will be visible from 19th Street and thus the no visible exterior effect rule of the Landmark Preservation Act will not come into play. This should prompt real estate developers to swoop in on Cushman Road. There also appears to be no understanding of the need for a new generation of ownership of the eight of the eight houses, includes, including 404. In general, Cushman Road has been owned for many years by the same people. They have grown older, their children don't want the houses, the cost of maintaining them have skyrocketed, and the income from the property barely pays the cost of ownership. Consequently, there has been, there has been or will be a lot of turnover. 404 sold, now back on the market, 408 on market, 412, about to go on the market. 416 sold, 418 sold. 414 looks vacant and is likely is a likely candidate to be sold. And 410 could go on the market in the near future. To me, this sounds like a crisis. At the least, we should be acting in a way that encourages new owners to buy into Krishna Road. 
not scared no way. And those that have bought should be treated with respect. Mr. Lester, Lester deserves credit for his willingness to respond to previous expressed concerns about the proposal. Now. Pass the three minute time limit. Okay. Right. I did actually have one other signing sheet from Tom Cooper. Yes. Again, I just ask everybody to please respect the three minute time limit. We are very behind schedule, and I know that there are a lot of people here interested in this. Fairness to everybody. Uh, dear Chair Carroll, my name is Tom Cooper. I strongly support the proposed renovation of 418 West 20th Street. By approving the revised plans which have been submitted, the 20th Street facade will be faithfully restored, giving Cushman Grove a welcome lift. In the process, the house will be spared further decrepitude that I think inspire others to achieve a commensurate caliber of other historic home renovations. I have served as a past member on the Board of Trustees of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation and chair of its Brokers Partnership. Separately, while well, I'm an experienced real estate agent of 17 years, currently with Compass, I have had no interest, vested or otherwise, in the purchase of this house or with its owner in my professional capacity. I write to you, however, as an individual and a neighbor who has lived in Chelsea for 20 years. I'm a longtime supporter of historic preservation. I've always been drawn to urban history, especially when related through architecture. In New York, we've learned hard lessons when architectural gems have been surprised or erased. Pennsylvania Station is perhaps the most notorious example of this, though I would argue that the casual, incremental, architectural gutting of lesser sung examples in our many neighborhoods has had a deeper impact. But I'm also weary of some preservationists who flexibly say no to changes of historic buildings while offering a few practical, workable solutions in the form of economically realistic ways forward, and failing or refusing to see the larger picture. Frankly, the approach of some activists reminds me of Republicans in Congress during Obama's tenure. They simply became the party of no. In an ideal world, I would love to see 418 turned into a museum a treasure with interiors restored, an immersive ex experience open to all. But that's not even remotely realistic. I've been and toured in 418, and I'm confident the proposed plan is the most feasible approach to preserving its beautiful and important historic structure, crucial as it is to the greater set piece of push and run. While changes to the back of the building will be different from the straightforward restoration of the front, I believe there is minimal visual impact from these changes. And as a longtime neighborhood resident, while I can attest uh, to always bringing people around, both as a historic preservation volunteer or in my professional capacity, uh, taking them around the neighborhood, I always had my antenna out to what they have to say. Few people have not spoken admiringly about the West 20th Seminary, seminary Street Rock. Sorry, the clock has ah. gone off. Well, my point is everyone loves 20th Street. No one comments about 19th Street. Please pass this proposal. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have someone who's handwriting. I can't read, but reading a letter from Pamela Wolf. Followed by Lawrence Romer. I did it in a rush, sorry about that. I am Twee Pham, speaking for Pamela Wolf. I am unable to appear before you in person. Among many others, I was present and ready to testify at the scheduled hearing on Tuesday, October 8th, that was for that prior notice laid over. I have lived in Chelsea since 1956 and have seen much change in our community. As former chair of CB Boys Landmarks Committee following Ed Kirkman's retirement, I reviewed a number of similar requests for its extensions into the rear yards of Chelsea townhouses. Our committee made efforts to limit the invasions into the open spaces of the block interiors to the depth of existing tea porches, no more than seven and a half to ten feet. LPC often granted much deeper incursions, encouraging investors to buy up houses with the purpose of gaining approval for such expansions based on established precedent. 
It is important for the Commission now to consider this history and the damage it has wrought in loss of open space and quality of life for the surrounding houses, as well as loss of the fabric of those houses that now stand as near facades with no other historic elements remaining. 418's rear elevation and backyard are no less Chelsea's architectural heritage than its street facade. They will be even more publicly visible when the two diseased Atlantis trees in the backyard are removed. The proposed cellar expansion would displace half the rear yard surface potential for soil, planting, and water permeability, thus adding an environmental cost. The loss that our neighborhood suffered when the commission approved the demolition of all but the Greek, the Brook Street facade of the oldest house in Chelsea, 404 West 20th Street, is still painfully fresh. Walking tour guides still point out how it's now unprotected original wood side wall. This misguided decision should be the wake up call for the commission. It has been for the community. The precedent of that tragic decision today jeopardizes Cushman Row, immediately west of 404. Now the commission is faced with another proposal which could predictably bring the same outcome. The demolition of the entire house at 418, but for the street facade, forever losing the real fabric of this deeply historic site. Already the proposers have referred to the Commission's decision on 404, claiming its approved extension to the east of Cushman Row and the existing deeper building to its west as a property context. 408 in Cushman Row is now for sale. Its buyer may claim a precedent in what you will allow 4418. The new owner of 404, a known developer of small properties in historic parts of London, got what he wanted from the Commission, the ability to flip 404 at a healthy profit. Only its dupe light has been maintained in the years since that, dec that decision. There is a lesson here. We in Chelsea have learned from experience. I ask the commission to stick to its main decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lawrence Brother, followed by Wendy Solon. I, I just want to make sure several of us did fill these out. May have, they went missing, so are we all, we had to hastily review them. So uh, I just hope everything's Wendy Solon. Yes, the two, three. Tina D. Felicia Antonio. David Halabaka. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Lawrence Fomer, president of Save Chelsea, speaking on behalf of our board. Save Chelsea opposes this application's proposal to further expand 418 West 20th Street's rear addition, alter its second and third floor window openings, and lower its cellar and extend it under the rear yard. In May, the commission denied the proposal to enlarge for a second time the house's enclosed rear tea porch, noting that it would extend farther into the near rear yard than Cushman Row's existing rear additions. This reaffirmed the Commission's 2006 permit for the first enlargement, which limited to a 12-foot projection from the Row's main rear wall, matching the deepest existing Cushman Row addition. The current proposal would enlarge the addition a further 7 feet 7 inches, every bit as far as earlier proposed and denied. It dismisses the Commission's repeated findings and their clear aim to protect the character-defining unity of both Cushman Grove's architecture and its historic rear yard context. In denying other rear modifications submitted earlier this year, the Commission found that they would have altered the existing largely intact pattern of the punched masonry openings on the second and third floors, thereby diminishing the unity of the row. This, too, echoed the Commission's 2006 permit. In approving earlier rear wall alterations, it found that they would respect the house's historic second and third floor window configurations. These windows are particularly sensitive. Their atypical pattern expresses the location of interior stairs historically and gives the back of the row a distinctive, unifying rhythm. The current proposal would substitute a more conventional, non-original pattern of window openings at the second and third floor levels, again dismissing <coughs> the Commission's repeated and sensible findings. The current proposal for number 418 would excavate and lower the cellar floor two feet and extend it nearly 30 feet beyond the main rear wall of the house, well under the rear yard. We are very concerned that this might undermine the house's historic rear wall and its party wall with number 416. The commission would appear to have purview over this work in that it affects rear yard services. The new cellar space excavated from the rear yard would displace plant supporting permeable soil. Its top would be the hard surface floor of a basement areaway. 
the enlarged cellar is not vital to the house's function as a home. It might enhance resale value, but its windowless space would not be deemed habitable by the building code. Approving it would complicate preservation of the rear wall and invite scenarios in which instead it, in which it is instead replaced and facadism prevails after all. We ask the commission to ensure its preservation. We so fully support Community Board 4's community board letter on this proposal and ask the commission to strike no compromise that compromises preservation. Wendy Solomon, followed by Tina D. Hi, my name is Wendy Sullivan. I live on 19th Street, and I appreciate seeing the back row of Bushman Row every day as I walk on my way to work. One definition of contempt is willful disobedience to or open disrespect of a court, judge, or legislative body. This proposal respects some of the Landmarks Commission's earlier comments, but shows contempt for some of the others. LPC objected to the fact that the historic rear window pattern on the second and third floors, which relates 418 to the whole rest of Cushman Road, would be lost. Why should this distinctive Cushman Road pattern be replaced with one that can be seen anywhere? But the new proposal ignores the Commission's concern. LPC also objected that the addition would extend farther into the backyard and be taller than the existing additions of the next two houses, overwhelming them and likewise detracting from the coherence of the row. The new proposal ignores this concern as well. The applicant may claim that reducing the height of the additional loan would satisfy LPC's concerns. But this doesn't reflect the Commission's obvious intention to preserve the unity and the integrity of Cushman Row. We ask LPC to uphold the spirit and common sense of its own findings and not surrender to legalistic parsing of whether it meant the addition would be too tall and too deep or only too tall to be so deep. LPC already approved a margin of 418 in 2006. Its permit kept that addition in scale with the rest of Cushman Row, not allowing it to extend deeper into the backyard than any existing addition in the row. <coughs> Just because 13 years has passed, the reasoning has not somehow expired. The applicant cites the excessive enlargement allowed for the oldest house in Chelsea at the other end of Cushman Row as a precedent. Allowing a new rear mark benchmark with Cushman Row will only invite other owners in the row or the buyer of number 408, which is now for sale, to likewise claim 418 as a new precedent. When will the ratcheting up ever end? I'd say it's time to draw the line, but LPC has already drawn the line in 2006. Now it's time to hold the line. Cushman Row's houses traditionally um, had tea rows, uh, had tea porches. And this precedent might justify <coughs> modest rear additions to their scale. For instance, 418 had such a tea porch, which was enlarged under LPC's 2006 permit. But enlarging it again would grow the original tea porch's depth to nearly 20 feet, 20 feet out from the rear of the house, making it more of a ballroom than a porch. We seem to be back here today because 418's owner refuses to take no for an answer and wants to wear the commission down. You did the right thing last time. I ask you to please stand firmly today and thank you. Thank you, David Holoka. Hi, I'm not David. Uh, my name's Tina DeVolution. I'm checking David Holt next. Uh, good afternoon. I'm a member of Seek Floor's Chelsea Land Use Committee and we'll be reading excerpts from the full board's advisory letter. In denying the earlier proposed rear alterations, LPC found, quote, that the proposed rear addition will alter the existing, largely intact pattern of the punch masonry openings at the second and third floors of the rear facade at this row, thereby, in the, thereby sorry, diminishing the unity of the row, and the addition will extend further into the central green space and be taller than the existing enclosed tea porches at the adjoining two houses, thereby, and this is from the commission, overwhelming 
the neighboring houses and extend closed tea porches and distract trap from the road. End quote. 418's current proposal ignores the commission's previous findings, leaving the addition's footprint unchanged and still altering the pattern of the punched masonry openings at the second and third floors. LPC's 2006 permit for the earlier extension of the historic tea porch found that it would be only slightly perceptible from the street. However, the original tea room and previously approved extension would add up to a 14.7 uh, seven inch combined total. The proposed extension, if permitted, would certainly be more than perceptible at approximately 20 feet. While the current proposal eliminates an upward expansion of the rear addition, CB4 reiterates the position of our May 2019 letter specifically recommending the denial of both the upward and rear wood rear or extensions. In reducing the height alone, the current proposal seeks an inappropriate compromise. This was both a clear consensus of robust community input and the commission's own findings. 418's next door neighbor on Cushman Road at 416 told CB4 that in renovating her home, she elected to keep her tea porch in alignment with her neighbor at 414. The existing addition to 418 already extends well beyond 414 and 416. It should be noted that in the gold standard book, bricks and brownstone, the New York Row House, um, the eminent and architectural historian Charles Lockwood wrote that the typical row house of the 1840s and 1850s included, quote, an eight to 10 foot deep tea room across the back of the house. The current submission was decidedly Excuse suggests- me, time limit is passed. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David Walker. I'm David Paloka, a member of CB4's Chelsea Land Use Committee, continuing from the board's advisory letter. Contradicting LPC's findings, the current proposal would alter and regularize number 418's rear window openings into the horizontally aligned rows nearly universal among row house backs. This would violate the distinctive window rhythm that repeats across Cushman Row, in which lowered right-hand windows on the second and third floors of each house express its interior stare a relationship which a future owner may want to restore, by the way. While some of these dropped windows at the four houses with rear additions have had their sills raised, the heads of the entire rows dropped, second and third floor windows remain, save one at the third floor of number 416. This lends the row unity while defining individual houses on their domestic scale. Together with the tea porches and rear gardens, these windows create a private informality complementing the dignified public street face of the row. As Village Preservation's earlier testimony observed, there is unity not only in the road's front facades, but in the rear facades as well, which are visible from the public right of way, allowing a unique glimpse into the rear of mid-19th century row house living. CB4 agrees with LPC's findings on the earlier proposal and recommends preservation of the existing pattern of masonry openings at the second and third floors. We note that LPC approvals for altered rear window openings of row houses have led to wholesale rear wall replacement, especially when the interior is to be fully gutted, as the proposal drawings seem to indicate for number 418. After LPC approved rear additions and window alterations for 438 and 440 West 20th Street on the same block, only the street facades and party walls of these row houses were preserved. Presumably, it was cheaper to rebuild and protect their rear walls. Previous changes to number 418's rear facade should not be used to justify more distortion changes for demolition. Any substantiated structural deficiencies should be repaired in place. The proposed lowering and rearward extension of the house's cellar raises further concerns about the fate of the rear wall. We ask the commission to verify that a feasible plan is in place to preserve the historic rear facade and not to approve any cellar alterations that might threaten it. Cellar expansions are notorious for destabilizing 
the historic buildings above them, as well as neighboring buildings. Given the risks and drawbacks, we recommend that the Commission not approve any cellar modifications other than structural reinforcement. In altering the rear yard surfacing and north-south sectional profile, the cellar modifications would have publicly visible impacts and thus fall under the Commission's purview. CB4 recommends denial of the current application and submission of a new proposal fully responsive to LPC's earlier findings. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? Okay. I just also want to note that we have um, two letters from individuals in support of the application. Would you like to respond to the comments? I'm a big fan of former Senator Danny Patrick Moynihan's statement that we're all entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. And I do think that this particular application has generated a whole lot more heat than right on a lot of issues. Um, so, although some of what was said I found to be, again, offensive because this has been a pattern that has followed this project from its inception, of reflecting a kind of obsession in the neighborhood with what Mr. Lesser is trying to do. I just want to speak now to a couple of the major issues of architecture that have been discussed, sometimes erroneously, by the opponents of the proposed application. Before doing so, though, I do want to briefly summarize the letter that we received from Harry Kendall, who did peer review, as did um, uh, Mr. Pascarelli at our request of the proposed application. He has submitted a letter which I will give to you in support of the application. Um, I think you know, both he and Mr. Pasquarelli are well known to this body. He, he says, in contrast to Cushman Rose's formality on the street, the rear facades have always been less composed and informal, more informal. The glimpse one gets to their rear yards from West 19th Street tells the story. In my opinion, these views are subject to a very different interpretation of authenticity than on the street. Though limited in visibility, one can sense this character of informality within the rear yards. Court traditions and window changes are evidence of organic change over time, and the proposed T porch extension here is well within the bounds of appropriateness. Though the first floor plus basement addition at 418 West 20th is to extend further than the neighboring townhouse additions into the rear yard, it does so with a taller scale tenement backdrop. On this, the last building in the row, a slightly projecting bookend can be accommodated. I also appreciate, he says, the proposed chimney flue removal, which will restore continuity of plane across the full row for the upper three floors of the rear facade. And similarly, the decision to remove an existing partial fifth floor very much underscores the applicant's thoughtful approach to these rear yard additions, alterations. I also have three other letters in support, which I'll simply submit from Gil Branson on West 28th Street, uh, from Lori North Napolitano on West 22nd Street, from Stephen Geller, who spoke, read somebody else's letter, but didn't get a chance to read his own. And I think um, Mr. Flowers' letter was read, but it was not submitted into the record, so we will give those to the commission. The, the issue that I want to first address has to do with the um, question of the windows which has, as I say, generated more heat than light. It is false to claim that there is unity in the condition that exists now. There is actually quite a bit of difference among the various components of this. So you will see that this condition, which is proposed, this window was approved, this window was approved in the 2006 application. This condition here, which is at the same level, doesn't look at all like what you're seeing here. This is for two of the of this two of the seven houses in the row. Now these four have maintained the original condition with this with the uh, with the roof. But this condition existed before existed before designation, with the roof having been lifted in the back. This window is proposed to be changed so that it matches this one, which is exactly the same condition as pertains next door at 416. 
This reflects, as was said many times, a condition with interior stairs that no longer exists. I, I have read, I'm not an architect myself, but I have read other people's statements, who were architects, saying that windows reflect the interior architecture of the building. These do not reflect any interior architectural condition. And if you were standing in the inside of the building, your head would be pretty much up here. You wouldn't be able to look out the window. It has no utility whatsoever. So some of these have been maintained, but some have been changed. You'll see here, this condition is pretty much like what we're trying to create here, very similar to this, whereas these are lower, right? These may have reflected the original condition, but they certainly don't look like that. So there is not a unity in this row at any point above the level of the parlor floor, nor is there, for that matter, any unity at the level of the parlor floor. Um, we've noticed, actually, in the historic maps that one of the interesting things is 404 had a back house um, originally. Maybe that was part of the justification that was used for the larger extension that went into the rear yard, but that was the historic condition of 404. There were matching tea porches all the way across. They've been removed from these three houses completely. You see there's been a window alteration here. There are a lot of air conditioners that have been inserted here. So over time, there has been an evolution. The most important thing is that you cannot see this entire uh, row of houses from any point along the street. It's not possible. It's just physically not possible because of the existing foliage, because of the angles of the views, um, and, and nor would they have been visible to the passing public at any time when these buildings were first constructed because on 19th Street, there would have been a row of buildings blocking them. It just happens as a matter of historical fact that those buildings were torn down and NYCHA built a new building and also has a parking lot, which is probably going to be redeveloped with affordable housing sometime within the next five years, although I understand that that's not something that the commission can pay attention to. Um, and the same is likely to be true for the playground. So there is no, no visibility, no point of visibility where you can get a sense of the entire row in its um, existing condition. The only place that you can see it in any sort of um, complete view is standing directly behind it. And you have the word of at least one architect, Mr. Pasquarelli, saying a seven foot extension is not going to be perceptible standing on the street. Um, I want to also speak just a moment to the um, to the community board resolution. I think there was virtually no opposition to the resolution when it was first presented in May. Um, that's not true this time. There were nine people who voted in favor of Mr. Lesser's proposal. So there is a perception out there that there are some in the community who may be going too far in their opposition. It's not fair or accurate to say that anything that has been done in this proposal is, uh, is an, an insult to or in contempt of the commission. Mr. Lesser withdrew his proposal to the march, two of the four floors of the house. He's proposed a completely different fenestration pattern, which has punch windows, not the sliding glass windows that were a very modern iteration in the original proposal. So he has maintained that three-day rhythm all that is you know, consistent along the entire row. Um, he has introduced wood materials into his tea porch so that it replicates conditions of the original tea porch condition. Um, he has introduced divided lights everywhere. So um, he has done good things by eliminating the addition on the roof, for which he's been getting no credit from the people in the community. Um, and create a very light, barely perceptible um, uh, uh, railing at the uh, at the uh, that sets inside the coping stone. So there's a lot that's been done here that is very positive and very favorable and extremely responsive to what the commission is concerned about. He wants to have a larger parking floor. He entertains the business. That's part of the reality of modern life and. The notion that the commission should be regulating the interior of these houses and telling people how to live is, uh, I think, uh, 
I can hardly get to say, is certainly not within their purview. And in view of such things as, for example, the recent decision in April in Crown Heights, I mean, the, the commission exploring issues or dragging issues into its determinations that are not within its purview is not sustainable as a legal matter. I have the same feelings about the cellar. The cellar is completely underground. This nonsense about the permeability of the soil, that's regulated by other matters. There are plenty of ways to achieve permeability and to maintain uh, control of water runoff. The tree in the backyard is within a few feet of the rear property line. It's not going to be cut down. There's a 19-foot area which will be preserved between the property line and the rear of the cellar, which is enough to preserve all of the roots of the tree and prevent it from being um, affected. So, you know, a lot of the statements that have been made or reasons that rationales that have been advanced for not doing certain things, that they threat the uh, assumption that Mr. Lesser would take an action with respect to the seller that would introduce structural instability is not supportable and it's really an insult to the applicant. He has a structural engineer, we have him here if there were any questions about that, but I don't think that those assertions are actually made in good faith. I think they're just insulting <coughs> more. And so I've said a lot, I've said too much probably, but we urge you to look at this project with an open mind and to grant Mr. Lesser some relief at last. Thank you. Any final questions? Let's have a motion to close the hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Closed. So, you know, I, I don't want to say a lot because we sat through a lot of we all are pretty familiar with the project, but just to quickly um, summarize, in 2006, the commission approved replacing a historic tea porch with a new rear extension that extended six feet beyond that for a total of 12 feet. And the commission made that uh, finding, that it, or determined that it was appropriate because it aligned. And Michelle, can we go back to the, just the rear uh, elevations? Okay. It aligned with the um, some of the basement level extensions, which went beyond the carpet floor and the flanking uh, area addition. And so, therefore, the commission found that in addition, the commission did approve some of the changes and approved up addition. And in May, we saw a proposal for a new um, expansion, which was much larger, three stories in basement, I believe, and up addition. And the commission denied that application, uh, finding that <coughs> size of the rear addition, but also the cumulative effect of the rear and the design of the rear addition overwhelm the building and diminish its relationship to Cushman Row. So today we're looking at a proposal that returns to the original height, the two-story height of the historic and approved rear addition, but extends, is still asking to extend seven feet, seven beyond that, um, and is taking a more restorative approach to the upper floors, although I'm proposing to modify some windows as have been approved in some of the other, at least the adjacent building. And, um, and then proposing a new design for the tea porch and the ex that excavation below grade. So I think that this is an entirely different proposal. I don't think there's anything disrespectful about this proposal. In fact, I do think it has been very responsive to our comments at the last public hearing. And so I think the question really, though, is, is how much depth can one approve at the rear um, understanding that there is limited visibility of the entire row as in the entirety, and then also limited visibility of the height of the two-story of the basement level is not visible. Um, and then there are the visibility of the relationship with the So I think, um, you know, I thank the applicants for being responsive, and I think we've heard a lot of testimony today on both sides, and uh, we'll have a very thoughtful discussion about what the appropriate size of addition is. So, uh, like to start. Michael? It was cited that... Um, yeah, oh yeah. Of course, the has been eliminated. Someone who is not having testimony today said that seven feet is not, not a 
perceptible or important uh, change in the depth of the addition. And I find that to be uh, that is so subjective that we could ask everyone in this room if it's perceptible or not, and everyone had a different opinion. My particular opinion about this application is Acceptable. Um, one of the people making testimony said that the reasoning has not expired, and I agree completely with that. I see no reason, if, if this were coming before us as the original proposal today, and they were asking to take this thing as far back as they are now, the fact that it's taking place in, in two stages is meaningless to me. I think that it's inappropriate. It should stay where it is. And the design is your final design, Michael. Um, wow. Um, very interesting. Everything about this presentation was, was illuminating. Um, I think that uh, the, the issue of visibility has been, uh, I think, unduly influential on, on whether or not a particular feature should be considered acceptable. We often always consider uh, fenestration patterns, uh, especially at the upper levels, when there is zero visibility from a public way. So while I think that um, we always give greater deference to variation in the mirror of the building in front, uh, we, you know, there are limits to that. And, and I think that in my looking at this project, I try to view it from that perspective where, and, 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 and view the, the visibility, the, the narrow windows of visibility, uh, as kind of enhancers of that significance as opposed to determinants of whether or not the project should go one way or the other. With that in mind, I think that the um, uh, comments about this rose having a special or perhaps a uh, greater significance, it's kind of not necessarily uh, germane. I, I, I think that it, it, may, it may have greater, you know, greater minds than I will determine that, but I think that our job is to try to understand the project within the context of other projects that have been presented to us and within the standards that we generally apply. Um, those standards would tell me as follows. One, you have a relatively uniform row. Uh, granted, this project is occurring at the extent of the row against the tenement, which we have in the past used to allow for greater flexibility. However, uh, the row is, is rather intact, uh, and we, we generally view the upper levels with greater significance than the lower level. The fact that this row has a remarkably uh, unusual uh, pattern of this kind of ABB kind of penetration uh, suggests to me that we should do our best to try to retain that if possible. It seems to me that on the third and second floors, we don't see the, the interior floor plan layouts on the, on the submission, which I thought was curious, but okay. Um, um, you could flip the arrangement of the doors, the French doors, to the right side and keep the heads more or less where they are, which would fall into the pattern of the original, which would continue that rhythm across, um, and which would seem to comport with the program of the interior to the extent that we know it for a access to the exterior happening at one end of the, the plane. Um, it would also restore the ability of the two windows to the left to read as a uniform pair as they do for, it seems, most of the windows. I think that the top floor uh, windows should be studied with that <coughs> as well. I think that if you are reconstructing it, I think you should try to figure out some way to uh, work it in without making it functional. <coughs> I think there are ways to do that. I think I'm sure a very talented uh, client can do the same. I think that the uh, T-porch, because this had a row of of, of extant tea porches or of original tea porches should be respected on the parlor level. 
I think the ground, the, the seller level could extend further. I don't have any concerns about the seller or the uh, sub-seller extension. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I think this is yeah, it's particularly interesting to me uh, because uh, it's not so much an issue of visibility in the way that we typically uh, conceive visibility. Here it's a visibility it's a kind of a glimpse of something that we don't typically get, which is something we're not sort of supposed to see. It's the, it's the back of a, of a house that would have otherwise belonged to some kind of a donut or a back yard. And so it's, it's almost as though um, we're trying to protect that kind of the, the slightly flawed or ad hoc nature rather than, than composed nature of that, of that, let's say, continuous facade. And so my question, I'm going back and forth about it, the, the extent to which this proposal and others, but this one, since we're looking at it, disrupts or undermines that that opportunity that we have here, which is to, to have it, uh, the site of, or, or to, to be able to proceed to see, to have visible something that would otherwise not be visible. It's a strange situation. And so, I mean, so that did, unfortunately that doesn't give me answers except for the following, which is that I think that the decision that was made earlier, and in this case I, I support my, what Devonshire said in, in some testimony, to um, limit the, the extension to wherever it was, in other words, to not make it be another seven feet, is, is the right approach. Because somehow as we grow the thing, whether it's on top or behind, it's sort of it's sort of filling out too much of what would otherwise have been a, a somewhat restrained backyard approach. So I would say let it be back uh, and, and not permit the extra seven feet. I think that the windows, I mean, I, I'm not crazy about the idea of making them as uniform as this proposal makes them. Because it's almost as though it starts to be kind of like a front yard. It, I mean, it messes with that ad hocness, but I don't think it's dramatic. Uh, so I think that that would be my position. And I, I, I suppose I am. Uh, I don't have too much of an issue with the underground uh,
but I am perfectly fine with the penetration. Thank you.
I'm just looking forward so far, but I think it's the trophy thing. Alright, so I think um, <coughs> we're going to have to Okay, so I think um, based on the discussion today, I think that the majority of the comments um, reflect a desire to maintain the plane of the previously approved prioritization, which aligns with the
building was never built of people. All of these other buildings were always built to be occupied by people who to work. So our task was to take a building that had zoning issues, building with wood construction, ancient, ancient wood, all the water, uh, all of the difficult issues that have to do with a facade that's three and a half acres that didn't ask me for how many millions of bricks that is, but it's millions of bricks that have been there. The building that has been in decline for 90 years. And how are we going to take this building and put it into the 21st century from modern use, from modern office workers, and for the community? And in an area, we go to the next slide, that is, uh, this, is, this is really a seven, nine story building as it sits there today. It is really surrounded with an enormous amount of construction, uh, billions of dollars of, of buildings being built around it in this neighborhood. It's all really exciting stuff, but we need to, we need to make sure that this building is appreciated, we need to, we need to celebrate this building. It's potentially it, it very, very overshadowed by what's being around it, both around the north and south, the Love Scout Rehab Building um, and all the other new construction that's around it. So our design had to deal with that. We had to make the building that is here for the 21st century and says we are here for the 21st century. So with that in mind, I'd really like to turn it over to my team, Cass, and to talk about the big story. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm Cass McElroy, the Space Spacewalk and Partners. I'm going to change to see that. Um, this is a, a, a photograph of uh, the Terminal Warehouse, a current photograph of Terminal Warehouse. Uh, this is the 11th Avenue uh, project. The building is just massive. Uh, perhaps you know it. It occupies the entire block. 200 foot frontages on 11th and 12th Avenues. 666 on the south side, 790 feet on the north side. It is monumental. Um, as, as the designation report notes, uh, it was the first large scale purpose building warehouse uh, in the historic district. Um, Completed in 1899, seven-story building, and as you'll see, as we describe the buildings and the changes over time, there are two portions that were enlarged uh, to nine stories, primarily seven stories, but uh, largely nine stories. Uh, primarily seven with nine-story addition. Um, today, the building reads as this sort of static, dormant um, block. Uh, but as we found through our research, what's been really so fascinating is that. When it was built, it was this dynamic piece of railroad infrastructure. It was a very active place. Um, it was uh, a building that um, had a railroad that had railroad tracks leading directly into it. Uh, it connected this building and New York City to the entire uh, west coast uh, or to the west coast of this country. Um, so this fact that well, it reads as this sort of static uh, structure today, that this dy dynamic quality is something that is very interesting for us and something that we want to restore back uh, to, to this important building. Um, I'll also point out that um, on the west side of 11th Avenue in the West Chelsea Historic District, it is one of three very important uh, warehouse buildings. This ensemble of warehouse buildings, the Baltimore, Ohio uh, warehouse building completed in 1913, the Stair at Lehigh completed in 1931, and then Obviously, terminal source from 1891. This represents um, timber frame and, and masonry construction, reinforced concrete construction, and then uh, Sterling High, which is this fascinating hybrid of uh, steel frame and reinforced concrete. So these three buildings together sort of illustrate this whole evolution of structural technologies uh, that is described in the designation report, the history of warehousing, all of it is sort of wrapped up in this ensemble of three very important warehouse buildings. Um, the building, uh, and this is, again is sort of factored into the way we've approached this project, the building operates sort of in two contexts. There is this context um, at pedestrian scale, let's say, within the historic districts of views like this, where you see it in relation to the other two warehouse buildings and the buildings directly across the street. It operates in that smaller historic context. And then, as you saw in the previous image, when you're standing on the west end of this building, it operates in this urban context. And you see the Hudson Yards beyond it, directly to the north. It doesn't, uh, the the line really runs down 28th Street. So just north of this uh, and beyond is Hudson Yards. So the building has these sort of two sides to it. And the planning and design work that Rick will take you through takes that into account. And we have sort of one, one approach and one attitude on this side of the building, and a different attitude on the sort of urban side, urban scale side of the building uh, on the west side. Um, a map of the historic district was designated in 2008, uh, a relatively small district of about 30 buildings. 
Um, and significantly, Terminal Warehouse occupies almost one quarter of the lot area of the entire district. And these three warehouse buildings, Sterrett, the VNO Warehouse, and Terminal together, uh, occupy more than half of the district. Um, there's also sort of a fascinating um, scale shift where on the west side of 11th Avenue, you have this very large scale, uh, large scale structures, full lot structures. As you get to the east side of 11th Avenue, that scale changes and you have smaller scale buildings. And that's been something that's been fascinating to us, and there's some interesting reasons uh, for that that I'll touch on in just a moment. The district is also um, significant because it's the only portion of the highway that's a city landmark. So the, the High Line passes through the southeast corner uh, of the district. And of course, the High Line is this amazing marriage of uh, industrial heritage and, and urban park that, uh, that is so special and has been uh, a catalyst for so much of uh, what's happening in this in this immediate neighborhood. Um, pulling back and looking at this urban scale, so again, this is this is the <coughs> warehouse right here. Uh, Pier 66 with John J. Harvey in the frying pan, and you see a sort of large scale Stair Lehigh terminal warehouse, both on Ohio. There's large scale historic structures here, and the smaller grain those on the other side of 11th Avenue. And of course, the very massive scale beyond at Hudson Yards. But what we've been fascinated by is sort of the evolution of this edge of the city, and sort of how that, how that has come to, to pass. Um, and stepping back to the 1609 Manhattan Project, so Dr. Eric Sanderson's a model of what Manhattan Island looked like in 1609 and we came into the harbor. Um, obviously the building uh, here is situated in the middle of the Hudson. Sorry, not the middle, but certainly in the Hudson. And as you know, there's so much of the edge of the island has grown up over time. And while this is interesting and cool, it also actually informs why the building is of its scale and, the and its neighbors are, are of its scale as well. The Vealing Act from 1865 uh, begins to show all of the made land, all the landfill along the west uh, edge of Manhattan Island. Uh, the terminal is still in 1869. The site is still actually out, uh, out in the river. Uh, but this is an important moment for the city where um, the, the commerce and industry is shifting from the, from the east side, from the south street, the shallow waters of the east river to the deep waters of the Hudson. And it is sort of at this moment, this sort of beginning of the second half of the 19th century, when the Hudson River takes on uh, its, its commercial and industrial. <coughs> uh, this map from 1879 um, is, is significant again for also a number of reasons. This is this is our site, obviously dotted in here. Um, uh, most of it was um, on land, but half of it about half of it was out in the river. Um, but a couple of things to point out. So this whole edge of the city is filled with um, heavy industry, plane mills and piano piece factories, ironworks, foil ironworks is located here. So there's a very different identity, this sort of industrial edge kept up. But significantly, by 1879, the railroads were taking a uh, major presence uh, in the city. And this whole network of rail lines, all um, owned by the New York Central Railroad. Um, and they were really the only rail line um, that, um, that had access north of Manhattan and actually over the river uh, to the west. But significantly, the, this rail line came down 11th Avenue, and even in 1879, came onto the land that the building from the warehouse is currently occupied. You can see it coming down the middle of the avenue and onto this, uh, onto this open lot. Obviously, the, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, this idea of sort of getting west and trying to get to the western edges of this growing country is a, a major theme, obviously, in American history, but it's actually a, a pretty good significant theme, obviously, for the development of the west side of Manhattan because there were no tunnels. The only way the rail freight could get across was getting to the edge of the island and transferring across the river to New Jersey and beyond. So the pressures of getting to the west coast, to the west side of Manhattan, and then ultimately to the west end of the country were, were brought about in large part uh, by the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, the 1890 map, um, the Sandborn map, is the first map that shows the terminal warehouse um, as, as constructed. So a few things to note. First of all, this whole rail network, the New York Central network, is expanding. Um, and then this zone here, west of 11th Avenue, again, these large scale elevator yards and pole yards. And then, of course, the massive terminal warehouse, the largest building around for many, many years. And what's fascinating is thinking about the, the previous map of the rail line on this site. This building was constructed over the rail line. It was a piece of in rail infrastructure that got dropped over, uh, over the railroad. Uh, a significant um, concept because it isn't merely just a warehouse, it's not a static structure, but it was a place of movement and transfer and, and, and a lot of activity. Um, I'll also just point out um, 
on this slide, you can see the way this building was developed. So from the previous photo, it reads as a single building. But the building was actually constructed with 25 individual stores, these 25 individual uh, fireproof compartments. And each one of these little squares is actually an elevator. So each one of these divisions, they're all numbered, and we'll refer to them somewhat by, by number. We'll try not to do too much of that so you don't get lost. But each one of them actually had its own sort of system of circulation. It had a fireproof uh, brick construction. And the rail line would come into the building and transfer um, property and goods and then uh, go up and down, uh, go up and down the building. Um, this is the first photograph from the King's Handbook in 1893, just to read these two quotes. These are the only stores in New York in which railway cars, steamships, and trucks are in close communication. And the tracks of the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad run into the building, and there's deep water that appears at the end. This idea that this was sort of an intermodal structure. Well, Forty years before Sparrow Lehigh, that, this is happening here. You have the rail lines, you can see them set into the coliseums here, into the building, and then the transfer on the sides of uh, the wagons. So there was a constant motion going on in the building. Uh, it's also <coughs> obviously important to note these shutters. These shutters have been gone from the building for decades. Um, they too sort of added a, a life and vitality uh, to the building. When we look at these historic photos, you see the shutters, you see the masonry openings of this amazing American Highlands style building. You don't really see the windows which is interesting in part because some of the shutters are shut, but they're also, the window openings are set very deep in, in the building, so the, the, the prominent uh, facade really elements are the arches and in large part, uh, in large part the, the shutters. Um, and the other important thing to note is just that the, 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 the William Oscar who developed and, and was part of the ownership structure of Terminal Warehouse Company uh, was the brother of the ranking officer of the designation report says that ranking officer in the Bureau Central, so there's a connection between the railroad and the warehouse. Uh, this is a flyer from the 1895 King's Handbook that says goods from any part of the country can easily be unloaded within the walls of the warehouse, of these warehouses. This was a bonded warehouse, which meant you could import goods from, let's say, Europe and not pay any tariffs, and the total property was sold. In fact, we found this uh, Stanford White stored the properties that he bought <coughs> furniture, paintings, um, tapestries, things that he bought in Europe for his clients, he stored them in the terminal warehouse and he had to pay taxes on them until he sold them on to his clientele. Um, the building also had, similar to this uh, to this operation here, there was refrigerating rooms, there was cold storage, there was even freezing storage for storage of things like furs, carpets, and walls. So this was, this building operated like a machine. Uh, a 1903 photograph, um, this is 11th Avenue and 27th Street. You can see the sort of activity that existed at the base. These large open portals that allowed uh, for the movement of goods directly into the building. Uh, the introduction of canopies over time along the ground floor, and also this rhythm of these individual elevators marking each store, each uh, compartment uh, of the building. Uh, this photo from 1904 is the first to, to show the loss of these tall parapets. I'll point this out here. These, these crumbled <coughs> parapets, these only existed on the building for about 11 years, 12 years before they were taken down. I'm not sure why they were taken down, but they were removed from all four corners uh, of the building. This photograph is also fascinating because nearly all the shutters are shut. I'm not sure if that was done uh, for fireproofing reasons or for, uh, or for what. It's, it's an interesting moment. Um, this 1910 photograph, shows the enlargement of what, uh, what is known as store three. It's uh, the second uh, department, let's say, uh, east, uh, west of 11th by 27th Street. It was reconstructed uh, in steel frame and, and reinforced concrete uh, and brought up to nine stories, you can see here. But fascinating in this photograph, too, is the freight car coming right into the building. And when you zoom in on this photo, you see the, the door of the freight car at the center. What's been fascinating as we've dug into the research is this historic in 1914, when we found it in the DOD files. This shows the, basically the southwest corner of the building. So 12th Avenue is running here, 27th here. So these are two of the compartments, store 21 and 23. There's a railroad tunnel that ran right down the middle. You can see an elevation here, two sets of tracks um, here. And the rail car, and what we've done is we've, we've superimposed a freight car or a series of freight cars just to show you how this operates. So you had a central door that opened up onto a loading platform and then brought, brought goods directly into the center of the building. So it was, this operation it was a piece of infrastructure. It was a machine that was in constant, constant motion. Um, a fire in 1912, six of the, uh, the stores, uh, 17, 19, and 21, and the matching ones on the north side of the building, 
um, burned. And this was a, a moment when the owners of the building considered a significant expansion to the building. So this is obviously the building here. This, this is illustrating the, the portion that had been constructed and raised up to nine stories. But they envisioned and actually filed with the building department for a nine-story reconstruction of this entire western third of the building. So this idea, again, of sort of rebuilding and building out to the west is sort of a constant theme that actually comes up in the story of this building. It's also fascinating just to see how these how the systems work along the west side of the island. So you have open rail yards, trains coming out of the building onto these float bridges that then transfer cars, rail cars directly onto, onto barges that then brought um, the, the, the goods and, and rail cars across the river. This is a, a photograph of the Erie Railroad's uh, float bridge directly north of the building on the Hudson. So the rail lines would go onto this almost hinged bridge which would then connect to the barge and trains could then transfer across the river. This was obviously along with the, the tunnels were constructed. Uh, an aerial view from 1926 uh, the rail yard just north of the building. So instead of reconstructing the entire west uh, side of the building, uh, they just enlarged six of these stores up to nine stories. So you can see store three back here at nine stories, and then these six stories raised up to nine stories. But you can also see the sort of presence of, of, of all the sort of surface traffic, sort of this two-dimensional traffic. So this is a view slightly north of us, up on 11th Avenue, looking north up 11th Avenue. And you can see this sort of intersection, dangerous intersection, between the rail lines, which are trying to get to the river to the west, and all the sort of surface traffic, wagons, cars, going in two directions. And obviously, this is completely well, unsafe, but also completely unsustainable. So the answer to that was, of course, the construction of the, the High Line. Uh, and that was a New York Central Railroad controlled High Line. So you can see here, looking you know, down sort of southeast, the line of the High Line snaking this way into the, the Morgan Postal Facility down here the, where the park is presently, and even the elevated the Miller Highway. So raising, um, raising rail traffic, raising surface uh, car traffic up into the sort of upper register, the sort of other landscape, this third dimension, off of the surface. This is a 1950s map that illustrates um, the, the, the presence of the High Line uh, and the terminal warehouse located here. And it seems like this, like the expansion of the, the rail network can only mean good things for the building, but in fact, the, the, the introduction of the High Line um, was actually the beginning of the decline of the building because no longer did the rail line actually come down 11 feet into the building, it skirted the building. And so the, the High Line and the internal warehouse have an interesting relationship because the introduction of the High Line was actually the demise or the beginning of the decline of the building. But actually today, the High Line really is a large part of the reason why so much of this neighborhood has been reborn. But the 1950s really represent the, 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 the decline of the building and the turning of it into basically the sort of static building that you know today. So it's just completely disconnected from that kind um, of Photos from the 1980s, uh, the entire building had been painted and sort of beginning to be used as, as self-storage. Again, just the sort of lowest, lowest use, I think, for the building. Um, and the, the decline of the sort of west side of the island, you can see. But of course, actually, the rebirth is in the, the richness of the, the architectural heritage uh, of the buildings. Um, the tunnel light club. Um, so the one thing that kept the building alive, we sort of talked about, is the sort of beating heart is the rail tunnel. It's the central artery that runs through the ground floor of the building. And the tunnel opened in 1986 and was this sort of um, destination. Um, as Keith Harris said, I like it back there. He said, pointing over a fence toward the unrestored part of the building where the railroad tracks are. It looks like it must be full of rats. So this was like the place to be in the 1980s, but there wasn't much else going on uh, in the building. And then uh, Joel Sternfeld's obviously walking the High Line, and this collection of photographs documenting what the High Line and the surrounding neighborhood looked like in 2000. This is a view, obviously, looking south from the High Line, terminal warehouse here in the foreground, and the mighty stair of Lehigh. Uh, <coughs> you can see the condition of the building. You can see the original seven-story portions. You can see the nine-story portion here, um, where the fenestration had been done differently, larger, more windows to bring more daylight uh, into the building, uh, but the general sort of degradation of the condition of the building. Um, which brings us up to today. Uh, this is a portion of the, the north elevation of 28th Street. As David said, we are taking uh, undertaking a comprehensive restoration of the envelope of this building. It's measured, it's measured in acres, more than three acres of surface area. Um, and it's, it's an exciting opportunity and a, and a tremendous challenge uh, for the team. The masonry is, is in pretty good condition. There are definitely some structural issues that have to be addressed. You can see these major tie bags in this 
Boeing and the paraffin is not the photograph, but it's actually the paraffin. So there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done. Um, elsewhere in the masonry, there are arches, segmental arches that have sagged there, which is going to be treating this sort of um, non-matching mortar, cutting that out and repointing, rebuilding portions of the chronolated parapet that have been taken off. This is on 12th Avenue. And obviously the central portal um, on, on 11th Avenue, where this sort of insensitive storefront uh, has been installed in this column, this major crack, obviously is going to be addressed, and Rick will take you through the interventions that we're going to be doing here to, to bring people into the building and improve the, the, the visibility of, of this central column. Um, across the ground floor, um, the building currently has four master plans um, that have been approved by landmarks. Some of you may remember them. Um, storefront infill that includes the platforms, infill, uh, our keys, a, a one for signage, uh, one for rooftop mechanicals, and one for windows as well. Uh, we are approaching this project differently. Um, David and his partners have the opportunity to do all of this work in one shot. So instead of sort of thinking about this as a, a long-term changer, but this is going to be a project that's going to be done at once. And so um, the signage master plan is one thing that we're uh, reworking, uh, we, but we are really proposing a different treatment and a one-time treatment for all the ground floors. So this Sarah's point about the, the comprehensive nature and the amount that we're talking about here, I think in terms of getting through it, Today, for you all to study, I think it's important for you to see sort of the sensitivity, a sense of approaches we're taking to store and infill, sort of looking at things that have been done, and trying to do them and, and elevate the way they're being done. Uh, and the windows, the windows are the key, uh, a key piece of this story. So in 2013, there was a window master plan approved for the building and allowed for seven different window types around this building. Uh, five different window types just for the, the arched segmental and arched windows. One over one, two over two, six over six, um, and single, some single up windows, and uh, 15 over 15. Um, at that time, um, as, as, as it is today, there are no shutters on the buildings. And we're, approaching, we're, we're approaching this project very differently. We are proposing to restore um, shutters back to the entire facade of the building. Everywhere they existed, um, we are proposing to restore it. Um, we are also proposing single light windows as a single uniform treatment of this building. Um, and this may have been a misconception back in 2012 when that application came forward, leading through the community board testimony. There seemed to be a misconception that the building had been constructed over time in different window types. And that actually isn't the case. There are, there are a couple different phases, but the whole building was built with a single uniform type with, um, uh, with shutters. And the way we're looking at this, uh, we're looking at, you know, looking at the, the way the building appears with many of these single uh, double hung windows, one over ones, some replacement six over sixes. For us, what's most important actually is the openings and the shutters, bringing that back. And if you look at the, the findings from the 2013 CMA for the master plan, it says the depth of the masonry openings caused many of the windows to recede into shadow and caused the windows to have a secondary importance to the masonry building itself. Therefore, changes in window configuration will not detract from the special character of the building. So as you see our proposal, Think about the sort of vitality and the dynamic quality, the kinetic nature that the, um, that the shutters are going to bring to the building. Um, we feel that that sort of the presence of the envelope of the building, the windows actually have a less uh, window configuration and a less significant uh, place uh, on, the, on the facades. Um, so a final image, um, this is in the southwest corner of the building, store 23. You can see the general condition of this portion of the building, painted brick, infill windows, uh, utilitarian fire escape movers. There's a lot of work to be done here, and, and the team together is very excited about the challenge. Thank you, guys. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. It's fascinating. I think, yeah, I've heard we've been working on this for a year, but just hearing Cass talk about killing back the layer is one of the blessings for getting to work on projects in historic districts. So uh, what fascinates me is why do cities look the way they do? Why do buildings look the way they do? And Cass has given you a lot of that. I'm going to continue with that a little bit. Um, the, the context that we have here uh, is that a high line comes around and kind of cradles this right now. The western side of 11th Avenue is one type of district. The eastern side is another type of district. And we sit right at the kind of foothill of uh, uh, the The life of the building is the tunnel. So uh, that's always like, what is it about this building? Why did it survive? Why did it have so many uh, 
of lies one after another. Why did they choose so much? What was always there? Was this tunnel was remarkable, 670 foot long tunnel at the, at the rail stage straight ahead. The 25 stores give it a very rich and character. Even though we know that this was built as one giant building, they actually had numbers that they were known, they had their own uh, elevators. Each one had their own vertical circulation, as Cass pointed out, tied into the size of the rail cars. So we come along, we have 25 elevators plus ones that are added over time. What do we do with this thing? How do we make it? How do we make it a wonderful building for the next 100 years? Um, and as we get into it, we discover um, there's language that we don't often get a chance to work on a project where the client talks about a long language. He says, I fell in love with the building. And we're trying to understand what is that? What is it that makes people fall in love and use emotional language about buildings? And one of the things was these timbers, these massive, massive timbers that were there. How old are these things? This is these massive, massive timbers. It was built in 1991. These things have to be a couple hundred years old. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but uh, we, uh, we, were, we were able to work with, uh, with Lamont and Dr. Cook, a uh, endocrinologist who dated the timbers to as early as 1512, Sistine Chapel, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we can talk about a little, a little bit more about that later, uh, about Longleaf Pine and the importance of this particular pine in this time period. Um, the challenge there is that given this combustible construction, we can't build on top of it. So we wanted to save as much of this as we possibly could. Um, the stores are organized A, B, C, and D coming uh, down the page. Uh, and some of the building had already been reconstructed fireproof construction, as Cass talked about. So store three, what we call block B, and also store 26. And you can see that that's a different type of architecture with the steel and concrete. Um, Eva store 26, which is rebuilt, which is a little detail up there between 24 and 26, um, has been uh, kind of deferred maintenance, let's say. There's a lot of work to do, and we were excited about the opportunity to work on a building that could be funded and restored all at one time. Um, we also wanted the building to be completely as right. We didn't want a zoning action. Part of the building is already within the required setback and sky exposure plan. But we wanted to do anything that we did within the, uh, the zoning envelope. Um, we also needed to think about how this building would be used. It was a light star resource. It was a piece of railroad infrastructure. And we wanted this to be a workplace of the future. So proposing removing some area and finding an elegant, new, and appropriate home for that area that's really uh, so what we decided to do was all of store C and D, with the exception of store three, would remain the timber construction. We would create this daylight in the center of the building to give a life for the next hundred years. And think about how could you do this? And so our plan was to actually do fireproof construction and add the request as was originally planned in 1912. Uh, so all of the area between the courtyard that we're talking about, some double black spaces that I'll talk about in a minute, all of that area, it's about 12% of the floor area. We're talking about relocating it in an appropriate condition, uh, pushed to the west, and in the same historic configuration as original plans from 1912, at least its location towards the west. Uh, but that was fascinating in that it's one of the three great warehouses on the west side of 11th Avenue in the district. Um, for us, the building really has kind of two faces. It is this west side of 11th Avenue, and it sits with these three great warehouses. Uh, as architects just walking around looking at the city, uh, these three warehouses together are a fascinating essay about how we make buildings and how technological advancements happen, how buildings adapt and shape up over time. We wanted a uh, fairly conservative approach, an elegant restoration of a fairly conservative approach where you're inside, your feet are inside the store district. So one of the first things we wanted to do was restore the shutters. I think the shutters gave the building a texture and, uh, and, and changed it from that severity of the masonry walls and these beautiful arch openings. So that texture of the, uh, the shutters really helped. And we wanted when you're within the district to see this relationship between these three buildings. And then go in and think about how this building acts on the street. It has been and can be again a great connector from 11th Avenue all the way to 12th Avenue to the park and to the river. One of the things that uh, sometimes in, in, in my life that I've spent parking lots in historic districts and I just want to do a proper building. And uh, this happens to be one of the places where there was incredibly extensive storefront and we just wanted to redo it. So 
Uh, I just, I just stopped and wondered why is there a column right in the middle of this arch? It just didn't make any sense to me. Why is there that Walmart supermarket storefront? And it's actually a temporary grace to keep that arch from falling. So we get to do that. Um, so one of the things we want to do is recess it to get the depth. That's actually the curve you're seeing. That trains came in and curved in from a left avenue. It was a diagram that Cash showed. But you're not going to do it with Photoshop, right? What's that? You're going to get rid of the problem in some other way. Yeah. <laughs> Photoshop's pretty good. Um, and then the other thing, you know, what kind of storefront do we put here? So we're in this next layer. How do we make decisions? Um, one, I, I, I don't like revolving doors. They're not, they're not my thing. So normally we would do a mess of deals, two sets of swing doors, but that box was too clunky inside of this arch. And then the next thing, if you look at some of the high rises we've done, we tend to put revolving doors in what I call magic boxes, where you walk into a box and you spin around and shoot out the other side so you don't see the kind of tin can quality. And uh, in this particular case, it might be the only time I could think of in our career, we thought a very elegant where we bend the glass in and bring the revolver inside was actually the simplest and uh, most elegant resolution for the environmental protection that we need to, to change indoors to outdoors and have this very light storefront. In the scale of this tunnel, I thought that these uh, revolvers should work. So we're proposing that here and on the other end and in two locations that you see in there where we're coming into the center of the building. Um, 27th Street is fascinating because we share with Sarah the eyes. It's, it's a big brother over our shoulder. It's also a cobblestone street. Um, we're also proposing removing the uh, the old fire escapes and getting the facade to be much cleaner like it did originally. Here you can see storage three that comes up much taller, it's bulkhead in the background. And again, when we're within the district on 27th Street, we wanted a fairly conservative proposal. You can just start to see some of the relocated area back here. But the primary reading we wanted was of this restored building. We're also on top of store three doing a one-story addition that tucks in underneath this house tank and existing bulkhead configuration that just shows up uh, for a lot of that. And I'll refer a few times to the appendix because there's so much work in appendix A and appendix B. There's more views in, uh, in, those, in those packages also. But we're going to zoom in on the storefront. Um, the building, the ground floor is loading that level. So the trains came in at one level, the trucks and, and carriages, or carriages and, and wagons came in at street level. So the building is basically at the loading dock level, probably three feet above the sidewalk. At elevation, we enter at about 10 foot elevation on 11th Avenue and next to about six foot elevation down on 12th Street. And there's lots of different levels in the building. So we had to get out and we, of course, uh, need to provide accessibility uh, for everyone up to the building. And there were a series of fairly insensitive platforms built over time. So our proposal involves new storefronts, new canopies, some painted signage, some signage on canopies, and these uh, accessible platforms to get up to the loading dock level. And it also, in this appendix, I'll re refer to several times, every single one of the storefronts are shown all the way around the whole building. But my presentation now, for the sake of time, I'll talk about the typical condition and keep moving. Um, then coming down 27th Street, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, it, it, the bottom of that court area view is a little garden of deep green light, both into the center of the building, but also into the center of the tunnel. And we'll be able to enter on 27th Street and 28th Street and enter up to the tunnel and into this garden that comes down in the center. This image shows the restoration of, of the facade, the shutters, I'll talk about the windows in a minute. Um, it's very simple metal canopy uh, to historic ties. Uh, uh, profile signage on top of the canopy, painted signage on the walls, and also uh, a blade sign here in this location. Also in the appendix, we have a, a, a signage master plan that we're talking about. This gives you an idea. Uh, we want a lot of freedom to do kind of painted signage on the building at the lower level. The building's been painted many times over, and we thought that was appropriate. And I think this profile signage on the canopy works. And there's a few locations where you're going down the long street on the streets. I think the blade signs will actually help locate people on this cross street. So this is a section through the building. Um, it's very, very deep. You see the tunnel's actually to the south of the midpoint. So the tunnel ran just south of the center point all the way down. And it's, it's, it's a storehouse. Uh, so we have the challenge of how do we bring daylight into the center of the building. So we thought a lot about the way the deep openings and the shutters work. And we thought that that was primary. As much as I love uh, 
uh, designing the fenestration of the node of window projects. Um, we thought that this would be the first project, I think, also in our career where we thought a monolithic light would work. It could be justified because the primary reading of the building are these masonry openings and the restoration of the shutters. They are the things that give the texture. And in this one particular case, I think harvesting as much light as possible and emphasizing the shape of these openings, the segmented arch and the round arch, uh, is appropriate. Uh, so now we're back to this deep section. We're trying to get as much light in from the north and south and the sides as we possibly can. And then the courtyard that you see up here coming in, bringing daylight into the center. So if we cut a section right through the center of that, uh, you can see we're proposing bringing that uh, daylight down the center, the little garden of Eden at the bottom. That brings daylight to the side of the tunnel, but also allows daylight onto the top of the tunnel. And I'll show a few views of how we envision this space in the center. Um, uh, we wanted to create a series of uh, terraces where, as most of you know, we're kind of obsessed with the concept of biofield design and connecting people to nature. Um, we spend most of our time indoors, and uh, I think to you know, connect people to gardens in and out of the workplace is really important. We're looking straight down now into the bottom. This is the edge of the tunnel that we're looking at here. That's the top of the tunnel that we're proposing opening up the side of the tunnel. It's 670 feet long, so this is going to give the center of the tunnel a kind of focal point at this garden. Um, we wanted to keep the fenestration very simple in the courtyard so that we could see these beautiful timbers and see the beautiful uh, uh, brick walls. Uh, this is another view from standing, looking, looking back at the facade, looking at the uh, timber construction at Block C. And when you're all the way at the bottom, looking into the tunnel and looking back up, we just wanted a very, very simple uh, glass curtain wall that came that was very transparent so we could see into the kind of workplace. Um, and then all the way down to the tunnel, this is about midpoint of the tunnel. The rails are actually there. You, there's a hatch you can open up, and uh, they never took the rails down, so the rails are there. So we're proposing to expose part of the rails uh, in the part of the building that we weren't able to use. We're proposing salvage and doing uh, end grade block flooring, uh, super durable in, in the tunnel, and then connecting this kind of indoor and outdoor space. Um, also, as part, it's not that 12% area that we're talking about isn't just that courtyard. We're also proposing a series of double bed spaces that help us uh, navigate different floor levels and bring more daylight in. So in a few areas, we're actually proposing area relocation for a double height area. And then uh, this is the typical condition inside the building. It's relatively low ceiling height by modern office building standards, but we think that uh, we can overcome that easily by the emotional response to the timbers and, and finding pathways in between the joists above the heavy timbers. We're also proposing a, a, it's a, the illegal project and we're pursuing an OS system where we separate the ventilation air from the, what makes cold air and warm air. Um, and so it would be easier to leave these ducts above the beams and keep the sea. Okay, which brings us back to a larger context again. Um, there's one side of this project that we wanted to, the, in the district to be very conservative and restore this massive, beautiful building and restore the shutters. That area relocation um, needed to find an appropriate home. And we think the west side is the appropriate place both historically, but also for a number of other reasons <coughs> at the time for that context. You can see here, this is the image that Cash showed previously, and the, the area relocated that you see here. It was very purposeful in speaking a dialogue back and forth with the stare of the island. And I think also the west side is fascinating. Outside of the historical context, so all the views that we're going to show where it's really visible are outside the historic district, I think there's another context. We have Taking the west side and made it the place where you build lumber yards and ironworks and rail yards. It's also the place that I, I think has allowed for more architectural creativity. Even our salt shed is a beautiful thing that I got you an XY studio. That's beautiful at night. Um, we're doing the new Google headquarters at 550 Washington, which is the other end of the high line. And if you've been down there recently, uh, the St. John's terminal that was going to remove over Houston so you can see daylight on Houston or exposing the rail yards. People want to work in a place of authenticity, not, and, and this building will be a ground scraper, maybe the New York's first ground scraper instead of a skyscraper. 
Um, just north of that is 160 Leroy, Herzog and Demeron. Above that, uh, Richard Myers, Perry Street buildings. Um, the other bookend to R550 is, is the end at Gansport, uh, the Whitney Museum, and the High Line, the Standard. Um, uh, Heather, in my opinion, Heatherwick's genius project in New York uh, is looking incredibly beautiful at Pier 55 right now, and it's just stunningly beautiful. I won't talk about the other two projects, but that one is absolutely <laughs> stunningly beautiful. If you haven't gone by and just seen how it looks in the light, I, I am absolutely thrilled about that. And then, of course, the other day is uh, 11 project, Frank Gary's IC, John Bell. Foster Partners, and then there's a gap from 21st Street jumping all the way up to the PRK is 57th Street. And I, we, we, if it's not too much to touch, we wanted to see our project in that context of that gap from 21st. So it's a complete <coughs> kind of string of pearls off the West Side Highway. It's even had fascinating history in temporary. Pier 54, we had the Nomadic Museum. When it came, if you saw it, the Shadur Oban uh, installation was, was just awesome. And then my favorite artist of all time is Gordon Matt Clark. Um, there's something about the way he, his art and how architecture and time all interacted. And so at Pier 52, he created 1975 Days End. Gosh, bringing light in one of these years. And we are all getting Days End again. David Hammond's interpretation of days and thanks to uh, Whitney. And we're getting this right now. It's under construction that should go by right now. So the West Side has been this place that kind of opened up, it's kind of aired out, there's a little more elbow room for architecture and creativity to happen. Um, but, but this thing that we're talking about will be a visible piece of architecture um, outside of the historic district, but still on a building inside a historic district. So the other context we have to think about is where have there been totally site specific conditions where this condition has approved, has approved very visible pieces of architecture that might be above existing movements. So uh, the first one I was thinking of, uh, our first real seaport um, was in the Siemens, uh, Siemens Institute in the South Street Seaport uh, Historic District. And this is uh, uh, Polshek at the time, he had his uh, work, and it was interesting, and, uh, and Jim Polshek talked about it when you're on the street looking, it almost looked like there was ship at port behind it. And so there's this idea about being a waterfront and a port location that made it specific. That wouldn't make sense any other place in the world other than the authorship of that story in that place. And I was fascinated with that. We, we um, one of our deep loves at the seaport, and we did 14, three new buildings and 11 existing buildings. And, uh, and Jim's words about that project were, were very much on our mind. But all 14 of our buildings all put together only 5% of the Seaport District. And the project we're talking about today is 25% of this historic district. So we have a chance to really work at scale. And then, of course, Morris's uh, 837 Washington existing building. And uh, you have a story very specific about that one particular project at that one time. Uh, Actually, this is the registration part of our two specific stories twice, <laughs> two, two, twice. Um, and, uh, and then right across 11th Avenue, uh, a project that's the most similar in proximity in that very conservative on 11th Avenue, the 11th Avenue building, and then a building that expresses its time and place that's associated with it. Uh, so this building has one face, which is the fascinating Morris Elevator building on 11th Avenue, and then something else kind of weaving its way in time. But it's it's not conservative from this side. It's a very specific approval of this uh, from this commission that had to do with the story about that place, the history of that building, which we to that relation. The one that um, actually fascinates me the most because it's similar, not just this American round arch architecture, but it's also a wrapper around a piece of infrastructure. It's not a building like we, like the thing we're in here we're looking out at. It was a piece of uh, industrial infrastructure. It's just this crazy wrapper around this fantastic sugar refinery. And this is also a project that was approved twice by the commission for a visible piece of architecture. We have to be the architects of one South First Street at 10 grand right now. Um, so th this is another example of the waterfront allowing our respect for historic buildings and also respect for us being able to create architecture of our time and our place of beautiful parks and connections to the waterfront. Uh, interestingly, that this is the size of the low scale of Williamsburg. And what you're looking at here is the red dashed line was the first approval. And then this was the second approval. And this is really rooted in the architecture and the rhythm and pattern of the existing building. So we thought, okay, this is 
facade. This is a way to think through this problem statement. This was our facade. It's broken up into multiple stores. Those stores are done on the pattern of freight cars, where the freight elevators were the center bay of the center loading freight cars. And so we also had a rhythm, a very, very specific rhythm related to this one use for this one building. And, uh, and then, of course, this whole idea that whole crazy thing, that one image, every time I see it, I smile about all the rails trying to get west and all the traffic trying to get north, and you have Model A's and Model T's and horse carriages and everything's collapsing, and this idea that New York just has so much going on that you have to cross that out to another level. And so we did it. We did it with the elevated highway, we did it with the, with the, with the High Line or the West Side Improvement Project, and I just love this 1908 King's Handbook of New York because it kind of happened that this multi-layered city happened. That our city is so rich that it exists on multiple levels. And then this is a 1917 image of this double-decker uh, railroad. And I was fascinated kind of aesthetically and visually about this is this moving and dynamic quality of the steel infrastructure against the very heavy masonry building. And this started to have an impact on our thinking about how we might be able to do something at Turner Warehouse. And then here's a, a, another picture from 1933 of the 9th Avenue now, looking at this double-decker architecture that's frame-like and architectural that has a similar kind of rail car proportional rhythm to it, contrasted with the heavy masonry. So that brought us to our proposal. This is zooming in on our, on our proposal of that relocated floor area. Um, well, west is off to your right. What we're looking at is store 16, 18, and 20 here on the left. Uh, 22, 24, and 26 is the one that bangs on the corner. The house tanks that you see in, on the top of the page are house tanks for the Sarah Lee High. We always had this idea that we wanted to craft a proposal that always sat under the big brother of the Sarah Lee High. Um, and then we thought it would be interesting uh, to do things that were unique that you can only do in this one place on Earth. So the coloration of this metal work that we're talking about is straight car red from the New York Central Rail System that has some kind of beautiful colors. Um, this is century green. The green that we're looking at here is a freight car color called century green. Um, I, I like the rusty image of it, but it has this beautiful kind of uh, jade green color. And, uh, and then the kind of workplace of the future. If what people seek is authenticity and, and beautiful wood columns and brick, also some kind of authentic workplace <coughs> and connecting people to nature. We, we've all witnessed the change from a primarily rural human population globally to a primarily urban. And I think we still were biologically evolved to need connection to nature, and we can do that in the kinds of buildings that we design. And we, we've been doing that. Uh, this is 300 Lafayette, which was approved here. Um, uh, there's, there's uh, outdoor space on every single floor. Uh, Microsoft just leased the whole building. And uh, this is uh, the first landing on the terrace. So this is the building right there, the gateway of Soho, that holds the street front. It's also kind of this platform for, uh, for habitat and uh, human connection nature. Also, uh, a building that we did that was, didn't come before the commission, but 512 West 22nd Street is built right along the High Line. Every single floor has outdoor space. The idea is that it's crafted uh, right on the High Line, a rail infrastructure that's now a park, a building that's designed to sit specifically there. So these, these spaces that we're talking about on the building are envisioned to block that. This type of work that's the future of optionality. Um, so then if you go all the way out on the pier, what does all that look like in context? Um, that's the proposal that we have of, of that area, from all the way out on the pier, far outside the historic district. Um, there's more coming uh, at Hudson Yard, so I think this context is important, the context of bracketing to the stairs we had uh, to the south and everything that's coming to the north. Um, if we come up to the bike path up much closer to the building as it sits now, and uh, the very specific crafting of the shape of it so that it has a certain size relative to the base when you're up closer to the building. Um, one of the fascinating things about the, about the west side is that at nighttime it has a certain character too, the ground floor of the IAC building. So we want to think about lighting and talk about that here at the public hearing. So we're proposing uh, lighting around, around the building that supports the architecture that's also part of our famous appendix that we've done referencing. Uh, moving up further north, 28th Street. The proposal
proposal. And then again, the, uh, the, the 12th activity side has really been kind of dead. Um, by the time you get there, the activity is mostly on the left side of side. Our, 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 one of our goals and aspirations is to make 27th Street, 28th Street much more realized. One of the reasons why people don't really walk down 27th and 28th Street on the sidewalk is that there are these loading lot platforms and trucks park all over the place. Um, well, this might tell you storefront on this side of the same kind of loading dock platform, same uh, recess with the storefront on 12th Avenue, same shutters. Actually, interestingly, store 26 was rebuilt, and here the openings are only four inches deeper, the place else they're much deeper. Just one of those wide buildings look the way they did. That actually fell down and got rebuilt. And then um, we're proposing uh, off-street loading first that you can see right here that requires some modification to the existing storefront. Okay? We believe it's appropriate because those storefronts have been adapting, evolving over time through multiple generations, but also we have this condition that where the trucks are parked all over the sidewalk, all the way up 27th Street or 28th Street, so we're able to get the streets off uh, those, those small loading dock platforms <laughs> into off-street loading first. So we have, uh, we have this intervention on the side right here that we think is, is elegantly done. To, and, and what that does is free up all the storefronts. It allows us to remove all these ad hoc platforms around the rest of the building and do these accessible entries around the building. And you can see that here in the plan. Uh, we're able to create five off-street loading for us just right back by uh, store 22. Uh, we also want to have one of the world's greatest flight entries uh, given the, the, the growth of flight computation in New York and we're right on the, right on the park and that kind of flight highway is there too. Um, so then we, we talk about still outside the historic district, but there's places in public thoroughfares where we see the building. Well, we couldn't get the Sternville photograph because the, uh, the installation is up right now, but we still get this long view. So we uh, it will go away pretty soon. There's some projects proposed. Uh, they're not built yet, but they will go away soon. So if you look at it, and here we did Photoshop out of our installation. So. Um, and this is the proposal. Uh, we're obviously very interested in allowing Sarah and Lehigh to read here and have like, our profile, so our profile read, and have our uh, have the new area read uh, tucked in along the west side. In spirit. There's also a one-story penthouse that I referenced earlier right here on store three, and there's some mechanical equipment here that will show up in a view also from the high line uh, further to the east of the There's another issue that we thought was kind of interesting. If you look here, this is the original uh, three pairs of windows that happened, and we're proposing, we're proposing doing two pairs of a single or two pairs of a single, or now there's a single, single, single. Um, so if we, if we look at the existing condition, you can see that over time there have been these three pairs of two, and then there's a single, 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 single. So what we'd like to do is pair up here and here. There's a recessed panel that exists right here that's, that's uh, similar to next door. So um, we made the decision that to harvest more daylight, it would be appropriate to uh, add these other lines of windows here, here, there, and there. Okay. Um, now we're up on the high line all the way back. Is that the only, the only place for adding? Yes. Yeah. And, and not on the south side. In that same location on the south side, we're also proposing doing it. It's the only place we're proposing to all the storefronts are within existing buildings that we're restoring some of the old buildings. Here there's a building under construction now that, would, that will be there by the time our project is done. Uh, but this is you you're from an elevated position far outside the historic district, but just looking at the proposal again, the one-story addition, the restoration of the chimney here. You can see the mechanical equipment. There's, if you go by now, there's big cooling towers up there now also. But we thought that was a good place to kind of tuck those in. These are the uh, stairs coming out of that courtyard next year. And that's the, we thought the, the pattern of these relative to the elevator bulkhead overruns on block B sat well. We wanted to still read the power of, of the stair at Lehigh building coming down and our building kind of looking out to the west, that westward expansion. 
Where are the stair towers made up? Sorry, finish. Uh, standing seam to seam. Yeah, glad to stand and see what So I, 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 I'm, I'm wrapping up now. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I, I really see this project with, with kind of uh, two faces. I think all these buildings tell a story. So we wanted to really tell the story of the terminal warehouses, a piece of rail infrastructure restored relative to these three warehouses, but you're within the historic district. <coughs> And then um, I would like to propose that this is a perfectly appropriate uh, uh, relocation of the area for a number of reasons. One, I think that historically there was a planned renovation to the west in 1912, that's one. Uh, two, I think um, that like the other projects that were approved with visible rooftop compositions, um, they are unique to their place. Any one of them wouldn't be done any place else. I try to avoid the word precedent because I don't think it's really relevant. These are appropriate stories that, that work with the building and their totality in a comprehensive proposal. So I think that's true. I also um, would, would like to say that outside the historic district and on the West Side Highway, this is a place that we should allow for creativity and next generation of, of development. Um, so that's that's the wrap up of the of the project. I have a material board that's down here that for the sake of time, I don't think I'll, I'll go through right now, but it's, it's the actual materials are here that talk about the restoration of the brick along the mine the shutters and all the different colors and materials that we're talking about, including the zinc. And uh, and then there's a model on the table that's a little hard to see here, but um, I do think that it helps support the argument about the larger context, about the restoration of this building, the core that we're talking about, the context of that relocated area here, relatively sterically high, the DNO, and also I think this is kind of interesting because it shows the, pre the previous approval at Otis right here relative to the project also. And so that's on the table, and thank you so much. I know it's getting really late, but if I could do one more thing, I, well, one of the things I absolutely love about this work is kind of peeling back the onion and that you, you get explanations. You say, why is it going to look that way? And you peel back the onion a little bit and there's answers. And uh, so there's some joy to that. So if I could, if you bear with me for a second, I would really like to introduce our friend, Dr. Cook from Lamont, an endocrinologist. And and, uh, and it just how could you possibly know how old these timbers are? And if I could introduce Dr. Cook, um, and he can talk a little bit more about this stuff once we look a little more deeply, right? Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much. A very uh, interesting presentation, I must say. I learned a lot. Um, I'll read the, uh, uh, my testimony here to be sure I say everything that I wish to say. Um, my name is Edward R. Cook. And I'm a Ewing Lamont Research Professor at Columbia University's Lamont Charity Earth Observatory, and also the director of the Theory Laboratory at Lamont Charity, which I helped establish in 1975. Since its founding, the Treering Lab has been dedicated to expanding the use and application of treering research around the world to improve our understanding of past climate and environmental history. And I, and I definitely Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I had thought of me this afternoon, but it's a little slow sometimes. This evening on the proposed restoration and adaptive reuse of the terminal warehouse. In addition to understanding ecological and climatic patterns, theory analysis can also be used to date the construction of historical buildings using a technique called false dating. We utilize patterns of ma uh, pattern matching and statistical tests to establish the date of each annual growth rate in the piece of wood that we just, that we were <coughs> By comparing or cross-dating rates from historical samples to those of living trees with known calendar year dates, it is possible to establish the year of construction or tree felling of the timbers used for construction. And that's what we've done in, in my study here for the terminal warehouse. The terminal warehouse has a number of features reflective of its history, including a wood, wood beam structure that still exists in a significant portion of the building. These beams are unique 
partially because this type of non-fireproof construction is so rare uh, to find today in Manhattan, but also because of their sheer size. At the request of the building ownership, I conducted a query analysis with colleagues who established the age of the wood in the building and the location from where the trees were likely to have been cut in the construction of the terminal warehouse. Based on our findings, we have determined that the wood used in the building came from ancient longleaf pine trees uh, that began growing as early as 1512, well before the establishment of colonization of, uh, of uh, this part of, the, uh, of the, uh, North America and ended life as late as 1891, the final year of construction of the terminal warehouse. We can also state with considerable certainty that the wood used for construction came from longleaf pine trees growing in the northern Alabama, northern Georgia region. It is remarkable that these beams have remained intact. Their preservation is a testament to the ownership's commitment to carefully steward this building into the future. Query analysis provides greater understanding of climate and environmental history and gives us insight into our own past. The proposed restoration of Trumpa Warehouse will preserve, reuse, and celebrate these historic meetings, sharing this important history with generations of New Yorkers. With that, I thank you very much for your time. Based on my evaluation, I recommend that the Landmarks Preservation Commission approve the application. <laughs> <laughs> the recommendation is mine alone and does not reflect any official position of the Lamont Garrity or Observatory or Columbia University. I have to cover myself. So, thanks very much. I, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, you, you know that we often go back to Eric Sanderson's 1609, 21st European contact, and we had the chance to come here and talk about the Collegiate Church Project, where we talked about these were, the first, these were those Europeans that started in 1628, the Hill Eternal Island Garden So we had an opportunity to go past 1609. Thank you very much for your time. I know it's getting late. Um, so if we, we can uh, take some questions now, and then we'll go to somebody. We have several speakers. So, are there any questions right now? Let's go with testimony. Andrea Goldman. All right, before the sun sets. Good evening, Chair, Panel, and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldman, speaking on behalf of the Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy's Public Policy Committee reviewed this proposal and it thanks the architect and project team for the thorough and clear presentation. The terminal warehouse with its massive brick presence is a star of the West Chelsea Historic District and the Conservancy knows it well as we're a party to what I think has called the lowest form of use. <laughs> we have rented storage space here for many years <laughs> and had the annual opportunity to watch the building and the neighborhood change and we welcome the next phase of this brand structure's evolution. This proposal does many things right. We support the sensitive and comprehensive restoration of the facade, which will correct years of piecemeal repairs. The storefronts form an elegant intervention that reflects the character of the building, but announces the new use. Installation of a new uniform window, along with shutters that match the original, will facilitate that use while recalling the presence of the facade's original rhythms. Regarding the plans for the roof, the one-story addition closer to 11th Avenue is only minimally visible and entirely acceptable. But we do not question the concept of relocating the floor area from the center of the building to the larger addition closer to 12, but are concerned that the proposed structure is too visible and can distract from the landmark. Perhaps the height and bulk could be re reduced. We heard the rationale of referring to the industrial and railroad history in the selection of materials and palette, but believe that a more restrained use of glazing and color and more emphasis on masonry and historic materials would better honor the warehouse and keep the focus where it should stay on this monumental building. Thank you. Thank you. David Loka. My name is uh, David Holoka. I'm a member of CB Board's Chelsea Land Use Committee, but speak today on my own behalf, not for the board. 
Terminal warehouse is big enough to accommodate two rehabilitation approaches, one looking back, one looking forward. The warehouse's east face, addressing the city, was historically more prominent than its west. Its advertising pennant and deeper set windows attest to this. It still has more exposure to pedestrians who might experience it up close and at leisure. This end of the warehouse cries out for authentic restoration, including elimination of the small glassy penthouse. Re uh, reinstatement of the lost high parapets at the eastern quarters would lend meaning to other elements that are now inexplicable. It would restore the castle image that took its cue from the portal-like tunnel entrance. The staggered windows near the corners facing the avenue would again suggest corner tower stairs. The fortress-inspired arch portaling at the central parapet would be completed and amplified in the restored tall parapets instead of reading as an arbitrary fragment. The medieval character of the advertising pen would again make sense. CP4 has pointed out that reintroduction of the parapets could easily be incorporated into a text amendment to the Special West Chelsea Zoning District. The truck bays on the side streets originally had arched openings that formed an impressive arcade. Restoring a handful of these would complete a comprehensive recreation of the historic reality at the east end of the building. Such reintroductions are a big ask, but so is the owner's current proposal. They're not for the commission to demand, but for the owner to consider offering for an acceptable solution. If any of the proposed single pane windows are to be approved, it is especially critical to accurately restore some of the warehouse's windows. Without this, there would be no record of the relationship between the historic shutters and the operable windows through which they were swung open and closed from inside. Restored shutters exclusively outside fixed glazing, as proposed, would be inexplicable and appear gratuitous. The warehouse still has several original 15 over 15 arch double hung windows that have a removable horizontal bar in them against which the shutters could close flush with the facade and be latched shut. The building originally had nearly 400 of these. Uh, technically, they're a special window under LPC rules, meaning that altering any one of them would require a public hearing, and we're now proposing to replace all of the building's windows with a single pane of glass. Selectively reintroducing these historic windows would allow an understanding of how the shutters function during historically. Such details express the technology of the time, like the small glass panes of the original windows. Each arch window, with its dense net of buttons, double brick reveal, and shutters with iron hinges laid into the brickwork, is a crafted composition on itself, the warehouse's basic building block. Respecting this at the east end of the building could justify a more modern interpretation elsewhere, allowing a viewer to fully appreciate both the old functional and new expressive use of the shutters. Thank you. And David, was that, were you, did you cover all the points in the community board resolution there? That's coming with another speaker. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, why don't we just continue with community board four? You just state your name for the records. Yes, uh, Tina Tina Antonio, and uh, good evening, so good afternoon right now. Uh, while the board's complete positions are detailed in its October 7th letter, at your request, NCP4 submits this executive summary of its recommended conditions for the approval of a certificate of appropriateness for the proposed renovation and modification of 261 11th Avenue. The board welcomes and generally supports the applicant's plan to restore the terminal warehouse building and convert it into a modern office and retail building but believes that the current proposal sacrifices too many of the building's historic features. Because it contains so many of the um, elements of historic importance and because it directly faces the community and the city, the board recommends an accurate historic restoration of the eastern portion of the building, including stores one and two, and preferably stores three and four. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas? Greg Thomas, Historic Districts Council. From the designation report, this historic district conveys a well-defined sense of place and a distinct physical presence which sets the neighborhood apart from other parts of Midtown Manhattan. With this crucial sentence in mind, since the report was written in 2008, the Hudson River waterfront has changed dramatically immediately north and south of the district. The High Line and its trail of new architecture 
transformed the meatpacking district. While Hudson North skyscrapers constitute a small city just beyond the West Chelsea Historic District, LPC's designation protected this area from rapid population change, and the juxtaposition of the neighboring areas have made the district all the more distinct. This application will determine what the West Chelsea Historic District will become. Will it be like the Gansworth Market, complete with purposefully visible additions, or will, it, will its behemoth buildings be preserved in their original form? HGC argues that the terminal storage building should be preserved. This building's monumentality announces that it is a complete and perfect composition. Adding a multi-story visible addition to it does not celebrate its muscularity, it rarefies it. Terminal storage spans an entire city block. An addition that is lower and longer could rest atop this magnificent structure. The proposed addition also changes the relationship between terminal stores and the sterically high building. These buildings are the face of West, of West Chelsea from the river. Their distinct styles call out to their different eras of construction, but somehow do not compete with one another. Terminal Store serves as the poster child of an American Ground Arch style, with its heavy masonry and dotted openings, while the sleek and taller Sarah Lehigh Streamline Modern speaks to the era which building higher with less masonry was in vogue. The proposed rooftop addition competes with the Sarah Lehigh with its glassy boxes pushing all the way out to the river, fighting for its comparable height with its neighbor. The tension will be visible from all along 12th Avenue and to the Hudson River. Finally, HDC is concerned about the serious surgery terminal stores is facing and the growing trend of scooping out the insides of old buildings. We ask that the Commission think about the intact 19th century construction methods and the substantial historic fabric that will be discarded for glass and broken walls, and evaluate how much removal is fair to the historic building. This is a building which has lived several lives already, gracefully transitioning through different uses through the decades without substantial change to the building's architecture. This plan proposes to radically alter the building for an ephemeral use and possibly shorten its lifespan in doing so. This is not a proposal that can be easily reversed. So we must ask, do we want this to be the building's final form? Thank you. Mr. Belga. Chris Belga for the Society for the Architecture to see. A kind of action is sweeping along the west side waterfront with some troubling consequences for certain landlords. We have to ask, at what point does the complex of late 19th century dark brown dark style warehouse buildings lose so much of its original identity that it no longer really counts as a landmark at all? Does the massive aggressively contemporary metal and glass and cleared superstructure belong here. Can we accept the transparency of the shops at the base once the interior is blown out and the 27th Street display windows provide views of a bright new courtyard with sun and foliage? What about the new single pane fixed windows? In the presentation materials, there is an attempt to justify them by quoting from the 2013 master plan firm, which notes that the windows are in shadow due to deeply inset openings. But this citation is a little misleading. The changes in configuration referred to in that document, the shape, did not remove all original divisions and methods of operation. Instead, the master plan authorized retention of a variety of configurations, albeit with inferior replacement materials. There was no thought that all divisions and all historic memory would be sacrificed. See, before Manhattan has produced an extraordinarily long, detailed, and thoughtful statement proposing a compromise that calls for a real restoration of the 11th Avenue and the terminal, including full original demonstration, rebuilding growing areas, restoring the original arched ground floor openings, and no visible rooftop addition of Stoke Street. This would be an exchange for more or less throwing the river end to the wolves. Certainly, we agree with Ward Four when they say we believe, however, that the current proposal sacrifices too many of the building's historic features. If approved in this form, the building will be almost unrecognizable. Thank you, Madeline McGeroy. 
she have to leave for the evening? Should I read her testimony? Um, or you can just submit it for the record. You know, for the record, it seems that that's a letter in support of the application. Justin Pascone. Um, his testimony was also submitted. Okay, and that also is um, testimony that was going to be in support of the application. And a copy of that is actually attached here. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, so thank you all. Um, I think what we can do is. Um, as I said in the beginning, this is a really comprehensive project with many components to it, and I think it merits uh, our thoughtful analysis. And so we're going to think about the testimony that we've heard today. We're going to review our packets. All of the testimony will be made available to you as well. And um, some of you may want to make site visits. And then we're going to come back and continue the conversation. The applicants can do a response to the testimony. We'll have our comments then. But I think if anyone has questions now that you would like the applicants to respond to when they come back, or um, concerns, let's like, let's try to get those um, raised now so that the applicants can address them. Robert, it's not a question. Like maybe it's just me and I missed it, but it would really help me to understand some of the aspects of the project that they could present certain things in a discrete form that. Uh, address the specific areas of, 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 of the project. Storefronts, signage, uh, the entrances, the public entrances to the building, lighting, light lighting, exterior lighting. Um, they were kind of referred to, they're shown in the, in, in the images, but I really didn't get a, because there's so much, like you say, I think it would help me, maybe it would help others to have those things presented in a more systematic way so we can look at them as, as uh, units. All right, and they are all, as, as um, stated in the presentation, in the packets as well. So in advance of the next presentation, if you want to flip through or study the packets, that will help. Any other final questions? I'm going to need a really good justification for trashing the windows. Good. Okay, um, so yes, I know that. The image of uh, the last portion of the project, did you support the way to the start of the other building? That's the question. It's, what's the image of the I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. <coughs> the last portion. Yes. Of the and its relationship, its relationship to the start. Sterling, I think. Yes. Are the supposed to be together? Are you doing them as animational pieces? Or <coughs> uh, yes. So, thank you. Uh, as I understand the question, uh, in our in our composition of the relocated area, is it viewed as uh, having a language with the Sterling Lehigh building or not. So uh, the answer to that is, is two parts. We wanted a solution that was absolutely and totally unique to the site that we wouldn't have done any place else. So the rail car module, the relationship of the history, let's say in the DNA of the project. So it wouldn't happen any place else. That's first answer. Second part is, of course, we always knew that they would be viewed together. Um, the Stair at Lehigh is one of those buildings, like the Chrysler building, that every architect loves. Um, Stair at Lehigh represented a, a fascinating advancement in the technology and the way that windows were incorporated, how structure of windows could be expressed in architecture. And uh, so the, the glassiness of the room, particularly at night at the Stair at Lehigh, has a wonderful quality. It almost feels like the space holds the floor slabs apart from each other. They glow at night. So this idea that the stair at Lehigh, uh, the B&O building, is a building with these tiny little cassette-like, tiny little slots. It's a massive concrete block with these tiny little slots. And then there's the uh, American round arch architecture of the terminal warehouse that had these pretty small and these shutters that were very, very unique. And then the stair at Lehigh comes along and changes everything. It, it you know, ushers in the age of the kind of uh, uh, infinite architecture, the flowing space, as opposed to holes in the walls, this idea of infinite space. And certainly I said all of that to go by, especially at night. 
So we do see it in context with that, that we believe that the building adapted and changed over time. It changed literally in the number of stories of the construction. It changed in the types of penetration. And we view our proposal as the next generation, that we do believe it has a right to exist, and it does continue to tell the story of, of a building. That building's adapted and changed. I have a point. <coughs> you're using a dialectic method, solid building, and you're using a glass building. Yes. But there's other companies that use a collage system also. Collage. Yeah. Another process. Mm -hmm. a system. So this one is just, I'm just trying to understand the concept. Yes. But this one is based on the railroad typology. Yes. And the stuff. Yes. Okay. So, uh, just to try to understand the language of the architecture. I think at, at some point, um, every architect who faces a, some form of blank canvas has to, has to talk about the language they choose to speak to tell the story. I believe that the buildings we make tell the story about our goals and aspirations and what we're thinking all these buildings do. Um, so for us, the foundational principle was that it would read of, a, of another time period. I think that's fine. The, the original building was all one, one one set um, seven story stores, and it went to nine stories, things changed, and you can read the time history of these buildings. Um, so I believe that it's appropriate to have another layer of time read on the building. So that's the kind of global statement. Um, the second point of view, we were searching for a language that was unique to this building, and that's why I spent the time to talk about the Domino Sugar proposal or the 837. Paul Schick's uh, Siemens Institute. Each one of those invented a language of expression, often in contrast with the base. So uh, uh, probably Jim Stewart Paul Schick's dialogue was much more of a collage and, a, and a, a storytelling, but it was definitely a white object on a heavy masonry base. If we go to uh, 837 Washington, it's got that twisted form on top of a low scale warehouse. So there's a language of contrast. Um, we could. When we when we get to the restoration hardware, there's a there's a glassy box on top of a low masonry. Two two different proposals approved here, and then when we get to Otis, which is a fascinating, very recent project approved at the commission, there's the very conservative nature of restoring of the 11th Avenue building. But there, there's this truss of glass, massive cantilever over an existing masonry building, and it's appropriate. It was deemed appropriate because it tells a story about the history of, of elevators, Alicia Gray's Otis, and that's the safety grade, an exhibition of industry all nations in 1855, no Brian Park, and the world changes, and the high it, 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 Like, you know that by knowing something about the Otis elevator building, and so that was appropriate. So my argument is that each architect in their time, in their era, has a responsibility to respect history, and look deeply, deeply into the history of the place, but we also have the opportunity to speak our own language and our own time. So I, I respectfully ask that this is viewed as our architecture for our time and place, and uh, and from the bottom of the soles of my feet, that this was a, a look deep exercise to try to understand and respect this building and this history. That was a long answer, but thank you for letting me get it out. And the other thing is, you, as you study the package, I just think that um, you know, there are a number of changes here, but rather than thinking about them piecemeal, because they aren't coming in piecemeal, they're coming in as a package, I think that you can think about them as a comprehensive package, and there are restoration goals, and then there are changes, and how do those work together? So, um, so we'll see you again in a couple of weeks, and I want to thank everyone for staying for this late hour. Thank you, commissioners, thanks to the team, thanks to the members of the public who stayed, and Okay, I'm going to make a motion in those areas. All in favor?